sure. Mm. He also drew this. These are pigs in police uniform beating a brown person in the head with a nightstick. Oh, goodness. And then he wrote up top here. Oh, we hate the popo, wanna kill us in the street faux show. I don't even know where that would have come from. <laughs> it's Kendrick. Mm. From a song by Kendrick Lamar. You know Kendrick. Everyone knows Kendrick. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I've been playing a lot of uh, to Pimp a Butterfly in the crib lately, so. Teacher, Amy, can I be frank? Oh. Always, yeah. Um, it's very important to us that we raise DeAndre as a socially conscious, proud young black man. Mm. Mr. and Mrs. Honore, I get it. Yeah. I do. I fully understand the systematic oppression of the black man based on a history of slavery and hatred. I know the system punishes you for being unapologetically black. I get it, sister. Mm. Sister. Oh. <laughs> I mean that in the feminist sense, not in the African-American woman sense. Mm. Anyway, we are fully focused on creating a world without bias and oppression everywhere, starting with the children. Mm. You know what, fair enough. We'll be more mindful of what DeAndre listens to and hears at home. Hold on, hold on, hold on now, baby. Not so fast. Let's talk about this for a second. <clears throat> I'm gonna be real honest with you, Miss, uh, teacher, uh, teacher Amy. Amy. Teacher Amy. <laughs> <laughs> um, that all sounds great, but that's not exactly what I'm teaching my son at home. Really? You don't want a world free from bias? Right, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, I'm raising my son the way I was raised. Look. DeAndre needs to know that there's certain things you can't change about this country, and he needs to be prepared to work twice as hard to get what he really wants in life. Oh, mm. I see. Teacher Amy, you should know that my husband has had real reservations about sending DeAndre to private school. I didn't need any fancy private school to make it, and I'm real strong in my blackness. Are you saying I'm not because I did go to a private school? I didn't say that. It's different, Dawn. You're a woman. Whoa, and what me. is that supposed to mean? Excuse me. It's just different for women in these type of environment, okay? <laughs> Here Sorry, we go again. It's easier. Well, you said it's, 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 it's not about that. What I'm hearing is that you all want to see DeAndre dancing more and talking about race less. Hey, race. I now, that's a, now that's a problem hey, for. <clears throat> I steal Mr. Honore for just a quick sec. Mm, no, we would just steal, a... borrow, pilfer, whatever. Please take him. <laughs> I love DeAndre's blackness. You know what? And it's one of his most prominent things. I mean, I just don't know what even else to say about it. <laughs> Look, Dr. P, I don't know where you from, but you know the challenges of raising a black boy in this city. I mean, you got to really know what's going on. I was born and raised in Kingston, Jamaica. Huh? I came here when I was 13. I know bed -Stuy. All bed style. Okay. Okay, then so you understand. Look, you ain't got to go to none of these bougie schools to get an education. I went to an all black public school. That turned out amazing. Now the types of brothers I meet that go to these schools, let's just say that's a different type of brother. Mm -hmm. You just seem like really cool people and I we champion can't be. you for we can't be. for championing your son's blackness. I wanna protect that as well. It kind of comes with the territory, really. When DeAndre leaves here every day, he has to go to his home in bed -Stuy, where he got to be as comfortable on those streets as he is in here. But the hood is changing, though. Nah, not my hood. Now, we still got more Popeyes than Starbucks. For now. But look, I ain't no fool. And I ain't trying to raise no knucklehead. I mean, my, my brother upstate right now because he a knucklehead. Oh, yeah? Yeah, man. Where are Greenhaven. He must know my brother Cam up there. He coming home soon, but if your man's in Greenhaven, he know Cam. What's going on here, man? Listen, real talk, okay? Hey, Mr. Poindexter, love the work on the greenhouse. <laughs> you worried about the school changing your son, right? Yeah, you damn right. Uh -huh. Okay, I get it, mm -hmm. but my job is to change your son, yeah, but not into a pussy. I hear you. But remember, 
these 42 inch tyrants will be running the world one day and you paying a shit ton of money for us to make sure that your son is one of the people running things. If you want him to understand the streets, that's cool. But that's your job, got it? Yeah. I'm good. <laughs> and for what it's worth, DeAndre's a good kid. He gonna be all right? Thanks, man. One love. <laughs> <laughs> really, right? <laughs> and look, and remember Mr. Ross? Do I remember Mr. Ross? <laughs> Come on! Hey, how's it going in here? Oh, it's Pretty great. <laughs> it's great. How about you two? Uh, we're good. <laughs> good. It turns out that Amy, uh, teacher Amy. Please, Amy. Amy also went to St. Barnabas, and we had all the same teachers. And we were both on the debate team. Funny. <laughs> How funny is that? Now, the types of brothers I meet that go to these schools, let's just say that's a different type of brother. Mm -hmm. I understand you. Mm -hmm. You worried about your son being one of these Tiger Woods, Don Lemon, Brian Gumble type of brother. Nice. Exactly. Yeah, once you start talking to people, it's all the similarities, you know, yes. they just start popping up. Yes. I have a lot in common with a lot of people. Yeah. So we're like a collective household, and we are, of course, all vegan. So are you cool with that? Yes, of course. In fact, I have an eaten. Okay, great. We forgot to ask you, what are your preferred gender pronouns? Excuse me? We're okay with they, uh, or at least most of us are. What? I just think that it's grammatically weird. She. I am fine with she or her. So, love, uh, tell us about yourself. What makes you want to be a part of an anti-hierarchical, matriarchal, cruelty-free collective household? Well, I am an actor and a singer, and I've lived in New York for over 40 years. Brooklyn, since 1980, and uh, in this neighborhood, since 1995. Old school, nice. I've lived in the same apartment for all those years until the last owner passed and his kids fought about it and decided to sell it with me in it. <laughs> mm. That's cold. And the new owner is a dumb, what? <laughs> um, uh, he's a Wall Street type. Um. Yeah, and naturally he wanted me out so he could flip it or rent it in exchange for someone's firstborn. Oh my God, for a child? That is way, way, way too much. No, it's an expression. No, a child is not an expression. <laughs> uh, so uh, I decided I was gonna try to stay in this neighborhood and your ad was different than all that other BS I've been seeing. Thank you. Okay, but what about our politics? Are you comfortable with the politics described in the ad? Sure. Before it was cool, I was anti-imperialist, uh, vegan, uh, queer positive, gender liquid. By gender liquid, do you mean gender fluid? Yeah, that too. So, be straight with us. Why do you really want to live here? Something feels off. Yeah, isn't it a little weird that you want to live in a household that's just all, uh, you know? Yeah. I know what. Uh, oh, just that we're all, yeah. White? Oh, uh, okay. excuse me? <laughs> oh, I'm Hi. Sorry, sister. Almost all white. I guess. Okay. I don't know. I don't care. I was actually going to say all younger, because we're obviously not all white. I mean, Mia is, of course, black. Oh, we well, half well, black. And Amy is, of course, one-third Ojibwe. No, and I'm not. 
You're not? No. My grandfather spent his summer on a reservation, and he had a girlfriend there. So I was almost Ojibwe, but... Okay, but uh, you're definitely part, um, part, uh, yeah. what are you? you it's got, like, I'm uh, excuse me, I'm getting a big, big, I'm a like, big, I just have to say, Getting back to answering the question about why I want to live here, that's easy. It wasn't the political stuff that caught my eye. It was the $650 rent. So were you lying about all of your politics so far? If you must know, I debated the role of feminism in the black power movement with Angela Davis. Oh my God. Yeah. Mm. And drank one too many mojitos with Asata Shakur in Cuba. Oh, Come on. oh my God. Young people, I can talk the talk and walk the walk. But can I be straight with y'all? Yeah. If you wish. Please. All this political stuff is cool, but all I want is a room with no rats that doesn't cost two weeks' salary. Yes. Well, okay. Our household is a consensus-based household. Therefore, all decisions must be consensed upon by the group openly and transparently. So, we're gonna do that and we'll get back to you. Mm-hmm. Sounds great. She's everything, right? Yes, she is woke as fuck. I'm just gonna say it, I love her. You love, love? Decker, you said that about your last hookup, and you said that about the hookup two times before that. Yeah, but this is for real, though. I am stanning right now. I wonder if she's on Instagram. Stanning? A hybrid word combining stalker and fan, hailing back to Stan by Eminem. But, um, just to be clear, she is a bit um, what? Nice. Old, right? I said it. She's old. Maybe she wants, like, quiet hours after 10. What if she doesn't like us smoking weed? What if she doesn't like us hooking up? What if she's hooking up and we hear it? Do we get to hear what old people sex sounds like? <laughs> Guys, I want to get us back on track. Hmm? If we are committed to our goal, of a diverse, inclusive household, hmm? reflective of our community, huh? We cannot dismiss love because of her age. Mm -mm. No, no. Ageism, the last socially acceptable ism. You know, this is exactly what they did to Bernie. No. That we Bernie. have to deal no, with no, brother, yeah. and Sheeran and yeah. Ginger. Yeah. Do not talk about Bernie right now. Saying, no. Just think that it's still no. very, very absolutely. Not. I will I just, uh, light my head on fire. All I'm saying is you guys would all love Shape of You a lot more if it was done by a person who didn't have red hair. That's all I'm saying. It's a good point, though. I say we do it. What do you think, love? You want to live with us? You know, I could have stepped out of the room while you had your little powwow. We're a transparent collective. There is such a thing as too much transparency. This is the bathroom. We only shower on odd days in honor of the water protectors. Hope you don't have an electric toothbrush. Oh. Okay. This is your room. <laughs> the door doesn't close quite right, so we have a rotating schedule so you can let people know when you have company. Yeah. Like hooking up, just to be clear. Yeah, yeah like, you know, with other uh, older people. Okay, uh, showering only on the odd days. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And this door doesn't close. Yeah, no. you got it. Electric toothbrush. Waste energy. You all put me through all of this. For this closet? Hell no. Y'all are crazy. Okay, I, I, you kids are trying to do the right thing, and that is a lot better than most folks. But you know what? You want to do the right thing? Just move the fuck out of this neighborhood. Just plain go out. Park slope, sheep said bay, whatever. Sounds of Crooked Daddy's music. 
Young Ace. I just really feel like being listened to right now is ultimately like its own form of validation, which at the same time is like making me listen. And that's so nice. Wow. I'm, I'm just pointing out there is such a phrase, redheaded stepchild, if you guys have ever heard of that. It's a, it's a derogatory term. Everybody gets so mad when I talk about Bernie. All I want to do is talk about Bernie. Me that's fighting for things that I never had Never tired though my physical speaks differently Optimistic though the opposition tries to get to me I see a spirit that reminds me of innocence My mind I grew up in Trinidad and I wasn't allowed to hang out with the boys, the older guys, when because they grew up like a lot of, around a lot of DJs. I didn't start until I joined the military in 2002 and my first base was in South Dakota, Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota. There wasn't really much out there to do, so I was like, oh, let me just pursue DJing because I always wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And I received a uh, Stanton starter pack which came with like turntables, a little mixer, headphones, like the whole shebang. And I had to order some vinyl of the internet had it shipped to South Dakota. And yeah, that's how I started DJing in my dorm room. In the Brooklyn community and other places, I'm known as DJ Mercy Lane. I spend my days looking for lots of music um, so I can make people dance at night or <laughs> else they'll probably cut me out. <laughs> now, I've been doing this for about 11 years and for some gigs, I still get nervous, but once I get up there and put the music on, I feel the energy from the from the you know from the people, and it just makes everything go away, all the nerves, mm -hmm. and I just have a good time, you know. So I, my connection to Brooklyn, I think um, that's where I have most of my roots, um, especially mm -hmm. with Legion. And a lot of the people that hire me are for, for queer parties. Yes. Um, I'm not saying all of them are, but most of them. I've DJed Azucar before. I've DJed um, Poppy Juice recently. Um, Come on, everybody. Come on, everybody. It's very queer-friendly um, venue. I love, love that space so much. And reggae is a queer dancehall party, which is also one of my favorite parties to do. Mm -hmm. I'm from the Caribbean, so I love dancehall, reggae, soca music, but I feel like every time I go to to parties that cater to that, that audience, it's mostly straight. I don't feel comfortable, honestly, right. um, especially with, with some of the guys there. Some of them are respectful, but some of them aren't. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think that's important to have a party like reggae, which I feel comfortable at, and other people who are like me. Feel free to, to dance with who they want to yeah. and just enjoy the music without being harassed. I just started a new venture, which is a DJ magazine, which caters to women DJs and musicians and beat makers or producers, just to shine a light on them. Because what I've noticed is a lot of the DJs that are put into magazines, they're on like the top, top hundred lists, um, especially in EDM music, they are men, you know, with a sprinkle of, of women. I also noticed, noticed too, like if the female DJs are recognized, they're mostly white women. Mm -hmm. You know, so I definitely wanted to to recognize a lot of the ladies that I know and people who I don't know of um, worldwide. DJ Reborn, I really, really admire her. DJ Valentine, Amber Valentine, Sassy Black, Stassi Boss, like they're my all time favorites to DJ with as well. You know, we definitely have a good time together and, you know, amongst other other women. One of the main challenges I think for us is um, we're raising two boys. Yeah. So we have to make sure that they have everything that they need as well as 
what we need. Right. But you know, they're they are our priority. How would you yeah. feel if our kids became DJs? I would love it. Me too. Which means I can quit and they can go to parties with me. Yeah. Yeah. What is a photo? I mean, in terms of like, is it is it perfect lighting? Is it perfect? Uh, does it need to be dark? Does it need to be light? Those things are subjective, but in the realm of the world, a good photo is like, all right, well lit. I mean, when I started out photography, I didn't know anything. To be, to be, to be, uh, to be honest, I didn't know what, which direction I wanted to go. All I needed to know, well, all I knew in the beginning was that let me make sure I kind of study the people or the fellow black photographers because I, I had no clue. And so I was just like, but you know, I'm looking around and I don't see anything. And then Mark Baptiste just brought out beautiful, had just, or was just about to come out with beautiful. But still, back then, I didn't think that I was going to be a photographer. The reason why I started off like saying I wanted to do fashion or do fashion is just because it was one of those, it was uh, the type of photography it is, it's like a, you can do anything. You can shoot anywhere, you can you can use any kind of light. You can just do whatever you want. The idea of fantasy is like the biggest drug you can give people because once you give them that, that fantasy, that escape, that imagination of like, oh, I can place myself in this, which is to them like perfect or whatever it is, then they'll always feed off of that stuff. When I first came to New York, um, it was summer. The first introduction was like, hi, hello, nice to meet you. And you never saw the person again kind of thing. Whereas like in Guyana, we kind of like, the way we behave or the way we do things, it's like when a visitor comes in the country or whatever, we'll take them wherever, we'll host them, we'll carry them around. And then I was like, okay, so I guess this is how people are in New York, which is like, okay, I guess. If they're not, bu everyone is just busy, I guess. That was my first introduction to like, just the whole, just the nature of the people here. I was telling a friend, um, I just want to go into a stage where now, I just want to become extravagant. Extravagant is a large, it's a larger than life image, meaning like it's, it has so much contextual values, meaning like in terms of, it's just not limited just to like, let's say black reference or, or archetypes. It just references, it just pulls in all these elements and then you don't know what you're gonna create out of it. First for me, the idea of blackness is like richness. So from that perspective, it's like, I always want to represent like black people as like, or brown people as shiny and bright. And But then again, coming back to the idea of skin and representation of the blackness and all those type of things, it's just something that makes me, I guess, giddy and excited when I, when I do it. And also what I, it's also kind of like, challenging other black people too in a way challenge them in the sense of like would you accept this as yourself again coming back to the idea of extravagant and stepping outside of just the notion of blackness meaning like you're stepping in because when you step when i say step outside the notion of blackness it's stepping into a space where you just limitless i took an american history class and i dropped it the next day because I was just like, this doesn't make sense. And it's not even being, it's not like I'm trying to be like, uh, what's the word, um, an activist or anything. It's just like, I'm picking up a history book 
that doesn't have me in it, but I'm part of the process. And thanks to all seven of you who know what Brick TV is and are watching now. <laughs> Special shout out to Homeland Security because we all know you're definitely watching and boy are we impressed you managed to find the most obscure channel in the history of television. <laughs> anyway, the five of you tuning in are probably saying, what the hell is this show about? Well, it's about being brown. And I have a lot of experience being all kinds of brown because I look ethnically ambiguous. And for the folks at home who don't know what that is, Becky, it means there are a lot of different ways you can hate me. Conversely, it also means that my attractiveness level varies depending on where I am in the world. So let's say I'm back in Iran. Spoiler alert, I'm Iranian and no, you are not in danger. There, I'm like an eight. That means young women's parents line up around the block to ask for my hand in marriage. But in Greece, I'm like a four. And that means I have literally zero reasons to ever go to Greece. <laughs> and uh, I used to look definitively Middle Eastern, but then I plucked my unibrow to create two separate and distinct eyebrows. <laughs> and that half an inch was the difference between looking like Osama bin Laden or Pablo Escobar. <laughs> and I think if I had the choice, I'd rather be the guy who made a mansion out of his prison cell than the guy caught living in a hole. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather be Latino, because being Latino is pretty cool. Yeah, and there's really nothing cool about being Middle Eastern. Latinos, they have tacos and tequila. They have salsa, merengue, bachata. They even have the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> Take a look at other minorities. Black people got Beyonce. No woos for Beyonce. <laughs> Asians have Tokyo Drift. Lots of woos for Tokyo Drift. What do Middle Eastern people have? And I swear to God, if you say shawarma, I would totally agree with you because it's very delicious. <laughs> I just want people to think it's cool to be Middle Eastern. My dream, the day when a bunch of white kids in Central PA get together and be like, yo, Habibi, let's get some falafel. <laughs> yo, it's hard out here for a Shah. <laughs> Until that point, honestly, it's kind of scary to be Middle Eastern. Uh, it's a dangerous time for us. One of my biggest fears is to pull up to a red light Look to my left, see a Ford F-150, South Carolina plates, and Confederate flag shellacked across the back window. Because I know what's not in that car. Puppies. <laughs> Immigrant rights. No, in that car is David Duke's abusive Uncle Earl, which you know has to be worse. <laughs> and his best friend Bill, who's still making up for 9-11. And they're gonna look at me, and they'll be like, well, I don't know what the hell that is. Uh, I wanna hate him but I don't know how to hate them. <laughs> so they pull out the manual, and I imagine this comes standard on every pickup truck sold in the States. Know your hate, 
A Comprehensive Guide to Discrimination. <laughs> uh, forward by Paula Dean, obviously. <laughs> They'll start flipping through and be like, well, you know, he's got two separate and distinct eyebrows, but he's too tall to be Mexican. And uh, he's got the afro, but he's too short to be one of the blacks. <laughs> Finally, they'll look to me and say, hey. And I'll have no choice but to turn to them and say, scuzzy. <laughs> and then Earl will look at Bill and say, knew he was a Mexican. <laughs> you guys, we have a great show for you tonight. <laughs> and for the four of you watching from home, stick around because we'll be right back after a quick message from our sponsors. Are your kids over 20 and still unmarried with no prospects? Are you worried they might live with you forever, never give you grandkids, or worse, marry a white person? Don't let yourself be the talk of the village. With Muslim Swipe, you too can find suitable mates for your kids right at your fingertips. Thanks to Muslim Swipe, Fatima and I have been married for four days and have known each other for two. My parents listed my age, degree, and the list of Persian meals I know how to cook. They don't know I use Seamless. My parents lied about my salary, and then they swipe right on Fatima. Parents. We have a lot in common. So much in common. Both our dads are named Muhammad. All of our parents lived under the same dictatorship in Iran. In Iran. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and Fatima is fertile. <clears throat> and uh, has a degree in biomedical engineering? Wow, really? Yeah, but um, my mom says I'll never use it, so. Unlike all of the other apps, Tinder, Grinder, OkCupid, okay OkStupid, okay Bumble, Jumble, Fumble, we are the only halal mating app for parents and their kids. Our parents are planning for us to have four kids, so we have no choice but to accept. And I'm quitting my dream of comedy so I can work with Fatima's father at his uh, taxi medallion and used jewelry stand in the Queen Center Mall. Business is actually going very well. It's not possible. For a certain crowd, yeah. Oh my god, no. Betty, who are all of these people? Um, this is my wife, Fatima. Your wife, Fatima? That's really interesting, because I'm his fiance. What is going on? My parents downloaded Muslim Swipe? Muslim Swipe. Make the right choice, not the white choice. Get out! Get out! At the cut! At the cut on this! Get out of here! Get out of here! You know what we have in common? What? I was asking. Are you like an early bird or a, a night owl? I'm like a night owl. Oh, okay, I wake up every morning at five. Naturally, my body wakes up, so. Um. Uh, we also both really enjoy... I love watching movies. And. TV shows. Yes, I love TV. Uh, we both like to have kids. Maybe. There's so much. We kind of look related. I'm sorry I said that. <laughs> Welcome back, folks. We're going to keep it rolling with a segment we call White Court. This is White Court, where white people will be tried, I know it's hard to believe, for behavior that is either a minor misunderstanding or flat out xenophobic. Was it racist? Maddie and the jury, <coughs> audience, will decide. This is White Court. Let's meet our first defendant, George C. George C. was walking down the street when he noticed a fear walking past him. The defendant moved slightly towards the other side of the street. We believe the defendant was acting racist. Will the defendant make their case? I thought I was just being safe. Your assumption of impending danger is a presumption of aggression based on one's skin color. That sounds pretty racist to me. Audience, we find him... Guilty! Guilty! Guilty. <laughs> Your punishment, high-fiving every brown person you see walking down the street. But be careful, because some people are actually dangerous. <laughs> next! Our next defendant is Marissa S. Marissa S. struggled with pronouncing Middle Eastern names, though she claims to be an ally. Um... Uh, Amethyst, K. Atune, uh, Malachi, Roxana, Sam? It sounds... <laughs> that sounds racist. And, uh, what does the defendant have to say for herself? 
Well, wouldn't it be more racist if I overcompensated and pronounced everything like Hamatis, Katayun, Malachi, Roxana? Yeah, okay, no, no, yeah, yeah, you're right. Sam. You're right. You're right. Audience? Not guilty. Not guilty. But uh, here's a book to read because you got to stay educated or whatever. <laughs> next. Our next defendant is Sue. Your Honor, I would like to enter into evidence Exhibit A. This is a transcript of dialogue that the defendant had with a Latina coworker. Thank you for the Exhibit A evidence. Uh, let's see. Welcome to my team. You are a part of this family. That doesn't sound so bad. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. I was just being welcoming. Mm -hmm. All right, well, uh, let's see if the glove fits. Could you please go ahead and just read that off? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Welcome to my team. You are part of this family. OK, yeah, yeah, that sounds pretty racist when you talk to someone like they're an idiot. Uh, uh, verdict? Guilty. 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 Your punishment? Watching Seinfeld in Spanish. Without subtitles. That, that's a thing? Repetía, ¿por qué, George? ¿Por qué? ¿Qué quieres, mamá? Está ahí. ¿El amor? No. No. And our last defendant said the N-word to a black co-worker, and I just... Wow, you know what? I don't even have to hear this one out. Let's poll the audience. What do we think? Guilty! Guilty! <laughs> You're just gonna convict a man oh. without a proper trial? Okay, I... I didn't know you were... I... This is white court. This is court, and... That's my, that's my bad, right? Do you know what I'm saying? And I had... And I did not know. This is white court. All right, uh... This feels like a good time to maybe uh, shift gears. What do you guys think? Um, let's try something a little lighter. Uh, here at Passport Control, we get a lot of letters, and every show, I like to take a moment to read a letter from one of our young fans. This one is from nine-year-old Dylan. It's a really sweet segment. Um, <laughs> Dear Medi, my name is Dylan. But everyone calls me Pickles because I love pickles. <laughs> I think you're very funny. I think everyone on your show is funny. I bet they treat you all like celebrities in New York. <laughs> I like you so much. And you always look so happy. Someday, I hope I can visit New York. I love going to the airport. It's so much fun. Not for everyone. How old are you? How big is your apartment? Are big cities scary? Well, depends on who you are, Pickles. I don't know why people don't like brown people. You seem nice. Can we be friends? I'd love to come to your studio. Seems like such a warm and friendly place. My picture is here. Oh, let's take a look at Pickles. Oh, he's so cute. What a cute kid. What a sweetheart. Maybe someday I can help on the show. I think we could all help each other out. You're a forever fan, Pickles. Thank you, Pickles, so much. Uh, I love segments like that one. Really reminds you of like how much beauty there is in the world, you know? I'd like to move right along. Let's introduce Passport Control's first ever special guest. If you know anything about the comedy scene in New York City, you know him. He's one of the nicest and most talented performers you'll ever meet. You've probably seen his work on Amazing Spider-Man 2, How to Be Single, Broad City, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Damn, man, save some work for the rest of us. <laughs> He's also one of the hosts of the wildly popular podcast, Black Man Can't Jump. Please welcome to our studio, Jonathan Braylock. How you doing, <laughs> You missed some fun stuff. Um, I have a question for you. Yeah. Why do you get so many gigs and I don't? Huh. Interesting. I just read off a list of credits. It took like 45 seconds. <laughs> Listen, um, I, see you, I see you on commercials all the time. Oh, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> don't name them because we don't have sponsors yet. 
Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Literally, those are all my gigs. So. Great, that's fair enough. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. Um, what is your ethnic background? Uh, so I am black and white. Wow. So that's that's a very specific experience that you have. Yeah, yeah, is it yeah. Not? Yeah, yeah. No, it is. Um, it's like <laughs> one. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I can say this word, but uh, mulatto, uh, that's the word that people... Uh, and that's a bad word. You know, <laughs> I didn't know that when I was a kid, mm -hmm. uh, so it sounded cool to me. I was like, mulatto. <laughs> yeah. I'll take that. I'll take it. Yeah. It sounds like a nice, like, hot Starbucks beverage or something. Yeah, like a grande. <laughs> I don't even want to say it. I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> John. I mean, it's definitely not in, in vogue, but it's also, it's not, I, I rarely heard it, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. growing up, so... It, by the time that I did hear it, I was like, I'm supposed to be offended? That's okay. <laughs> what do you usually get? Like, what do people usually assume you are? Um, I mean, it depends where I am, to be honest. So, like, it, usually in, like, white neighborhoods, people think I'm black. But if I'm in, like, an Hispanic neighborhood, then people think I'm, you know, Spanish or Dominican or something. I, I remember I used to work at this restaurant, and for the first week, everyone there thought... Uh, that I was fresh off the boat. <laughs> Did you not speak at all? Yeah, or? I was like kind of shy, so I wasn't like speaking a lot. And they were like, "Oh, he like doesn't literally doesn't know English." That's and so, so funny. people would only speak to me in Spanish, and then I would silently smile and nod. <laughs> <laughs> just playing which along. Just continued the <laughs> yeah. yeah, which yeah. hasn't helped at all. Yeah, like I, I always felt. I guess like that's the thing. The the tragic mulatto is a literary figure, and the idea is that they don't know where they belong because. You know, you're not fully accepted in the black community, and you're also definitely not accepted in the white community. Yeah. So uh, identity is like a weird thing, and that's why it actually is like definitely a through line in my comedy. And well, what's like the that. what's the perception that African Americans have about who you are because you are mixed race? Well, it's a weird thing, right? Because the history of it is people who are light skinned. I mean. You know, it depends. I mean, a, a number of ways that could have happened, but like probably because a slave got raped and then they had child, and then that child was like the master's like illegitimate, you know, offspring. Yeah. So they, the other slaves don't like you because you're getting like a little bit of, you know, uh, whatever, just, <laughs> I don't know, you get to like, be in the house. Better like, treatment <laughs> yeah. of some kind. Yeah. You can like, even compare that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, also, white people hate you because you're still black, you know? But what, how does that translate to today? Like, what, how, does that, uh, how does that translate to, like, here and now in terms of how you're treated in an African-American community as opposed to in a white community? You know, every now and then I'll get, like, maybe, like, a joking comment. I mean, we are in a very liberal uh, yeah. area. But, like, oh, well, I mean, you're light-skinned, so you don't really understand what we're going through, you know? Um, because what? Because someone who's darker skin is gonna ha is gonna be treated differently across the board, regardless of it's part of the African yeah, community and, outside. And, yeah, absolutely, and that is true. Like, it, so it's like a, it's a real thing, but it's also it's one of those things that it makes this divide that is only there because of whiteness. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, it's it wouldn't exist if whiteness wasn't a thing. Yeah. So uh, it's like it, 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 and that's why that's why I brought up the slave kind of history yeah, of it yeah. because it's a real thing. It's like that person got better treatment so it makes sense that there was resentment but at the same time it's like that person also didn't they couldn't control yeah, their sure. own fate. It almost know? disenfranchises your negatively impactful experience like the, the bad things you've right. gone through it almost uh, 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 takes away from the fact that you experience those things because they're like well you know you're not like a real black guy. Right. Yeah. Right. And I would get that like I grew up in a, a white suburb in Jersey. Where in Jersey? So, uh, Rutherford. Rutherford. Yeah. How is that different from East Rutherford? Can you explain? <laughs> We're better. No, I don't okay. know. It, are they next to each other? I don't even they know. They are. They're right next to each other. Okay. So and everyone like by knows Route three, East. 495. Yeah, the Meadowlands. So when I was growing up in the suburb, like, like people would always say, because I was one of the only black kids. I was the only black kid in my class. Um, you know, and then high school, there were, there were like a couple more. But uh, people would always say, like, oh, John, you're not black. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you don't like rap music so like i would be called an oreo and it's like well yeah i all, i grew up in a town that all you guys listen to is ska so yeah. well, is what that, did you want me to like <laughs> sounds like a bit of an identity crisis for someone who is biracial yeah like understanding like who you are i can't imagine that's fun as a teenager to figure out like where you land in your social circles and how you're perceived yeah it's weird too because you don't really 
you know, when you're growing up, it, normal is whatever you're living, yeah. you know? So it's only, it's only through more experiences that you go older and then, like, more education and then realizing, oh, wow, like, other people were feeling this way. You know, when I, came, I went to NYU and... Shout out NYU. You send know, us free NYU stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the most popular <laughs> NYU merchandise is uh, they have a T-shirt that says NYU football because there is no football team. That's so funny. It's so NYU. It's very NYU. <laughs> That's fair, yeah. It's just like, we're ironic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but like when I got there, it was uh, the first time I really had black friends. And so I was like, oh, man. And there was this whole like um, immersion. And I, I studied and <laughs> I did an Africana studies major or minor, I should say. And uh, I was like immerse into black culture in a way that I wasn't able to do when I That's was, fair, yeah. was younger. Talk to me about entertainment. You do a lot of acting. You do a lot of performing. What's it like for a person of color in the entertainment world today? Um, you know, I, things are, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, things are getting better. Good for and sure. bad. Good yeah, and bad, right? Yeah, it's good and bad. Absolutely. But, like, but it's, is it getting better? You're I think, it, I bit, think right? it is. I mean, you know, it, it's weird. It's, it's kind of like diversity is hot right now. Uh, which, so hot. Yeah, it's so hot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People love it. love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the first great. thing someone says, like, I uh, just shot this, like, TV show. Really diverse. Really diverse. <laughs> mm -hmm. Love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it, like, scores you a lot of points. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, it does, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, the, the goal would be just for diversity to just exist and then it not be a thing, you mm -hmm. know? So the podcast. Yeah, not to have to point to it, not to have to say it. Exactly. Yeah, there's and a lot of shows I watch where it's like, look at how diverse we were, and I'm right. like, calm down. Yeah. You don't need to say it. It's weird because... Just do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's weird because we already, we already went through that phase in America, you know what I mean? Like, everybody knows the token, you know, yeah. person of color that was in all of mm -hmm. your... TV shows yeah. like all right, and there's the one the Black Ranger, yeah, you know, the, yeah. and there's our Yellow also Ranger. Also, the one Black improviser on each team, yeah, one black <laughs> sketch person, right, the black guy in the movie. And it's like cool, we did the tokenism, so now we're doing. We, people realize, okay, we need to get not just black, you know, or other you know ethnicities on screen, but we need to get them behind the camera. We need to get them, yeah, in yeah. The, you know, uh, studio executive positions and all of that stuff. So things are getting better, but like we can't let up. You know what I mean? Because once yeah. we do, then it'll just... The... You've got to keep the foot on the gas. Yeah, you got it. You Last got question it. for you. In uh, a sentence, what do we need to fix the world? Oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> Take your time. No, uh, what do we need to fix the world? What's, what's a little dose of medicine? What's uh, something we can prescribe? You know, I'm going to be cliche and say love Please. is the answer. We need to care about other people uh, the way that we care about ourselves. And other people extends to more than just, yeah. you know, different races and ethnicities and religions. It also extends to people like you uh, who don't like you. You know yeah. what I mean? People. It, yeah, it extends yeah. to all people. Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, you know, I, I am Christian. I grew up Christian. And the love your enemies as yourself is something that Jesus said. And I really try to ascribe to that because violence for me, is like very clearly not the answer, yeah. right? Like it just begets more violence. We get into this whole cycle. It's like, all right, who started what first? And this idea yep. of like that's the thing that's going to fix things doesn't make any sense. So uh, I've noticed in my own life when there are people who hate you or like are racist to you or sexist to you, homophobic, all those things, uh, obviously defending yourself is, is something you need to do, protecting your you know body and your livelihood. But... Uh, also showing love and compassion to people who don't have it. Yeah. Like, it really, I think it really, like, kind of shocks them into, like, what am I doing? You know what I mean? Well, there's the answer, guys. There's love the answer. is the answer. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Greylock. I appreciate it. Yeah. Please check out his wildly popular podcast on iTunes, Black Man Can't Jump in Hollywood. Also, check out his sketch team, Astronomy Club, have, has a short-form series on Comedy Central's digital platforms this fall. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Greylock, we'll be right back after this important message. Are you Arab, Muslim, or just a very hairy Italian? Have you been harassed at airports because of the way you look? In this tutorial, we will give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to avoid these common pitfalls of airport security. Step 1. Make sure you trim your beard right before you leave for the airport.
Step 2. Remove all liquids over 4 ounces from your carry-on. Step 3. Dress the part. Step 4. Take an unsuspecting book to read while casually waiting in the security line. Step 5. Travel with a privileged white girl. Step 6. Go to the courthouse, change your name. And finally, step 7. Cut off all ties to your brown friends and family. Congratulations! Now you're an American! Welcome back, guys. Before we go, I want to talk about something I really identify with. Mexicans. Because Mexicans and Iranians have legit been on blast for no good reason since an orange toilet seat became our commander-in-chief. I'm talking about the wall that we're going to end up paying for. I'm talking about the ban we're still fighting. Point is, I definitely feel a sense of solidarity with my Mexican brothers and sisters. Look, we all know what he said about Mexicans, but Becky, if you're there, here's a recap. He's publishing a list of crimes made by immigrants. He's saying they're taking advantage of the system. He says he's going to kick them out. But all this talk about all these Mexicans begs the question, when's the last time you heard a white man refer to Mexicans and actually mean people from Mexico? Because usually, when I hear someone say Mexican, all they really mean is, oh, you're from somewhere, probably Mexico, I don't know, I don't care, cut my grass, but don't take my job. Oh my God, I love Chipotle. <laughs> this plan to keep Mexicans out is an attack on all of us, because shocker, we've all been mistaken for Mexican. Hell, none of our female writers can wear hoop earrings without having an identity crisis. <laughs> Even our one Spanish writer, not Mexican. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You know, if you check the driver's licenses of any of our male writers, you'd think to yourself, ah, pretty Mexican. <laughs> it gets to this question, <laughs> that's Sabi. Uh, it gets to this question, what are you? Because that's the question Trump wants to ask at airports. Arizona sheriffs want to ask citizens and what your best friend's uncle is dying to ask you at parties. What are you? The thing is, they don't care about the answer. They'd rather hear you just say Mexican and think, now, what the hell are you doing here? Well, I'm here enjoying this barbecue and dating your lovely white niece. <laughs> but this question, what are you, is really difficult. What are you? What are we? Personally, I will say to you with all seriousness, I am brown. Look, that might be how a cartoon bear would answer that question, but I'm serious. So what is brownness? Brownness is constantly being asked where you're from, but no one ever really caring what that answer is. Brownness is being the only black kid in your school for years, then meeting your first teacher of color, but when you ask her what she is, apologetically, she says, Indian, and you say, close enough! <laughs> and then it's a few more years before you get your next teacher of any kind of color, and though she tells you that she just has curly hair, you secretly hope that her mother was lying to her father. <laughs> what is brownness? It's when a kid in Queens tells another kid he's Indian, and the other kid says, yo, I'm from Trinidad, brother, and a deep cultural bond is formed that can never be broken. <laughs> Brownness is being told you're not really culturally from this country. Then you go back to your parents' country and realize nobody thinks you're culture from there either. And your cultural references are from whenever your parents were kids. So it's like walking into a party and going, how about that hall and oats? <laughs> That's hip now, right? <laughs> To which one of your cousins will say, what, where are you from? And that's the question you'll get on either side of the ocean, where you're from or where you're told to go back to, because you're brown, like a cartoon bear. <laughs> you could say, I'm Filipino or Guyanese or Libyan or Mexican, but you're both those countries and this one. You are a walking identity crisis every day, at least to them, because we felt fine until you asked. So what are we? What am I? I'm someone who's part of an infinite universe of different cultures and peoples and cheap plane tickets to the US and calling cards and Skype accounts and that weird lunch you brought from home that you can't share with your white friends because to them rice is spicy. Rice is not spicy. <laughs> rice is a complex carbohydrate and water. It's also white, <laughs> the one thing you're really okay with. So what are we? Frankly, we're a third of this country and growing daily. And to America's white, soon to be minority, you only have two choices. You can laugh with us or you can fear us. Thanks so much for tuning in to Passport Control, guys. We hope that all two of you watching enjoyed the show. 
until next time, just try. <laughs> <laughs>
For me, it was more about identity. When I saw Bomba for the first time, I think I was about 40 years old. And even at that age, I'd never been to Puerto Rico, you know? And so when I saw Bomba, it was like I felt Puerto Rico. It was like, you know, it was something that I, I really felt it inside of me. It's a music, it gets, you know, it goes over 400 years, you know, the oldest African derived music in, in Puerto Rico. It came from a group of enslaved Africans that was brought to the island. Something about Bomba helped me connect with something that I think taught me a little bit more about my own history. Since we're New Yorkers, yo also means yo. <laughs> in, in, in the street, everybody knows what yo is. It's to call it, you know, someone's attention to something. If you say yo, you're gonna turn and you're gonna look and see what's going on. So that's kind of, you know, calling attention to something that's been marginalized, something that, you know, has been undervalued, almost even demonized, like any African-based cultural music. You know, what we're talking about is a music, a tradition that stayed alive during the African diaspora. And so, wherever it would go, that culture, the drum, the song, the dance, those are the elements. The most important piece in, in the bomba for me is, is the dance. There are two principal drums that, that are, are used. This drum plays the bass rhythm, it gets the foundation, then the dancer just adds flavor with, with movements. Those movements are interpreted with, with my drum. I, I, I catch those movements all improvised, I follow, and sometimes it's so perfectly done, it looks like a choreography, but it's not. What you see is all improvised. It's sort of like a conversation. You know, as you talk, and maybe when you're talking to your friend, you know, you start talking on top of each other, your voices start getting higher and accelerating. We sort of transplant that into a nonverbal communication. And how powerful is that when we think of our ancestors who were slaves, and this was maybe their only time to connect with themselves and to their community in a real way. When we engage with Bomba, we know that there's a deep, deep roots to that. And there's power in holding whatever you have as a tool to communicate. Awesome. <laughs> that was really, really good. I liked it. It was unique. I never heard it before. I liked the, when they harmonized and then all the voices came together and sounded like one. And it's only going to get even more musical because we have with us a very special guest. 
FAME, the Filipino Arts and Music Ensemble. The participants here are youth, ranging from elementary school all the way up through high school. And we're really, really glad to have you with us. Hector Martinez, thank you so much for being here. Can you tell us a little bit about the group, how long you've been going and what the, what the, how the music works? Is it improvised like Bomba Yo? We've been going on for 10 years now. And most of the arrangements that we do are all written out. So all these, these students read music. And we come together, they practice their home, practice their music, they come together, we put everything together. Great, well thank you, I can't wait to hear it. Sure, thank you. Fame is a collection of kids who come in and practice uh, Filipino folk instruments. Most of the songs that we play come from the Philippines. They are Filipino folk songs that we sing at the uh, fiestas that we have. The mission of Filipino Arts and Music Ensemble is to promote and preserve the Philippine culture and heritage. The Filipino folk music comes from Spain, um, especially the instruments that we have over here. We have a guitar, we have a double bass. This is a bandurria. Usually the bandurias play the melodies. We also have an octavina. They do play melodies as well, but more of counterpoint. There's some kind of Mexican influence to the way we play. We have rhythms of the habanera. Although it's slower, we make it into a love song. We play polkas. And we play waltzes. Making sure that those single notes are together. Ta, pok, ta, pok, ta, okay? One, two, and. We also dance. There is a sense of focus for a group, especially kids, because sometimes kids nowadays, it's very individualistic, especially in America. But here, you have to lose your certain individuality to be part of that group. But first of all, it's to have fun with each other. Joke around, play around, kid around, eat pizza, and Filipino spaghetti. Filipino spaghetti, because it's different from the Italian spaghetti. Kids learn how to play this instrument. There's discipline, there's culture, there's camaraderie. When all is gone, when they are, they're in their own lives in the future, one of these days, they'll take up that instrument 
start playing again, or if not, lead a new group. I didn't hear that music before, but it was kind of similar to our countryside music. And I kind of find various tunes where we were thinking, oh, this sounds like this one, and this sounds like the, uh, this other one. So it feels kind of familiar. It was beautiful. I think it's an, uh, incredible to see young people keeping traditions alive and feeling it. It felt so calming and so smoothing. And I felt like the, we call musica hibara, uh, mountain music, uh, you know, very string guitar oriented. And now we're about to do something really interesting. We're going to go deep into the 21st century to the Puerto Rican Filipino axis. What happens? when we hear some traditional bomba music being played alongside, underneath, through some Filipino traditional music. And I think it's gonna be really interesting and we can't wait to hear what the result is gonna be. Based on that familiar sound that we have already, we're gonna to try to blend it in with what we know and kind of go back and forth with the sounds that they're bringing up. I think it's gonna sound great, cause like, cause like their beat with our melody, I think it's just gonna sound really good. I'll trade you, I wanna try yours. I wanna try this one. All right. <laughs> there we go. What's this called? Uh, Octavina. Octavina? Yeah. Wow, this is so cool. You master that instrument. No matter what it, kind of attitude anyone has towards it, they cannot take that from you. You go to your grave with the knowledge of your culture and your tradition. And when you have that, you're always secure. That's it. That's the arrangement? That's their, that's their melody, okay? Now, Bandura 2, you could do Re, Do sharp, T, La, Fa sharp. When they started to sing first, I was thinking, okay, maybe this is the song we might be doing. So I listened to your melody, and I tried to figure it out on the mandolins, and these are the notes that I figured out from, the, from what you sang. So it's basically like four or five notes. I said, okay, we could just play on that one, maybe make some chords in that one. Obviously, there are two different groups playing two quite different pieces of music. So right in, in and of itself, like that's, that seems like a, a, a hurdle, but it might not be. And this is New York where this kind of thing is happening every day. unofficially <laughs> on every street corner, right. people. Is that a work? Let's just try it, see if it works. <laughs> Okay, can we do that one more time? 
It's a different key. <laughs> okay. Ah. I think you you're. Give them the notes? Maybe we're um, going to the yeah, take it because we were taking it from, from a while here, ago, okay. um, and we were oh. like, it was a bit lower now. It Could you give it a fasha? Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. And I'll do the bottom one. Let, let's let's try. I'll just play the drum, the rhythm, and then you bring that in, and let me see if I if I can just come into. Okay. We could do that. Right? We could start Maybe. with the drums and then right. we got your know, tremolo. When they start singing, do the pulsing though. It's not, pulsing is better, but for now, tremolo. And I'll tell you when right. to change. Any variation okay. of that. Yeah. The drums might drown out the, the strings. It might have to be a bit lighter on yeah, the Yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. Yeah. That's why I want to I hear it. If I start off first, I'm going to start off strong. But if I hear the strings first, then I'll go underneath the strings. Oh, cool. Okay. okay. So why don't we start with this? Let's try this. Three, and. Fun. 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 Break it. Yeah, the the the, the, the second. Fun. Creative with the rhythm that you're playing. Be creative.
Texas. <laughs> I, you know, um, I had to control myself because uh, when it immediately started, I, I just wanted to cry because um, the voices, everything came together. It was like I was in heaven. It just <laughs> took me somewhere else. And it's it just, was, you're in a trance, isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It was so hard to believe that zone. this is happening. So, you know, it was beautiful, man. Beautiful. You guys came together so naturally. It's just, it was beautiful. I mean, from out here, it was like a magical and beautiful sound. It was so crazy. It seemed so easy, too. It seemed like it just <laughs> happened. We could do this. <laughs> <laughs> we could actually play together. And it yeah. gives a nice rhythmic excitement to what we do because we don't have rhythms. Right, right. So once you come in, it's like, it feels much more danceable. <laughs> right, right, right. What if we decide to end with a dance party and we find maybe one note or something that could be for anyone who wanted to do a little bit of playing, but if we maybe end with a bumba song, um, if you want to sort of take the lead on that, but just open it up for as much dancing. Just a total free form. <laughs> for a, a blink moment in time. People are aware of what they're feeling every day. If you're gonna restore and sustain a democracy, there must be an informed and engaged citizen. I spent two years in immigration detention. You know how much they spent to feed me for one whole day? How much? 75 cents. Immigrants as a whole, migration as a whole, is associated with lower rates of crime. Immigrants make our communities safer. What causes climate change, the selling and burning of fossil fuels, benefits most the power elite. And so they have a disincentive to address it, and they have an incentive to deny it. 
They're not gonna funnel more money into our schools. They're not gonna do it unless they have to, right? And the way they have to is by our participation, our organization, us taking accountability for our actions.
thought it was natural, actual, Lee, that's only true for the flow. At your teeth if I got beef, yet no one really knows if he's about it because I'm peak. Still a beast in the east at the core. Please be sure, cause I'll be good in any hood from Inglewood back to NY. And no, I don't fly. My soul speaks to the street where the weak prey on the weak and the strong. Only speak to the like minded. I find it to be kind of crazy. And to those who have the knowledge, we have gotten pretty lazy. Soon the baby's gonna be running. Current, just running it. Straight to the ground, another round for these stiff. Smoke a slip and get lifted. Then listen to the, the kid spits because he's gifted. Soup that is the dude I is. And I say, get down with it. Get down or move the hell out of my way. Silly spit up city rhymes. Wanna hang? I see you trying. Can't get the working on the time. I'm living and I grind. I grind. Silly spit up kicking rhymes. Wanna hang? I see you trying. You can't get that working on the time. With your eyes see, I see cattle track, sheep, herd it toward the mass appeal, that's the real, half a meal, a glass of water, meditate, restore the order, food for thought, I know you wanna wake up, that's why you pop this tape in, take a couple notes while you're watching, things make it intense, burning some incense, and beating on the drum will make you conscious, bruh, you sound dumb, but that's your right, and that's alright, I like the differences between you and I, Cause I am souping through the night I will shoot with a light Trying to illuminate my people Keeping them from chasing people All of those that remain to see you Should keep on dreaming I'm hoping they don't see you Better be thinking why your mind free But please don't mind me Cause I'll be sitting inside me High, clear mind, red eyes A dark horse Jedi And soup the dude And I be like Silly silly kicking rhymes Wanna hang out to your try Let's get the word of the time I'm just living and I grind. 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 Silly spinning, kicking rhymes. Wanna hang it till you try. And skip the work and come the time. I'm just living and I grind. 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 Right? Better kick and run. Wanna hang? I see you trying. Can skip the work it comes with time. I'm just living and I grind. 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 Silly spit and kicking rhymes. Wanna hang? I see you trying. Can skip the work it comes with time. I'm just living and I grind. 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 Yeah.
put a poopy on. Maybe hit a couple blocks on me. Sit the back, ask you where the hell you at. But then the cut is jumping, come and beat me in the back. So I hop in the D ride, rip it to the park. Pass the pump, pump, sitting in his car. Now I'm hoping I ain't got a warrant on my head. Cause then he pulled me over, roll my window down his shed. Mr. Officer, I ain't got nothing on me. Except the middle finger screaming at the police. Now don't give a damn about your badge or your gun. So if you try to touch me, best believe I'm gon' run. Mr. Officer, I ain't got nothing on me. Except the middle finger screaming at the police. And now don't give a damn about your badge or your gun. So if you try to touch me, best believe I'm gon' run. Goes back to the sea, man, I done had enough. 40 minutes in, it's like he's trying to set me up. Thinking to myself, like, this is unbelievable. Then he told me, sir, please step out of the vehicle. Look at stuff I want, ask me, what the hell is this? Started walking to me, while he's reaching for his hip up like this. Time to make a decision quick, cause I'm either getting hit or I'm gonna hit him with the gift. Mr. So officer, I ain't got nothing on me. Except this middle finger screaming at the police. And I don't give a damn about your badge or your gun. Do so if you try to touch me, best believe I'm gonna run. Mr. So officer, I ain't got nothing on me. Except this middle finger screaming. At the police, and I don't give a damn about your badge or your gun. Do if you try to touch me, let's believe I'm going to run. Yo, I told inside the whip, quick, slam the car door. Fed up on the cop, I put the pedal to the floor. Car started racing, I ain't even take the wheel. My heart steady racing, but these nerves are made of steel. Now I'm feeling like I'm okay. Pulling out the driveway, doing 120 in a Bronco on the highway. Fuck a pimp and do better get up out the way. Fuck the police, it's still all I gotta say. It's my conscience, for I'm no different from these cops turned clansmen. For this is how quickly, they will I was willing race. to make a criminal Little out of my kid, maybe I could have called more. I see Honey, a transgendered woman not ship. being invited to the room. I'm the kind of woman who is happy for fun, and God knows I can be so much more the than a I might this war just started is not over. A life America, of losing every war and you start too. has its price. America and my mother is going to make you pay. A slam is really just a silly little game, right? A bunch of people sitting around, you know, giving scores to art. What is that? It's the chance and the opportunity for people to really tell their stories. And this entire process can be therapeutic. For some people, coming to a slam is the first time they ever really have a community and have people listen to them. So more than winning, are we creating art to heal ourselves? Are we creating art to heal others? And how are we supporting each other as well? This is the Brooklyn Slam team. Give it up for Anthony McPherson. Balu. Make some noise for Stephen Willis. Paul Tran. And last but not least, Crystal Valentine. You know what, I'm not even gonna be politically correct about it. People will say that your poems should be about changing lives and making the world better. Winning and creating the most honest and impactful work are not necessarily separate. If you intend to win, you have to dig deep into your soul and pull out your most vulnerable truth and your most powerful points. With that, I intend to win the trophy, and if I do not come back with the trophy, I will be ashamed. the issue of faith, why God allowed certain things. I had a three-year battle with ACS because they thought I abused my daughter. I always hope for freedom, right? But the other side of that is I want the same thing for other people who don't know how to have these conversations, who don't know how to say I'm hurting, or who don't know how to say that thing you're doing is killing me. I am a coward some days. And I hide behind the cross. But I am also the kind of woman who will wait for Christ to come to me. The kind of woman who always lets a man make the first move. The kind of woman who moves too fast and gets pregnant too soon and shocks up like a whore who does not have a children's last name. The worst kind of woman who sees nothing wrong with this, who knows her vagina is a missile. Who will break your body if you ask for it. Who will bust your head if you ask for it. Things like, don't ask me for shit. Mm. But I would give up almost.
else anything if you need it. And just ask for it. But be cautious. Because I lose things. Like children. is undoubtedly the Sega Genesis. No loading time. Never needs to update. And virtually indestructible. But my Genesis was, was special. Because it had That's my fault. That's, that's my line. That's your line. Yep. We have a tremendous work ethic. This is one of the hardest working teams I think we ever had. You have to understand that like Paul, Steven, and McPherson are all the yeah. top 13 poets in the world. And Falu, you know, she ranked third in Woman of the World Poetry Slam. So, like, these are all, like, really acclaimed poets that I always look up to. And I think that they're highly favored in the community as well. After Brooklyn not having a team for, like, 10, 11 years, I couldn't imagine a better group of writers who perform, like, no one's business. I'm excited to show people who have competition because Brooklyn writes great poems. On behalf of this Atlanta-based flight crew, I wish each and every one a wonderful day and a great week. It took a lot for us to get here, so y'all need to start and make it work and do it for all the people who got you here. Well, we want to thank you for this opportunity of being able to join this together. We know that what we're about to do right now is not only going to change our lives, but also change the form. Mo has instilled in us the ability to understand that the integrity of our work is the most important thing that we have here. Let that be the thing that fuels us and guide us today to victory from today and the rest of this week. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, on the count of three, bring it home. One, two, three. Bye, you! The first person to molest me was my sister. The first person to molest me was my father. With soft hands and even softer coercion. A big sister telling her toy chest doll to open her thighs. A drunk father telling his smashed beer bottle child to open its mouth. Wider, please. For your big sister, please. We, we know, know about, about the men, the lines wearing sheepskin, making hunting rounds of women's throats. Remind us how easy it is to lose our parts in the dark. But what about the women? What about the kin, the lines wearing human skin? I like these who ask before taking. That means that in first place, give it up for Brooklyn Slam. Rocked out? Great. Necessary. <laughs> Great. All right, shoulders forward, chin begin. One. Go. 
out with me. One. I don't really have poetry that is not about what directly affects me. You know, at some points, everything around me is crumbling. At some points, everything around me is amazing. And I feel like I'm such a, a quiet person for people who don't know me, whom I don't speak with. It is really the only chance to tell my story. When the Oval Office picks the slave ship from its teeth, the rallies will morph into mosh pits. Soccer moms and Nixon masks clapping off the beat. All tempos matter. African American vernacular English, oh my God, they call it slang. The man calls it bondage. I call it America's freedom. The question really has you if you think that you are the only one feeling this way and therefore you definitely cannot do anything about it because it's only you. When I go to Poetry Slam, I build with people who are like me, with queer folk, with black folk, with, with women, you know, and people who are not like me. It's important to know you're not alone, and it's also important to know that there are people who will fight for you. My mother is white. I am biracial. And there's a lot of issues with, that come with that, with attacking white supremacy while your mom is white and distinguishing the difference between white people and white supremacy. And that results in a lot of issues with my family. I bring those up, I don't stifle them, because there are a lot of biracial people with the same issues. Going home you know, to your family should be like a chance to be safe, right? But for me, it's like, those are some of the most volatile white people because they love you and they're still fucking you up. One of the big aspects of culture is family and a family structure. So if mass incarceration is this major thing, we have to discuss about how mass incarceration affects the family. You know, what's that mean? What's it doing to the family dynamic? Other than, hey, I don't have a dad at home anymore, or I don't have a brother at home anymore. And so, you know, this is a joke that all black people have country cousins, right? Everyone has that country cousin, or even people, period, have those cousins in the country. And so I said, well, you know, particularly to the African-American experience, we have county cousins, cousins who are in jail. So this one here is for my county cousins. Come on. Currently incarcerated for crimes committed and or confessed, contributing to the new Jim Crow, my county cousins. Not to be confused by my country cousins currently in Kansas, cooking cornbread and collard greens in the kitchen all. Those cousins you see every summer, these cousins you see every quarter century and count me, constantly making collect calls inquiring about commissary, curse to forever circulate in and out of this country's industrial prison complex, constructed for collecting coons for an orange and black continuum. My cousin used to wear busted jeans to Grandma's Christian church in Chatham. My cousin was cool enough to make the most sedity girl smile. Was the same cousin I saw clinch and clutch and rage the sight of his brother's blood on concrete made that gun crop for day. A crooked Chicago cop came and caged my cousin before college, and now my family only congregates in courtrooms. The entire male previous generation before me are all in jail. All my uncles are in prison. All of my cousins are in prison. They all got caught up in the drug life that was Chicago, following in the footsteps of one of my older uncles, one of my grandmother's brothers. And so we lost an entire generation of men. So I grew up you know, knowing some of my very close family members, immediate family members behind the glass. You know, as a member of many minority groups, of many oppressed groups, anyone who stands in a position as an oppressed person has to know everything about themselves and their oppressor. I've spent all my life learning about the people who would rather me not exist. And I think through SLAM and in the world, it's time they learn a little bit about me and what I go through and the people I love. I will peel myself away from your skin. I will return to my life again. I will return to this world again. I come back from death to find a voice, to say your name, to tell everyone what you did to me. I come back from death to look you dead in the eye, to look you dead, to teach you to be what you asked for. You better.
Thank for what you asked for because I will show you exactly what this mouth do. Hmm. <laughs> and Brooklyn will be back on the stage. Rupees from Brooklyn. The best video game console is undoubtedly the, the Sega Genesis. Genesis. No loading time never needs to update. Inverted indestructible. <laughs> but my Genesis was special because it had two controls. One for me and one for Mom Deuce. And she but always let me rock as her player one. Soon as she heard that Sega, she knew to break out the snacks from Blockbuster Video. Oh, you name a cartridge? We beat that cartridge. Double Dragon, Light Work, Mortal Kombat 1 and 2. Finished them. Michael Jackson's uh, Moonwalker. Yeah. Beat it. The <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm bad. The second Genesis was the source of me and Mom's strongest connection. She was the tails to my Sonic. My two-tailed sidekick flying me up the places I couldn't reach alone. Here comes a new challenger. Her boyfriend loved fighting games. The controller was shaking in his hand. He never rolled it up when finished. Mom would wake up with a new brew and blame it on tripping over his wire. She grew addicted to him, and I grew addicted to Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Character select, always picking the girls, always playing in the expert mode, unable to protect her from the beatdown. Dizzy stars, the red countdown flashing lights, top lights, tailing. We have a low score of a 9.9. They give me four of a kind ten. And the one for the evening with a 118.4, give it up for Brooklyn. I, I'm just really, like, you guys are like really great. Genesis changed everything. Yeah. Genesis was not a home that I believed in all for years, right? Yo, and I, I believe this dude, and I thank you for believing in my work. Throughout the whole process, he was just not letting me give up on that poem. I fought McPherson from the moment it was on paper <laughs> for where words would go, what it should do, just for that, what just happened, to have a 30. And it could change, it could change lives. That happens when we love each other. That happens when we trust each other. That happens when everybody sits there and watch you and claps for you not until it's done. You know what I'm saying? Not until they quote you in poems and writing after poems. Not until they're doing Falu fucking movements on stage. I saw it. I was like, oh, okay. But that's what happens. That's the game we're in. You inspire people. And when you inspire, emulation and imitation, right? But it, it doesn't take from the fact that you need to be replenished. Yeah. The well needs to be replenished. The best way to replenish the well is to trust each other and hold each other. And trust us and know that we got you. All right, have fun. <clears throat> talk to folks. Do not talk poems. Never. Do not talk poems. Welcome everyone. This is the National Poetry Slam semifinal coming at you from Decatur, Georgia. Decatur Red Grand. Nice try, Dylan. But we still going to church. Still gonna claim this white man's religion. Wants you to enslave us. Still gonna fill these white pews with this black light. All right, we have a tie for first. With 118.7 each. This tie is between House Slam and Brooklyn. This is the first bout I've ever managed that has ended in a tie where we need to break a tie. So we need to break a tie. We did a coin flip based on the call. House Poetry Slam is going to send a poet up first. They are going to be represented on your scorecards with a one. Brooklyn Poetry Slam is going to go up second. They are going to be on your scorecards represented by a two. It doesn't mean they're any better or worse. Healing begins whenever you are ready, even at age 65. My grandma rocks her face 
heart feeling mean on a five foot frame. Fingers painted gold, baby powder on her chest like, shave my legs for what? Like, titty small but clothes you only need but a mouthful like Ashley. You better keep your receipts. Tell me no matter how good it seems when you bought it, you better make sure you have the means to return it when it no longer serves you. Yeah. Let this be her first lesson in healing. Mm -hmm. My grandma shared a bed with my molester for 40 years. When she found out where grandpa's hands had been, she shook her head with a sick, sick man, she said. It was 15 years ago, so memories have crawled fetal position into the corners of my flashback still. I wonder if in that moment she was thankful to never have dogs. Do I feel safe? as a body, as a person, when I go to a slam venue preparing to share my work? Not at all, because I don't feel safe on the street. Being invisible, being actively erased, reconstituted for someone else's comfort, aren't things that I'm unfamiliar with. And I don't expect slam to be any different. And for that reason, I'm not showing up to do my poem. I have to stunt. I have to make people listen to every word, every argument, all the evidence I lay out before them. I have to make them put themselves in my poem, assess their relationship to me, to people like me, to analyze whether my values, my ideological worldviews are congruent or incongruent to them and why. And then I have to get them to give me a good score because my writing is good, because my performance is incomparable. And I have to do all of that in a matter of seconds. Because 10, 15, 20 seconds into the poem, someone has already decided whether or not I'm worth their time. The police said, show me the evidence. The nurse said, show me the evidence. The nurse said, here, this is an HIV test. Run it along your gums like this. My mom said, wow, did you ask for it? Are you positive? And I returned to the night it happened. Two hours underwater wondering if his cum was so wet and fresh in this body, if this body had enough evidence to convict him to turn back time, reach for my boot heel, shove the metal end of my hairpin into the nearest socket, and let, 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 let you let both of that room. Would you call the victim that? Call number one if you prefer House Slayer. Call number two if you prefer Brooklyn. We have a one, a one, a one. <laughs> A one and a two. Let's give it up for our second place team, Brooklyn. And let's give it up for our first place team in the semifinals bout. Give it up for the house round. funny because when you walk away you see all the moments where the shift happens and you live that for the next 48 hours. But at the end of the day, I really believe we had, you know, one of the best teams here. They did an immaculate job. They were transformative, game-changing. And I see other teams, including the ones we went against, using inspiration from these people. And I hope they know, maybe not now, but you know, maybe soon they'll see how they're really leaders. And you know, most times we kill our leaders. Y'all give it up for Brooklyn Slam. For the boys told they were too dark to be the Dark Knight. Too colored to be the Cape Crusader. Don't worry, there is a hero here to avenge you. And then the Black Panthers say, fuck Batman. Yeah. Oh, so you calling yourself the Dark Knight? Really, nigga? <laughs> Did Hillary teach you how to nay nay? Let me guess. You got hot sauce in your utility belt. Oh, you want to nay me so bad. You're what I'd be if I had no power. 
and they praise you for your non-miraculous mediocrity. You let the world know anyone can be a hero. As long as you're born rich, it, it seems privilege is the only it. thing super about you. Your writers do more for underachievement, while we must be twice as good for half the panel. So, not only will I beat you in chess, despite you going first every time, my soul be bonded with the panther god, the ethereal fist raised above heaven. Fuck a Batmobile. I got a black man on bill on suicide doors in a kill switch. Cat Becky, <laughs> cat woman, it keeps burglarizing you, while me and my queen take this world by storm. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that in Bible. They say I just might be a black Bruce Wayne in the making. <laughs> Fuck that! I am T'Challa. Put some respect on my name. Basket of the devil is a black bastard. Can't copy the King Kunta charisma. Cam Newton meets Huey P. Newton in brains and bra. This Jesus on the cross meets Jesus on the ark. I'd be the full spectrum of black shit. From the cop to Zamunda. Black skin to dark skin. Sweet to salt and green. All ready man to Protecting from bullets, I've got blackboards everywhere, trading in their gold chains for vibranium. I'm a metal man of every sound. So my people stay draped up and dripped out in their own invincible voices. The Black Panther Party came after the Black Panther comic. Imagine what will happen when we soul train to the silver screen. We will know Superman is as irrelevant as phone. That the battle is just a wanna be Afro <laughs> That MLK's secret identity is Malcolm X. Surprise, motherfucker. Look at me. I am Captain Adam, the real dark knight. Black emperor, king of kings. Let work in the trees. Don't make me buy Wade Enterprises. Don't make me buy Gotham City. Don't make me buy DC Comics Batman. You just might be my sidekick in the making of the
views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Public Health America, a 30-minute program on BronxNet where we talk with national experts to promote health and social justice. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. We begin by focusing on a current health topic from the COVID pandemic to cardiovascular disease. Our goal is to provide you with not only the best science, but practical tips to live a healthier life. On Public Health America, we also celebrate what studies have long documented, namely the unparalleled value of a college education by setting the stage to pursue a career of your choice, increase lifetime earnings and opportunity, and champion the ability to engage in civil debate. But for many, finding a path to college is neither clear nor certain. What if you're a high school student with supportive parents but feel daunted by the prospect of being the first in your family to attend college? What if you're a single mother or father and want to attend college but have no childcare? On Public Health America, our expert will also talk about decisions they made and support they received that helped them beat the odds. By sharing one or two life lessons, their stories may provide you with the inspiration and method to realize your dreams. This is Public Health America. Welcome to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Padmini Murthy, Professor of Global Health Director at Medical New York Medical College School of Health Sciences and Practice, Global Health Lead of the American Medical Women's Association. Padmini, welcome. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Pleasure to have you. So I know you've been doing some cutting edge work on the intersection of global health and human rights, particularly as it pertains to the health status of women and girls. Tell us a little bit about your work. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not saying this because I'm a woman or the mother of a daughter, but unfortunately, women and girls everywhere around the world have been short changed, especially when it comes to their health and well-being. As we know, in so many places, they can't even make choices whether it's to space their children or to go to school or to delay their, uh, you know, uh, age of marriage. So one of the things I found when I was a young girl growing up in India many years ago, that I always used to ask these questions, why? Um, uh, you know, when I used to see some of the others, they didn't have the same freedom I had uh, and my sister had. And then I realized that it's the way we think the way we are brought up. So to me, health is important. Not only do I say that as a physician, a public health uh, uh, professional, uh, but also because this is without health, you don't have anything. And somebody can only uh, experience their full health potential when their human rights are very much intertwined into the access to health, the delivery of healthcare services. So that's why it's important. So would you say the lion's share of your work is in the US or international or both? I would say it's both. For example, uh, during the current COVID crisis, I just want to give you a very brief example uh, with the uh, uh, American Medical Women, where I'm the global health lead. It's an NGO, which is over 105 years old. I'm not 105, but we've been around for a long time and we work on the intersection of health and human rights. And we work with faith-based NGOs and made sure we delivered food from here to uh, the sisters of uh, uh, charity, uh, you know, Mother Teresa's foundation in India, because they reached out to us. So what I'm saying is this was global efforts with uh, uh, with uh, global outreach and local efforts with a global outreach. And it was partnering. When we look at the sustainable development goals, there's 17 of them. So this is 17, which really talks about partnerships to uh, promote health and well-being for all. And the majority of the people suffering there when the sisters reached out to us were women and girls. So to answer your question in one sentence, it is both in the US and outside the US. I just gave you an example of outside the US. As you outline your mission, obviously it's critically important and fairly far reaching given that there are so many countries 
throughout the world that human rights issues, particularly as they relate to women and girls, uh, is uh, is greatly troublesome. And then certainly in the U.S., there are all kinds of um, issues related to gender and sex and uh, that still need to be sorted out that are not. And all kinds of, uh, you know, one could argue rights that are potentially being eroded. Um, how do you choose what issues, what countries, what topics to focus on? Because it just seems to me that there there could be so much to do, how, how do you, how do you select? And, um, you know, if you could give another example or two of your work, I think it would be very instructive. The way I select is what is burning and what is something I feel passionately about. I feel very passionately about making sure whatever I can do along with my other colleagues and friends to address the health needs, the basic health needs of women and girls. And how do we choose, um, now, we all know that there is a lot of what we call period poverty, where women and girls in the U.S. and outside do not have access to the uh, sanitary products they need. So currently, uh, I am working uh, along with my colleagues, uh, and we've galvanized a lot of students uh, with the First Lady of Suriname, Her Excellency's office, to address a period poverty while keeping in uh, lieu with the sustainability on how to make sure we can get to them this a pilot project of reusable sanitary products. So we have a lot of people, we also working with another NGO, Days for Girls, where we have teams of volunteers sewing these sanitary pads, which can be reused uh, uh, by washing them, which we send overseas. This might seem something trivial, but we all need to know, not only in a country like Suriname, even here, we have a lot of period poverty, especially for those of uh, our, uh, you know, of the women who are incarcerated in prisons. And this is terrible that we we have to pay a tax on sanitary products, which is considered a luxury good when in actually it is an essential product. So in answer to your question, these are issues where we can all work together simply to get together because there's power in numbers and it's small drops of water make a mighty ocean. That's what we need in public health. So I hope I've answered your question by giving you a, you know, a small example. No, that's a great example, and you certainly have. So in my experience, typically, uh, you know, I'm thinking of USAID, CIFAR, other mechanisms that uh, fund intervention uh, projects, not so much research, large scale, like the ones you're describing, uh, you know, in one instance to provide sanitary products to, uh, you know, a country, that seems unbelievably important. Um, you know, do, are, do you have the ability to take a moment, and believe me, if you don't, it's, it's, it's not a criticism. Do you have the ability to take a moment and figure out what works? Or is it that, you know, you're just so busy with the day-to-day -day of dealing with the fires that you're putting out that it's more about just just getting, you know, being responsive to the needs. Is that is that a fair? Was that clear? Uh, it was very clear. And in answer to the uh, your question is with the whole point of having projects, whether it was sending food to uh, the Sisters of Charity in Calcutta to help the uh, people who are socially disadvantaged or to address period poverty. As I stressed clearly, Bill, this was a pilot project. So we are going to make sure we even anticipate in part phase two how to have training for where women are able there to sue sanitary pads because the whole crux of it is sustainability. I mean, you cannot keep supplying bread to somebody for the rest of your life and their lives, but it is to teach them how to bake bread well so that it caters to their needs. So this is what I want to really uh, stress that that's why it's so important. And that's why we I always have my students involved, young people involved, and my daughter's also involved in this. So are some of our other friends to see 
what can we do to teach them to be self-sufficient? So I think the advantage of these is we are bringing together communities, uh, you know, through local efforts, as I said, to really have an impact. And again, to make them understand that these are simple things they can follow and uh, uh, make sure that uh, they can be self-sufficient. So clearly you are working at a structural level to make these great interventions you're doing sustainable by partnering with, you know, boots on the ground, folks in the various communities in which you're working. Um, we just have a couple minutes left. Tell us about um, what are you working on now and what are the next steps? Okay, so what I'm working on now is, as I said, this is one of the things to address uh, period poverty. And the other thing, coming back to the U.S., you know, the Black Maternal Momnibus Act of 2021 was introduced uh, <clears throat> in um, February this year. And one of the things from UNA USA, we are working to see how can we promote this. So that's something to address these discrepancies in maternal health care. So that's the whole uh, thing we are also working on. So these two are on the top of my agenda. That's great. So we're going to take a quick break. When we return, Dr. Murthy will tell us a little bit about her life story and how her uh, uh, post-secondary education experience at the table for this amazing career in advocacy and supporting the health of women and girls. This is Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. We'll be right back. for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at Bronxnet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs>
Welcome back to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. So Padmini, on this uh, segment of the program, I always open with the same question. Um, where were you born? And tell us about some of your formative experiences. Thank you so much, Bill. So, um, you know, I was born in India and uh, I did uh, a lot of my education in India and then um, kind of uh, lived outside now for the uh, more than 30 years, uh, was in the United Kingdom, in the Middle East and in the US for like what now, 27 years. Um, and uh, growing up, uh, I had a very interesting childhood because my parents, uh, uh, you know, always made sure we were exposed, my sister and I, to people from different countries, different, uh, uh, you know, diverse cultures. And uh, they had this uh, huge big house where they used to host students, especially when they came to India from overseas. I remember we had Japanese students, we had Swiss students who used to come, you know, backpacking was common in the 80s when I was growing up, like late 70s and 80s. And they used to come and stay with us because they used to save money. And this is what I was exposed to, like multilateralism, multiculturalism, if that's a word, I just coined it. And to say that people are, you know, they may look different from you, but we are all same. And the other thing I wanted to share, what really set me going like act, you know, being an activist, I guess I was born with an activist gene. Maybe I inherited that from my mother because when we were kids growing up, you know, we used to have a lot of domestic help in the house. And I remember there used to be many young people who kind of used to fight to say, we want to come and walk with your mom. And one day I, 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 I asked them and I asked my mom, I said, mom, why, do, do every, why does everybody want to come and work for you? She said, because, and then I, she said, ask one of the girls. So I asked one of the girls who my, also, my mom also taught English and, you know, taught her to go to school part time. She stayed with us for a long time. And I remember my parents paid her school fees to go to school. Long story short, she said, because your mother buys us sanitary products, what she buys for you and your sister. And that got me to thinking, I go like, so there are people who don't have access to the basic needs we have. So that is what, so since maybe I was 11 years old, that's like such a long time ago. So that got me thinking, I said like, okay, I am fortunate in having something, so I need to spread this around or see what can I do. So my mantra is like when I tell students or anybody I speak to, it's you don't have to be a billionaire or a millionaire. Whatever you can do, you can do to help others. So advocacy needs to be practical. It's need, it needs to be steadfast. And advocacy is not necessarily protesting something, but working to see how these can be addressed. So fast forward after living in all these countries and then I came to the US, I did my training again. I went to NYU and then I have a master's in public health and I have a master's in management. And for me, I was always conscious of social determinants. And one thing I always learned from my late mom, she always used to say, one thing nobody can steal from you, they can steal your money, they can steal your jewelry or your car, anything, but they cannot steal your education and skill set. So that's why to me, investing in education is so important because it helps you not only maybe get a few letters next to your name, but also gives you the skill sets on how you can do something not only to make a difference for yourself but for others and you can be strong back to you bill thank you yeah what a wonderful uh uh childhood uh, adolescence you had uh in india being uh given the opportunity to meet so many amazing people from around the world um where uh so where did you do your initial post-secondary, what we call undergraduate education. Was well, that I, yep. Yeah, that was in India. Yes. Yep. Right. My uh, pre-med and med, yes. And then went to England, then trained there, and then, uh, you know, came here to the U.S. So, yes. Great. So talk to us a little bit about um, the post-secondary education system in India. What's that like? 
How's it different from the U.S.? How's it similar? Or just just any comments you want to share? I sure, think it'd be- sure. Uh, thank you. So the post uh, secondary education is a little different in that after grade twelve, that you do ten years in school and then you do uh, two years in what is called an intermediary, or you do twelve years in school. And then you go to a gra uh, undergrad. Well, that can be anything you choose. Like, you know, you can go directly to medical school, which is five and a half years, or you you, you go to do your engineering or architecture, or, or you do three years of undergrad. The basic difference, Bill, is here. Our undergrad is four years in the US. In India, it's three years. And then a lot of people like me, I did like my pre-medicine, like my bachelor's in science, and then went on to medical school, which was like, uh, five and a half years and my sister who did her engineering she went directly from plus two there are other people who do their three years of undergrad and then go on to law school it's pretty competitive you have to pass an exam like we have the GRE here you pass what is an entrance exam you pass that you get into medical school or engineering school and then there are some other schools at least there were where they looked at your performance in high school and then you would get a uh, a seat uh, to study there so again it's competitive and uh, you know what it's like they have now i think they have all these when i speak to people back in india they have all these coaching centers like we have the various coaching centers here to prepare you for your boards board certification the same thing they have in india so i think the the differences are in the duration of the years but the similarities is that you have to achieve something you need to get a certain score like here we have the lsat and then you have your mcats where you know my medical students take the mcats before coming to medical school so the same way you have these different qualifying exams in courts but Again, there is no shortcut to hard work. And I think whether it's a student in India or a student in the US or anywhere else, they do what they have to do. Got it. Um, talk just one more minute or moment about your experience in India. Were there, you know, we've had other guests that have talked about the importance of doing what you love, the importance of having a mentor, the importance of experiential learning, uh, in terms of sort of leveraging or utilizing that undergraduate, you know, or, or initial post-secondary experience uh, as much as possible to sort of figure out the next steps. Um, what was your experience in India and what were, uh, what was one barrier you faced if you faced any and what was uh, something that was uh, uh, protective or helpful? Thank you. Um, I hate to say it that I didn't face any barriers, unfortunately, because I guess I was very lucky to have very supportive parents. And also I had a great mentor in medical school who saw my, uh, like, you know, my passion for social work or public service. And he encouraged me and to speak like, you know, made sure I was like, you know, because uh, uh, he, he termed what I was a motivational speaker to so uh, go and speak to not only my peers, but other students be in debating. So I had that. But one thing I, I would like to say is if you don't ask somebody, you need to seek out. This is my advice to students everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're in the Bronx, in Westchester, in Dutchess County, where I live, Westchester, where I teach, anywhere, you need to ask somebody, please, can you help me? And if you put it politely and nicely, people do help you. They meet you. So I've been a mentor to so many, and I've had some great mentors even here, you know, uh, Dr. Kaswani, um, uh, whom I call my second mom. Uh, she is like 86 years old, 87, God bless her. She's been an amazing mentor to me in so many ways. And so many of us, we all need mentors and we need to give back. And the relationship between a mentor and mentee is so sacred because it's just not the mentor giving everybody has equal responsibilities and accountability. It doesn't change where you are, which country you are, which continent you're on. So uh, a real emphasis on the uh, incredible power of a, of a, uh, of a benevolent uh, and helpful and strategic mentor. Um, about a minute or so left. Um, you, once you got to the U.S., 
did you redo, did you do a residency or did you do the MPH or, and, and, uh, and if so, how did that go? Well, I passed my boards and I, I redid my training, but I, it, uh, I did my MPH and a master's in management from New York University. And I realized that my passion is teaching and, you know, like helping others. So that's where I kind of digressed a little. I still do teach, uh, you know, medical students and other students in so many parts of the world. But to me, my passion is to make sure like, you know, you build a team because you make sure that the torch bearers whom you hand off your torch to understand how medicine, the practice of medicine or public health is just not facts and figures. It's actually talking to people. Thank you. That's great. So with just a few uh, 30 or so seconds left, if you were to give one, a question I also often ask uh, toward the end of the program, if you were to give one piece of advice to a young person in the Bronx or a non-traditional age person in the Bronx in terms of going to college of, uh, you know, whether they should consider college and how to succeed, what would that be? Thank you. One sentence, believe in yourself, invest in yourself. Education is the best. There's no shortcut. It might seem hard. It's worth it down the road. You're doing it for yourself. So please think of going to school and you will realize how many doors and windows it opens for you. Thank you. That's fantastic. I want to thank Dr. Murthy uh, for joining us today. I want to thank our viewers for tuning in. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. This is Public Health America. See you next time. Take care. and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to the Bronx Buzz. This is Bronx Nets program where we talk to reporters and writers and editors and journalists and all different kinds of people who are putting stuff out in the Bronx. And in our second segment today, we're going to talk to a I, I don't I got I don't even have a long enough list for him. He's a musician. He's a DJ. He's um, a, a, a sports announcer. And uh, you're going to really enjoy meeting him if you haven't already seen him performing around the borough. But to get started. Uh, we're going to one of the most important publications in uh, New York City, and that is The City. And our friend uh, Katie Honan is a reporter over there. Nice to have you with us, Katie. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, Katie wrote some articles, as she knows, caught my eye. And I said, my goodness, let's first talk about um, the budget. Um, it's not yet been uh, ratified and, and approved by the city council, um, but um, Mayor Adams seems to have had some kind of a a handshake with Adrian Adams, the um, uh, city council speaker. So where are we at? What 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 are the highlights um, that you wrote about uh, in the city uh, for Mayor Adams' uh, budget um, proposals? So just the budget is getting voted on Monday evening, probably late, late, late into the night um, that will certify the budget. But what we have, it's important to note that this is one of the earliest budget deals that we've had in recent memory. Um, the handshake was last week, which kind of just loosely defines it. But the biggest issues that I've seen and that my colleagues have seen is cuts to education, the Department of Education. I saw one colleague, uh, Jeff Colton of City and State, estimated it's around a billion less. Um, so that's a real concern for parents, for teachers, for, for students, of course, of, of that cut. 
uh, Mayor Adams has said it's kind of just adjusting to the um, lower federal funds that the city received um, during COVID and then also a decline in enrollment, about 6% fewer students are uh, enrolled in New York City public schools. Um, one other thing to look at is, you know, sort of, it's uh, like we've seen every year, it's the highest budget that we've had, $101 billion or so. Um, the NYPD's budget, as we've seen it, mind you, we haven't seen the official documents yet. We're kind of going off what they say. Um, the NYPD's budget is flat. What, what Mayor Adams- When you say flat, in other words, they just kept it uh, even yeah. from one to the other. Yeah, and those always see adjustments. They have overtime adjustments right. and all that kind of stuff. The one kind of loss for Mayor Adams, he had said earlier in the year that he wanted to hire close to 600 new correction officers. That is not in the budget. There are some, in terms of trash, I know trash and, and, and garbage pickup is a big issue all around the city, and I'm sure in the Bronx. They're restoring pale pickup to what we had during COVID. As you know, during COVID, that summer of 2020, right. a lot of cuts. So those overflowing trash cans you see on the street, those green bins, they're going to doing, they're going to be picking up more of those um, and having more pickup of that. So hopefully it'll, we'll see a, a big change on the city street. Well, one of the things that you have not mentioned, and I've heard from advocates, is the parks budget which um, the, the mayor had said that it would stay at 1%, but uh, we're about half that. Um, personally, I think we really got to build up our parks. People need to be outside. People need to recreate. If you were talking about health, that's as important as putting some kind of uh, funding in there. Um, he was very proud about the fact that uh, they were three weeks early. And look, the, the way things go in this city and in this state and this nation, if you are early with a budget, hats off like like really i mean congratulations for that right i mean that, yeah. that's that's like a big thing yeah i mean there were concerns you know i will say when it comes to parks the mayor when he was a candidate he signed to this one percent pledge that a lot of advocates yeah. asked for he didn't get to it and, and well that, that didn't last five months but that's well, okay. you know, there's the candidate and then there's the yes of official course. and i think i've also seen people especially as it pertains to education they're asking just to delay yeah. it to kind of push it because they're not happy with What's happened? I mean, it's also worth noting, you know, some people don't think the controller told us, controller Brad Lander doesn't think that there's just enough of an investment from the city to try to facilitate the construction of more affordable housing when we're in. I mean, the city's been in an affordable housing crisis for a long time, but when you see median rents skyrocketing around the city, it really shows how important it is right. to build affordable and middle income housing for the 8 million New Yorkers here. Yeah, and, then, and then, you know, the fact that he wanted to have more money going toward correction officers uh, and that was denied. You know, I've said this before privately, and maybe, I don't remember if I mentioned it on the show, but he still has his blue skin. I mean, you know, he still he still sees the world through that prism. Um, maybe it's been altered slightly since he became mayor. So anyway, let's uh, let's not we could go forever parsing it, especially because it's not really you didn't see the documents yet. But the, the other thing I really want to talk to you about, and w which involves um, the mayor, is his whole notion that he says we say yes, we're you know, we're going to be the open city. We want I believe in rezonings. We want to build up the city. Uh, listen, a lot of us want to bring in uh, new people. We have a lot of uh, empty spaces down in, in mid-Manhattan. Uh, there's empty spaces everywhere. Um, but the rezoning, um, is, yes, 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 is problematic for neighborhoods, right? Yeah, and I think the mayor's announcement, which was at uh, an Abney Better New York breakfast, you're with developers and you're with people who are really into this. And his announcement was sort of the time, and we still don't, two weeks later, have many details on it. His, he dubbed us the city of yes, which I'll note, I believe the mayor of New Orleans dubbed their city the city of yes a few years ago. I don't know if there's a, a copyright issue, um, but he wants to facilitate the construction of more stuff. He wants to help push things along to, to transfer commercial office space into residential. Obviously we need that residential housing very badly. He wants to make things easier for businesses who wanna, you know, if you wanna expand, it shouldn't be so bureaucratic. If you wanna, you know, what the mayor's talked about since he was a candidate is removing some of these really punitive, minor fines and restrictions, not things that are life-threatening or, or things that are serious health issues, but things that will make it easier for businesses to kind of... Yeah, know, the, the, the labeling on the awning wasn't appropriate or exactly. something like that. I mean, we're, I've heard that. We've done enough small business shows and things like that. Yeah. But, you know, um, the, the notion of F, when COVID hit, and all those buildings were empty. And now as it's played out and we don't see a lot of companies are saying, you know, 
it never occurred to us, but we could run the thing out of, you know, people can just stay home and we don't have to spend all that money on real estate. Left a lot of properties open. If the need is housing, if he's, if, if Mayor Adams is clever enough to figure out, because these are incredibly complicated and the forces of development are incredibly nuanced, if he can figure out how to do that and turn a Park Avenue tower into a place where people can have homes, all power to him. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, those big towers that have people, foreigners coming in and buying apartments. I'm talking about giving, you know, New Yorkers a chance to live in nice neighborhoods with, with good housing. I, I, you know, Gary votes. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, but, but um, on the other side, you wrote about um, a, um, uh, a city council members who derailed a um, 915 proposed new apartments in Harlem now, you would think that, um, and, and I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't really understand what happened to that project, that specific project. Mm -hmm. But if this council turned it down, uh, you know, this rubber stamping of everything uh, may not go that smoothly. Yeah. So just a little background. It yeah. was a proposal um, to build more than 900 units of housing on 145th Street and Lenox. So you're on a transit, you're, on, you're, you're close to subway. It's, it's a transit rich area. Um, but the council member and the community board were concerned um, with the lack of, from the initial proposal, the few number, it was only a few hundred, uh, it was the, basically the minimum required under the city law, you know, when you're doing your rezoning for residential. When you say minimum required uh, apartments or parking? Or... Uh, apartments, yeah. So apartments. reaching an affordability level, you right. know, the city with mandatory inclusionary housing, you have these complicated, right. you know, Formulas. Right, right, formulas of how many units of housing. Right. Um, the developer, so he didn't have the support of the community board. Even Borough President Mark Levine said he wanted it to be 50% affordable. So the councilwoman, Kristen Richardson Jordan, from the start had said she was opposed to the project. She wanted more affordability. She said it was like a giveaway. Um, and I think the lack of her support, the lack of the support from the community board, he had some support in the community, but I he, I don't think he thought the developer, one of Bruce Teitelbaum, who used to work for uh, former Mayor Giuliani, right. but he, he did not feel he had that full support he needed in the council. It's worth noting some other people reported, you know, he kind of, he didn't meet with, the, with City Hall when he was supposed to. So there were some issues and some missteps there. Um, you know, mem member deference, as we call it, in the city council, for the most part, if your council member does not approve of a project in their district, the rest of the council. Yes, it's not it's not a golden rule because I have examples here in the Bronx that haven't been that way. Um, the most uh, obviously the uh, Croton filtration plant that was yeah. built up in, in the Northwest Bronx because that was roundly opposed by all the local uh, elected officials in that area, but of course got passed anyway. Anyway, I do want to talk to you. You know, we talk about big projects, and if he wants to be the city of yes, let's uh, facilitate getting a uh, Penn Station. Uh, renovated and built. Uh, you wrote about 421 7th Avenue. I read that and thought it was a fascinating uh, dynamic in this whole thing. You know, this is going to hold up Penn Station. Interesting. Mm -hmm. to give us a little background about it. Yeah. So my story took a look at what was interesting to me is looking at this assembly race in that district to re replace Dick Gottfried, who's the longest serving elected official in New York State. He's been in office in the 70s. He's retiring. Uh, and the candidates running, just going through some of the campaign filings, and one of the people running, her name is Layla Logasico. She is a community board member, and she's been long opposed to this project. She's running, and she received significant money from the owner of that building on 7th Avenue, who's a real estate man himself. He does not want to sell the building. He does not want it to be taken through eminent domain. Obviously, nothing set in stone yet. She also received money from the owners of uh, New York Pizza Suprema, a very well-known pizza place across from the garden. Yeah, I know. I, I, I knew you were going to get to that. I thought it was fascinating that a, you know, a classic New York pizza place was going to be in the way of renovating, you know, Penn Station. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, that there was something comical or endearing about that's that I, look as soon as i figured out that you know soon i'll see and as soon as i figured out and i i like new york pizza suprema for manhattan pizza it's pretty good um and knowing how many people love it but look these are people who it's very simple right to me obviously there's more complications but you yes. people who don't if i owned a pizza place for 50 years i wouldn't want to sell it or i wouldn't want to take it away from me either yeah. so to think that they're kind of and, trying to play a role in this and and when happen. you have property on seventh avenue you know, in 34th Street, outside the garden, I mean, you know, all outside Macy's and all that, there's probably not enough money that they could pay you off 
to say, well, you know, let us do this. Like, let's say the Bronx terminal market and they paid the guys a million dollars and let them go. This is, this is big time property. And, and they're saying, Hey, we've been here for 50 years. Uh, we should mention that um, uh, Ms. Law Gasico uh, is running um, to succeed um, Dick Gottfried, who is the longest running um, mm -hmm. assembly member. I didn't realize 52 years. That is a, a heck of a long time. Anyway, these are the stories. You can check them out in the city. Um, let's talk about, um, I love to do this. W what are you working on? What's coming up? What are, what are we going to, what are we going to read about next? Well, you know, we're, we're Unfair question, I agree. No. Uh, oh, no? Okay. no, it's a great question. The city, you know, myself and my colleagues, we, we unveiled this really great tool uh, called Have I Been Redistricted? A few mm. years ago. And with the upcoming yes, yes. races within the congressional races later on in the summer, I would recommend you check it out. See if you're still living in the district you thought you lived in. So we're looking at those races. We're looking yeah. at, obviously, we're always, I'm always paying attention to Mayor Eric Adams. Whatever he's up to, he keeps things very, very interesting. Do you, um, and you know, the way the world is now, um, do you go to City Hall or are you able to do it virtually like so much work is being done? I'm, I was at City Hall this morning. I just came home to do this. <laughs> I oh, mean, thank you that. very much. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, we only got about 30 seconds left. Um, want to compare what it's like covering uh, Mayor Adams versus covering Bill de Blasio? Is, he's on time. That probably would be helpful. It's, there's less waiting around. Honestly. Less waiting that around. Huge when you what, after you covered Mayor de Blasio for how many years? Where he would make you wait 30, 40, 50, an hour, two, three hours. You know, during COVID, we had there were some press press conferences that were delayed by five hours. Oh so. my goodness! And then there's there's your day, there's your work. It's a nightmare. Um, and does he is he open to taking questions and yeah. things like that, or do you feel like he cuts you off? I mean, so many um, big politicians are very skilled at you know saying, "Well, we're not doing that today." You know, he's he's very strict about you can't yell out questions to get called on, which at least it keeps things. Well, that's fair. I mean, uh, yeah. You know. You can do that. All right, listen, Katie Honan, we love you. We need you, and we want you to keep working at the, the city and keep feeding us um, the stuff that helps us really understand our world, not only in the Bronx and in the city. So uh, check out Katie Honan uh, in the city. What is it? It's thecity.org.com. No, thecity.nyc. .nyc, of course. Uh, have a great, great night, and we'll uh, right. see you uh, next time. Uh, we are going to take a short break. When we come back, I got to say, he is a friend of mine, and uh, we're going to uh, meet up with um, Joe Trebuzio, who does everything. We'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. I am thrilled because one of my buddies is here. Uh, his name is Joe Trevisio. I It would um, be curious to me about how many people who watch BronxNet television already know Joe because they've seen him at one event or another. Nice to see you, Joe. Thank you for uh, joining us on the Bronx Buzz. Gary, it's great to see you, whether it's uh, in person or the, you know um, by way of uh, modern technology. That's so, it. Uh, uh, on the basketball court at an event that I'm emceeing. So, um, I, you know, listen, I've got it listed right off his website. He's a musician, he's a singer, he's a DJ, he's an MC, he's a sports announcer. And he's got one other thing which I didn't know about despite how long we know each other, which we're gonna talk about. But just talk to me about your upbringing and how you got oriented to kind of being the showman's showman that you can sing, you can play music, that you love being a DJ and all those things that you do. Well, it all started, um, you know, when I was seven years old, uh, my dad uh, is an original member of a group called Larry Chance and the Earls, and they've had some hits in the 60s. Well, something and, else I didn't know about Joe Trebuzio. Ah, uh, see, I'm, I'm, I'm digging up everything today. Um, and, you know, when I was seven, my dad brought home a set of drums, set them up in the bedroom, and we were able to play a little bit, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and I sort of wanted to get into music. Um, 
in junior high school, my um, my band teacher, a guy named Ronald Lazarus, who was an amazing teacher, um, he gave me a chance. He promoted me to uh, senior band from junior band, and I progressed um, enough to where I wound up winning the band award with a, another buddy of mine at the end of ninth grade. And before my 15th birthday, back when the drinking age was 18, um, I was out uh, playing bars and restaurants. I had facial hair, kept my mouth shut, and nobody asked any questions. And uh, Wow. It was it was a lot of fun. Then you, it just you, you were a, you were a revolutionary. Um, <laughs> where you know, I, I will tell you that the the where I met Joe was literally on the basketball court for many years. He was Lehman College's PA announcer when they opened the Apex, and he was the guy when you'd go to the game and he would play the music. That's the thing that always got me is that you could do the PA because I could never do anything like that. I mean, I've been a, as you know a PA announcer. You you could do the PA for basketball, which is like very active. You know, Tommy Jones gets a bucket and uh, the foul is on the, you know, third foul and so and so. And then Joe would be the guy playing the music in the background going, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I mean, Joe, man, you, you know, he's like he's got the foot pedal going. He's just doing it. Um, and, and my guess is that the reason you can do all that is because you you really love doing this stuff. I mean, that's the pa- that's the Bronx passion that I, I really love and respect. Right. You love doing this stuff. I, I look forward to it. I mean, I get uh, pumped up for a game just like the student athletes do. And um, it was said to me once, and I thought this was, this was such a wonderful thing to, to hear and to be told. Um, a coach that I, that I worked for, he said to me, he said, Joe, when you are at my games, he goes, I can count on my girls scoring at least six to 10 more points per game. Wow. I, I don't do anything that reflects what you see on the scoreboard. But the fact that he said that, and then during the wow. tournament time at CUNY, you know, when we would sit at the CCNY at the scores table and I'm paying attention to what's going on the court, occasionally fans would walk by because, you know, the layout there, the, the seats are so right. close to the scores table. And every once in a while, I would feel a tap on my shoulder. Fans would say hello to me. They would realize that I can't turn around and acknowledge them, but they would say hi. And it was just a very warm feeling. Well, um, I, maybe we should say you're the John Condon of uh, CUNY basketball. You have been the John Condon of CUNY basketball. And so that music ability was with you, was in you for many years. And I never knew it because I knew you as this guy who just was the magician at the at the <laughs> at the local games. And you know, you say you sat at Corsite. I probably was a couple of seats away from you in uh, at a number of those games. Um, and then one day I remember the anthem singer didn't show up. And Joe said, Oh, okay. And he sang the national anthem. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Do you love singing? And and now that's what I really want to get to. So now you have regular gigs at restaurants and other places right yeah when um well when the pandemic hit i mean I've, I've always worked as a musician um you know when i was living in florida i was in florida for five years i was playing six nights a week um you know here there and everywhere um and i love to sing and then i went from being a drummer and a singer to just a front man where i could interact with audiences when the pandemic hit um i i couldn't let go of the music i couldn't just sit by so i started doing a one-man thing i would go to this restaurant uh, out on City Island Avenue, and when the weather was you nice, you can say I, the name of the restaurant. We'll give them um, I actually would would sing in front of the City Island Diner, uh, which okay. and also the um, right the center of town. Yeah, the Snug Lounge. Uh, the owner, her right. name is Sue, and she's a wonderful person. Right. And said, yeah, come on out. So I would set up right outside. People would sit outside, and um, and I would and I would sing. I would go on for hours and hours until I ran out of steam. Um, it you know music is in my blood. It, it you know I've said it before. Music can take a bad day and turn it into a great day. Just the right song can just you know touch that chord within you. And, and I hope people will um, realize and listen. The, the, we we hope every musician makes a, a million dollars. But Joe just loves doing this. I mean, I and now now we see you on Author Avenue and, mm-hmm. and over there at Mario's. I mean, I, I don't know if there are other gigs that you have. Um, I'm uh, I'm sorry. I'm all over the place. I mean, I, yeah, I have Mario's has sort of become a uh, home away from home. I will work with other musicians. I have some public events coming up, uh, you know, in Armonk, New York. Yes, I know it's outside of the Bronx. I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, you know, I have my country club gigs uh, that I've been doing for, you know, 20 plus years. Um, and I, you know, I, I post things on Facebook so people can come and uh, hear me and see me and, and just be a part of uh, the good Great. times through music. Uh, and, and so it's a uh, Metro Metro music, right? What's, what's the website, right? It's Metro music, DJ and the word and live music.com. 
There you go. Metro Music DJ Live Music dot com. Yeah. Now okay. we're going to now we're going to get to something that I did not know uh, after all these years. After sitting next to the guy down the road from him at the basketball games, I didn't know. Um, Joe has a straight job, like a regular job, and he works in schools. And, um, you know, if you ask me, what are the kinds of people we'd like to work in schools? I'd say somebody with passion, somebody with talent, somebody who knows the value of music mm -hmm. and other things. You're perfect. So tell me where you work, what do you do, and why is it um, still something that, you know, is important to you? Well, the late 80s, uh, I was living in Florida, and um, I felt my music career had peaked. I um, Little I, did you know that wasn't true, but that's okay. Well, the reason I say that is because um, back in the late 80s, um, I was with a band that uh, opened up for the Commodores at a um, venue uh, at NAS Cecil Field in Jacksonville, Florida, in front of 25,000 people. Uh, shortly after that, my band was sent to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba to perform for the troops. When I got back from Cuba, I said, you know what? I said, I don't know if I'm going to be a star down here. Let me go home. I went back to New York. Um, I got a job with the DOE, thanks to my mother, who was a lifelong DOE employee. Um, started working for the DOE in 92. I worked special ed for about 26 years. And little by little, um, as I got to know the students, I would sometimes go into classrooms, bring my little keyboard and whatever songs I could play on the keyboard, I would play for the Boy, class. I want you around. I want you around <laughs> my kids, man. That's the, these are the people we got to have with our kids. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's Editorializing. Okay. I have the microphone. I'm going to say what I think. No, that's right. And I, and I realized that even though a student um, and, and the students that I worked with, I mean, they, they were dealt a very unfair hand with regards to their disabilities. Um, but a lot of them didn't let it, hold them down and the music touched them there was a, mm. a young lady um the program that i worked for it was the bronx center for multiple handicapped children on longfellow avenue um they they have long since changed the name but i met a girl her name was felicity and felicity came in at the age at, at what level did this is middle school uh well, high school th this particular district 75 school you oh could district come in, 75 okay yes you could come in at four years and nine months old Right. And stayed at your 21. So right. Felicity came okay, in. Okay. I, I didn't realize that. Okay. Sure. Uh, I met Felicity. She was 10 or 11 years old and she loved music. And she, uh, when she first came in, she was in a wheelchair and little by little, she got better and she was able to walk and then she was able to write and her social skills were amazing. And she would write lyrics and we'd create songs together. Wow. When she graduated at the age of 21, and I'll never forget this. Her graduated high school. This was graduated from the program yes oh from the program yes yeah, the program she had aged out at 21 mm -hmm. um she got i believe an iep diploma right um her mother said to everyone in the auditorium she she said my daughter came in in a wheelchair and is walking out a graduate and that touched us all it touched I me saw her three or four years later i'm i'm at the kmart in bay plaza and all of a sudden i hear mr joe and i turn around and there's Felicity, and she's working at Kmart. Wow. She's working in the jewelry department at Kmart, in the jewelry department. And I felt so good just to see that and see how far she had come. And uh, and a lot of that, you know, music just touches everyone. It touches the students here. Um, some of the students in this building I, that I've worked with. No, um, you say this building, you should say where you are. Yeah, I mean, right now. not in his I'm, living room. I'm speaking to you from the office of New World High School. Um, it's on 228th Street, Bronxwood Avenue. We have four different high schools. Um, I was working on the first floor with another special ed program. I transferred up here because we have a music program that uh, I help run, and I'm grateful to be able to do that. But while on the first floor, uh, some of the students and I, we actually uh, recorded a five-song original CD wow. in a classroom, uh, Room 101, and we named our little project Studio 101. And uh, it was it was a lot well, of fun. Well, wait a minute. So, uh, so when when can I, we have them in here? I'll put them on TV, man. Let's get well, them in here. Let's play a little music. I mean... I realize I things to, are complicated. I'm I'm making a public offer, but if kids are playing music and and they work with you, I, I we you know we could talk about it after the show. But yeah, I'd like I, to I have can look up these students and find them and see if they'd be interested. I mean, they right. they've graduated since since uh, we recorded the CD. Well, that so that fun. could be an interesting uh, story mm -hmm. as well. Um, anyway, Joe, um, do, do you have a favorite task that you do, whether it's sports announcing or DJ or playing your own music? Or working with young people, I mean, or 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 is it just it's all part of like the beautiful mosaic of life of Joe's life, so to speak? It, you know, I can't really. Um, there isn't one particular thing that I enjoy more than the other because everything. I mean, everything has its ups and downs. But what I do, there's many more ups than downs. 
Um, you know, uh, one thing that's that's really wonderful about a sporting event is uh, if I walk into, uh, you know, one of the... We only got a few seconds, so wrap it okay. up quick. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, there's positive energy that is thrown my way through everything that I do, whether it's the students, the sports, the music, singing, whatever it is. I love it all. And I'm just so grateful that I can do it. And I'm going to keep doing it until... And say the name of the website so people can find you. You can find me at Metro Music DJ and Live Music.com, or you can call me directly at 914 224 1700. One of the great people of the Bronx, one of the people I've known for many, many years, uh, Joe Tribuzio. Uh, you know, I'll say keep going. You don't need me to say that. That's what you're going to do. Um, you're still riding your motorcycle? Absolutely. I know Absolutely. you are. Yes. All right. But, but he doesn't do it with his DJ equipment because I've helped him unload it from the truck. That's and there right. were times that I did. And he said, no, don't touch it because I know how this. <laughs> Gary, I want to I thank you so much. Yeah, and, you're, my, you're my buddy forever, Joe. You be well and uh, stay you. safe. And uh, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and joins, uh, that is it for our uh, program this evening. Thanks to Katie Honan from the city who provided some great information. And thanks to Joe Tribuzio for all he does. Get out there on Arthur Avenue or wherever he is and enjoy yourself. Um, yeah, music lights us up. Good night. Communal, it's spiritual, it's intellectual and free. It's Lincoln Center, Dim Lit Jazz Club, Harlem Jam Session, and tonight it is B Side. I am your host, Queen God Is, simply here to warn you that our special guests, Winso and the Shakes, are probably going to leave some of y'all shook with their whirling windstorm of creative energy, kaleidoscope of musical influences, and funky flair for collaborative magic that seduces folks of all faiths and hearing into hearing color, seeing sounds, and catching vibes. Buckle up, Brooklyn, for what's sure to be another live ride on B-Side.
To make me feel this way Maybe it's because of you I'm slipping I am slipping I am slipping I am slipping Yeah, yeah I want to 
Well, this is B-Side. We just heard it's the mood I'm in of, from Winso and the Shakes. And let me set the tone of what is actually helping create this full mood that we are in. On the other side of the glass, we got uh, Mahogany Brown's Black Girl Magic letting out. And on this side of the glass, a so shout out to her. We have a, this side of the glass, we have Winstone and the Shakes creating another kind of magic, um, community magic, collaboration magic, magic jazz magic, um, and beyond. And I just want to say this to you. Normally, when we have artists on the show and it's like more than one, two, three of y'all, um, I try to cheat a little bit and I just have you introduce everybody. But I think I got this. Okay. And, and, ow, and um, if I do justice, I get a front row seat to all of your next concerts in New York. <laughs> That's the rules. Okay, so hoofing, we got Taylor, <laughs> give it up. <laughs> On the drums, killing it, we got Savannah, give it up. Yeah. On the keys in the corner in the back, we got Matisse. Yeah. The horn section, we got Ruben and Julian. Yeah. On the vocals, and also after this show, I might be stealing him from y'all, so say your goodbyes now. We got Buyo from South Africa on the vocals. And last not, but not least, we have the homie, my friend, our new friend, Michael Muenso. So, where's your manager? Put those tickets aside for me, please. Thank you very, very much. Um, let's jump into it. You are an interesting cat. <laughs> I'm going to use as much of my jazz slang as I possibly can oh. today. Uh, you were born in Sierra Leone, and you lived there till about 10 years old. Then you made your way to Europe, uh, specifically London, where you lived for a while. And then you left school, and you kind of hit the road on tour and like working your music magic because that's when you uh, uh, around the time that music really made it clear to you that this is what you needed to be doing so you went to a lot of places and then somehow after all that you ended up in Brooklyn tell us about it <laughs> he's like he's looking at me like I'm, he's like, he's looking at me like I'm a stalker no no no, no it, was, it was the way you did it yes someone saying it like that is very it's very uh it's like okay it's a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> So tell us about it. Um, well, you're very right. Uh, you know, I was born in Freetown, Sierra Leone, and, but my, my mother had met my, my father actually in London before she went to Sierra Leone. They okay. actually met in London. Okay. I, I, London actually was somewhere they had connected there. My father was from Zambia. Mm -hmm. His mother is, is South African, his father is Zambian. So were you conceived in London? I do believe that's what my mother said. <laughs> <laughs> But because, but then my my father's mother was dying, so okay. he had to go back before I was born, Close and up. he went back to Lusaka. And then in that time period, my grandmother reached out to my mom and said, "It's it's, it's not good that you have this child as a lone single mother, mother. So come back to Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. That's where my grandmother was living um, at that time. So it really, to be honest, it's very unusual that I was born in Sierra Leone because really a lot of the family had moved by then and, and were living in Nigeria. That's, that's my, my, my maternal grandfather's Nigerian, okay. and, and a, a lot of Ghanaian relatives. So it was interesting that Sierra Leone was where I was born, but we lived there and moved around too to Nigeria and Ghana mm -hmm. in those years. And then my mother met my stepfather, and when I was about 10, he came to Sierra Leone. And we moved, and she married him, and they moved to London. And that was a very different life. He was a very, uh, uh, very beautiful man. You know, he, had, he was a divorcee, he had children of his own. But you know, wanted to marry my mother and was ready to take, you know, her child too in a certain way. And, and we lived with him for a while. His name was Roger, mm -hmm. and he was a very wonderful man. He didn't live as as long as he should have, and he, okay. he he died, and that was a whole journey. Mm -hmm. of, and then that was really the time of a very deep moment that when music came into my life okay. because you know that was a very different uh, life changes. You know, mm -hmm. your mom going through stuff. You try to understand what your mom's going through and mm -hmm. you're not maybe not being around your mom as much as you'd want to. And then music came into my life at that time. And then in that time too, I, you know, I was very lucky that a lot of the uh, musicians who became so important in my life as, as I grew, I was able to see a lot of them. Yeah. You know, 1997, 98, mm -hmm. you still had the ability to see people like Betty Carter and Elvin Jones and 
course, James Brown, Ray Charles, BB King, Bobby mm -hmm. Bland. Yeah, you people. dropping them all in there real fast, <laughs> real and, fast. And um, it's, it's real, you know. I was, let's I, slow it down just a little bit so that everybody can really let this sink in, um, because it is quite an anomaly in so many different ways, and I want us to be clear about how. Um, so first of all. Um, Blessings to your family and those who've crossed over. And um, we want to honor the fact that those hardships and the lives that they lived, regardless of how long, led you to the, mm. to the things wow. that lead you here. So we want to acknowledge you. that. Yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking to a millennial. This man is born <laughs> in 1984. Some of you are going to go online or look at online, you're going to see footage of him and you're going to think easily it's from 1960s or 70s or maybe 80s, like literally. Um, so in addition to being a vocalist, a musician, a band leader, an MC, a curator, a programmer, and the list goes on, you're a shapeshifter. Because if you didn't know these details about you, the names that he's going to drop throughout the night are people that mostly get name dropped from people who are peers of their generation. You know, uh, James Brown is a name that is going to come up. James Brown was born uh, 1933. 1933, mm -hmm. passed away in 2006, is 73 years old. Um, so when I read that, you played with James Brown. Mm. I, I was like, I tried to do the math. I was like, did James Brown die? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, was, I was like, literally, I had to like Wikipedia the heck out of this situation. So let's skip ahead just a little mm. bit to that moment, and then we're gonna come back to talk about family. Okay. 14, 15, 16 mm -hmm. year old. Mm -hmm. You are a skinny little kid with a big mm -hmm. ass baggy suit and a oh, bow tie. Yeah. <laughs> you have seen, you have seen it. I've seen it. <laughs> it's really incredible black and white footage. I don't know if that was an after effect or the if that was literally. It, I put it on that thing when oh. it goes gray. Oh, okay. You know, and I, I was I, like, cause wait a it's minute. It's the worst thing ever happened to it me. It does, man. it's an awful video. Like the quality is awful, but I it's so I wish it was so color, authentic. it was me, I switched you it. You know what, you were trying to play with people's minds. I okay, know. so I'm watching this video of him on YouTube on stage with James Brown. Most people get their 15 minutes of fame. Kids are lucky because they're cute and so somebody like James Brown might be like, I don't mind putting this little one on stage because he's cute. We're going to get some extra hooting and hollering from the ladies, whatever, whatever. This kid did not get 15 minutes. He got like a residency run. <laughs> <laughs> and then like there were moments where you're passing the, the mic and the stage back to James Brown and then you go back out again and I'm like, how is this possible from the James Brown that we know mm. whose band members will easily That's get right. kicked out if they hit the wrong <laughs> no or don't show up on time you literally had quite a bit of time amongst these people who most people only get to speak to read about or learn about in textbooks mm -hmm. and so we go from these hardship moments mm -hmm. to you being a teenager and okay so now we're circling back to family let's talk about your mom mm. Your mom made a decision that she wanted you to be around the environment where you could learn firsthand. So your education as a teenager was being in these clubs and in these venues where you got to see great musicians of all time. None will be created like them ever again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. up close and personal. That's true. Let's talk about your mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because uh, some, uh, Michaela and Vuyo and some of them met her for the first time this last year we went to London we did a, a play about Fats Waller and and Jono has to our manager uh, she she's she, really a lot of it is her you know her spirit her frustrations you know she was a frustrated artist she left what kind of artist um, an actress she left uh, Nigeria in the late 1970s to come to Raja the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London to study okay. and you know she was there she got a scholarship you know after about a year or two life changes Things happened, she couldn't stay, she had to do day jobs. So a lot of it, but from a young child, me, she would always drag me to when she's doing community plays and, and she, she would get parts and she would cuss out the directors and then, <laughs> and then, then she would get fired and then, and then they would beg her to come back because she's so good. And you know, and this is how she kind of had an outlet. And I would go a lot to these community plays that she would do, you know, where she would, she would do all kind of different uh, parts. So she, really a lot of the, you know, strength comes from her. Mm -hmm seeing all the things she went through, mm -hmm. you know. A lot of the power and, and, and the conviction of, of, of belief comes from seeing her and seeing her struggles. And, and the permission. Yes. She gave you a green light did. at an age that most parents would not. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so let's, we're gonna like let that sing in. We're gonna go into some more music. Yeah, yeah. I wanna know what she's, what she's doing. Yeah. She's inspired with something. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. I do my job. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna see, leave it there for a second. Let's okay. go into another song real quick, yes. just so that they can have more to sink their yes. teeth and their ears into. Okay. Um, but like, shout out to your mom. Um, yeah. And on a quick note, this Cassandra this, is song. Yeah, there life. you go. And your last song. This story begins with family, and it continues with family in a way that a lot of music musical groups don't necessarily continue in the consciousness of family. We're gonna go into the next song with Winslow and the Shakes, and this song is called "You Can Do No Wrong." This is by Judy Garland. If you ever seen the film The Pirate with Gene Kelly. Something very beautiful she sings in it. This is called You Can Do No Wrong. Uh -huh.
I'm just gonna start out showing off. <laughs> um, in a lot of traditions, there's a lot of taboo about women um, drumming, but I just want you to see what happens when women hold down the rhythm section. <laughs> Savannah and Michaela, I said I was taking Vuyo, and now I have to add these two. By the time the show is over, you will have no more band. Um, family, so we ended up talking about your mom. We want to shout out to Cassandra. Um, Family continues with this con this way in which you started to um, think about creating your music, and it very quickly kind of spiraled into not just bands, but a family of art musicians that are uh, a big part of your voice, your work, your progression, your progress, your process. And coincidentally, you happen to call everybody in the band or some version of Pops. <laughs> so we start with your mama, mm. and then we, we you, you're, the idea of father is yes. not leave. Yes. Everybody Searching gets called for pops. The father. So, yeah. right. <laughs> so I think that you know that's still a nod to sometimes what's absent is also very present. Mm. Yeah. 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 Ow. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> why call everybody pops, and then talk to us about how you think about band as an extension of family? Well, uh, first, you know in in all of the, the original cultures, of course, the African culture, we, every, anyone that's older than you, you just call them Baba, mm -hmm. or you call them Father. Um, but also, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a, a term of endearment to also just see even your, your fellow person as your father. Mm -hmm. You are brother, you are father to me, you are, you know. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, 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 it's definitely something that uh, started off as you know, something, you know, you would, I would say to someone, with, that's how I feel about it, and there's a love there, you know, and it could be even people younger than you, but it has definitely become something of, of it's a love, it's, it's a respect, and not everyone is a pops. <laughs> right. Some people don't, some people There's a lot of no. not, not pops. No, <laughs> no, not everyone deserves it. Yeah. No. Whether they have children or not. Um, mm. Mm. So, mm. yeah, <laughs> he did it. I didn't say it first. He did. Um, but we, the, the moral of the story is we want to acknowledge the, um, the spirit of fatherhood and how oh, it transcends yes. roles and yeah. um, even lifetimes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah. shout out yeah. to all of y'all pops in the crew. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the shakes. Um, how, so the Shakes is a rotating cast of musicians, um, usually three to five players, but on any given um, show, maybe like similar to other bands, you may see somebody different. Mm. Um, talk to us really quickly about the name The Shakes. Mm. Um, how did that come about? And tell us your relationship with these people who mm. are here with you today. Well, uh, you know, The, the Shakes has, has become something of, of a community, of a family. Mm. Uh, a musical family, a spiritual family, an artistic family, and the word really came out of the being of, of whatever is your thing that you like to do. You, we would say things like, uh, uh, what's shaking? Or what, yeah. what is the shake? Or what, what's, what's going down? It could mean anything. Okay. It's how you phrase it. It's also okay. the rhythm of it. Okay. It could be anything. That's the beauty of the word. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we just it's something we use. It's like we said pops. Yeah. But it also is then it became even more than that. And so we just said we title ourselves the Shakes because we do a lot of different things. Okay. And you can't put you can't define it in a certain Which way. Which is too. A, a great it's way. It's a lot of different things. And we're gonna come back to this question of a lot of different things as we attempt to try to genreify you for those who need That's those exactly classifications. Why I'm That's I know, why I got it. I got you. We here. We here. Um, <laughs> so real quick as I make a and then again we wanna go back to you speaking really quickly individually. About everybody. Yeah. 
Um, okay. So when you're at the Grammys or some other musical uh, event and the Alabama Shakes are there, do y'all like have to bust out in a rap, <laughs> a rap battle to keep the name? Who keeps the name? Is there beef around it? No, I don't. It, no, no. Okay, good. That's good to know. I was just checking. No, I know what you're saying. Just checking. Though. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's tell it. Tell us really quickly how you met them, how often they play with you, what it, the relationship is like. It, it's what you say. It, it has become. There's there's veteran shakes too. There's okay. people that have been there, and we when we, we call them we call them we call them when, when we when we need them. But there's people that you know they don't play with us all the time. There's even one in the audience right Shout now. Shout them out real quick. His name is Alfonso Horn. <laughs> yeah. He's, yeah. He don't really play with us a lot, but he's an honorary shake, yeah. so he can yeah. come anytime. But veteran shake. You know we we have many different people. We have we have five piano players, six different drummers. We're very lucky now that Savannah is coming to our midst. Uh -huh. Because uh, because she has she has every person because can she's dope yes. obviously no well yeah. that's not also it because every person that comes in individualizes the music in their own way okay so she has now made the song sound different and okay. she brings her own spiritual power so we also have a female percussionist Nega who's normally here and she brings a whole other vibe okay but it really has evolved and uh, Savannah was coming to Miss recently and has brought such amazing beauty yes. and love to the to what we're trying to do. Michaela is is many roles. She she's a sister. She's a mother. She's, you know, she's she's a comforter. She's a friend. She allows us to, to make mistakes, and to also tell us about our mistakes so that we can do better. And she teaches us. You know, I always I said to her the other day. I said to her that I wish every man could live with a woman. As a friend, before you go and try and be with a woman, okay. Because you, every man needs to do it. I'm not talking about the mother. I'm talking about the one after that. Mm -hmm. She teaches us a lot, mm -hmm. so that's what she. Thank is. you, Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> Who else we got on this side? Then, then we have Matisse. Matisse has been around us for, for many different years, and and now has be, has become such a vocal point of what it has become, and and uh, he's a Gemini. <laughs> and is, doing is that why we have two people? Yeah. 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 But also too, he's amazing because sometimes we've had to. One time we were going to go to Ukraine and bass player didn't sort out the visa. Or something happened, so we had to go to Ukraine about no bass. So from then on, mm -hmm. in there, Matisse has been fulfilling the role with such strength. This is very hard. He's playing the bass and the harmony, everything okay. like that. So give Matisse Picard yeah. a round of applause. <laughs> Ruben, you're talking about family, community. Ruben was someone when I was in London that I was fortunate to be around. When he was growing up, when he was 16, 17 years old, he would come to Ronnie Scott's and they, they would do exactly what I was doing 10 years before, you know, and, and coming to the gigs and coming to the jam sessions. And now he lives in New York, so mm -hmm. he's very special. Okay, so, thank you. Ruben Fox. Yeah. <laughs> and then this gentleman, Julian Lee, he. We had been hearing about him for so long before he was in the shakes, but he actually has probably been one of the longest. He was star. He, st he started being in the family. He's like 17, 18, so he's seen a lot of different things. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, okay. but you know, but he comes from a very long line of, of musicians. His mother's a great musician. His father's a great musician. All of the children, all of his siblings, are great musicians, and uh, we have a lot of love for him. Julian Lee. Yeah. And Vuyo came into our lives. We don't know how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> but we know why it's going to continue mean, to know, happen. We don't know how it happened. It just happened. It, this is the one that, you know. Uh, Wait, where did you meet exactly? That's what I'm about to say. Right, okay. Because for a lot of us, you know, uh, Jazz and Lincoln Center was a place where we, a lot of us met. Definitely. And a lot where a lot of this started <laughs> to evolve through a lot of the stuff I was doing there. Yeah. And Vuyo worked there, too. Okay. Um, and would be in the office with me, and I, you know, but I'd heard about Vuyo a year or two before that, oh, okay. from people who had been in the competition with him, and, and he beat, and he beat them, and he won, done, and he won, <laughs> and and I'd heard about him, but when he came to the office, I I I, I recognized him, and I said, this is the this is the person I'd been hearing about, mm -hmm. so it's by magic he's here, Good. Vuyo. And Vuyo's from South Africa. Yes. Yeah. And I was imagining that y'all met somewhere in Africa. Ah! I totally made that up. Um, so shout out to the veteran shakes, the current shakes, the Harlem shakes, and everybody shaking it all over the world. Um, we are going to go into uh, 
the next song, but before we do, I just want to tease you a little bit. When I first saw a video of you, I was like, where do you get this British accent from? Because, you know, a lot of people, when they start to come into their own musically or they become famous, they magically get a British accent somehow, <laughs> as if it's a, a marker of, of that ascent to, 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 to fame. But yours is real. Okay. <laughs> we'll let you keep it. We're going to come back after this song and talk about your time in Europe. <laughs> How did, what is the difference between being in Africa and Europe and here in the States in terms of the impact of each of these places on your process mm -hmm. and on your community building? Give it up for Winsell and the Shakes. Look at them, look at them. Look at them, look at them. Look at them, look at them.
lost the whole band. <laughs> <laughs> They're all officially coming with me. This is Moinso and the Shakes. That song was called Know the God. We want to talk about what this song is about, but before we do, I just need to do a, a pulse check and an age check. Can everybody in the front row just do a Millie Rock for me really quickly? <laughs> <laughs> I just need to see that you can do it. Like, Which yeah, one? Yeah, because I think y'all are lying about uh, being millennials. Ah! <laughs> They lied, I caught really? them. <laughs> I caught them. It's over, the charade is over. I really feel like you're like of the ilk of uh, Who are you from, talking to, who are me? I'm talking to all of y'all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're from the ilk of like Pharrell. Like Pharrell is like a thousand years old looking who, like me? Pharrell looking like no, he's no. Good. <laughs> <laughs> You really are like an 80 year old man in there. Oh, um, wow. Pretending to be 33? 33. 33. Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> question? What is Know the God about? And I think that's a great, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that song and the process, but I think that's a great segue after that to go into your transition from yeah. Africa to Europe to the States. There's so many transitions in this song, mm -hmm. and they are precise, mm -hmm. but they are also fluid, and mm -hmm. I think that that might be an interesting metaphor for what it seems like your journey is. So go for it. What is Know the God about? Know the God is, is really is, is a conscious song. It's, it's, a, it's a prayer song. It, 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 it adds sections, and it's supposed to be a section of your own search. As you start off, it's there to be first. The first setting that you have is know the God in you, trust the God in you, believe the God in you. And it came out of me saying these things to myself, mm -hmm. trying to get more strength, trying to believe myself, trying to understand the ability of to be able to. You create your own energy. You know, you create. If you want things, you can make them happen. You know, you mm -hmm. have to believe, you have to have faith, of course, you have to work hard, but, you know, there is an ability of power that you can use to make things happen, and I was telling myself these things, but I also was going through a lot of, uh, you know, uh, like this kind of feeling, look at the people watching, you know, I was going for a little bit of that, I was trying to get strength to be able to, you know, be can cool. Can you clarify that? Do you mean being a public I face? Was not, I, was, I, was, I was feeling like I, I didn't want to be seen. Really? I didn't want to be seen because I felt like if I went outside, people would say, look at it, look at it. That's what I was dealing with. When? Right. At what point in your life? Uh, this was maybe like two years ago. Really? You know, there was a transition, and that was what was going on. But then there also was an another part. These are, these are almost like emotions I was going through, and I tried to put them in the song in a certain way as how it evolved yeah. from knowing the God, the God in you and then, you know, going through your own insecurities and then also believing who you are. Mm -hmm. We didn't do the next part. There's another part of the song, which, which okay. all has different parts. The next part is, is an uplift that tells you that you should be strong and you should take your time, but you should also be aware that you are somebody that is worth something. And, and, and you should also let your soul be at peace. For people who need that part of the song, mm. where could they find that oh. part of the song? <laughs> <laughs> you can go find it. We on YouTube. You YouTube. can find it there. Know the know God, the God, God about on seven YouTube. different versions of it. Okay. <laughs> it's there. It's there. Are you on SoundCloud or is that after your time? No, we on are we on SoundCloud, Jonah. Like SoundCloud. Does, does this group exist on digital media at all, uh. or is it only on analog? Yes. <laughs> you got to go to the website. MichaelWinso.com. He yes. don't know. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's what it is. No, I forget because I don't know if it's Mwenzo in the shakes. He don't log in. That's why. Mwenzo.com. Mwenzo.com. Yes. Okay. 
right. <laughs> <laughs> he's also on Instagram, but I can guarantee you Instagram, no, I know Instagram. I'm always on the Instagram. You're not logging into the gram. No, I'm on the Instagram. I'm on the Instagram. I'm on the Instagram. I'm going to check. I'm doing it. Okay, so so the song is about a self-actualization, self-realization. Yes, self-realization. Yes, and then it has all of these transitions into it, which are reflective of your journey with that process. Let's talk about the transitions from where you were born to where you were raised to where you live now. I'm going to call out the name of each of these places again, and I just want you to give us one word or one brief phrase of how each of these places impacted your musical, creative, and spiritual journey. All right, Sierra Leone, Africa. Survival. London, UK. Education. Mm-hmm. Survival, education. Being on tour, so the many places that you, what has that offered you? E- everything. Uh, to, be, to be more understanding of the world. Mm-hmm. Understanding. Yeah. Survival, understanding. education, yeah. understanding. The United States of America. Life. Life. Mm-hmm. All of it, all of that, ex- all of that stuff before is all now, of that is, stuff. is in, is in, <laughs> in that, this in, one now. Uh-huh, in this one. Mm-hmm. And last but not least, Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> now. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh-oh. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we need more light on the audience sometimes. Hey! Y'all are so funny. <laughs> Y'all are so funny. I don't know if the people at home can hear how that sounds in stereo. <laughs> So we got survival, we got education, we got uh, understanding. Lo- understanding. That's all the you need. We got life, mm. and all we got you now. Need. Uh. Yeah. You need to be in the now. You need to know how to survive. You need education. Mm. What's the next one? Understanding. And you need understanding. Okay. Mm. Let's go to under. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to education. Mm. Um, you left school, the school system, at 16 yeah. years old, and your parent, your mom, allowed this. Yeah, she was very cool. She my was mom was telling cool. me from when I was 12, it's going to be all right. She said, exams are rubbish because I know you're going to be exams on stage. Exams are rubbish. <laughs> no, but she, she was already very like, No, I, I just want to make, I wanted know. to repeat it so everybody could hashtag that and give yeah. your mom credit. Exams are rubbish. <laughs> she, um, she was behind it. <laughs> so, amazing. And a lot of parents at home are like, absolutely not. But um, but, but I must I, it's, I, I must also say somebody else who was very important in, in, in being a father role. You know, okay. when I was that age, he was my godfather. And his name? And his name was Thomas Blofeld. Was he a musician? He was. He was just crazy. Okay. He was. He was a. He was a Norfolk Kingsland old English man who was who was an English math teacher who was retired. Who was no. my mom's first landlord when she came to London in the seventies, and then fifteen years later, he became the person that basically kind of adopted me. My mom mm. was deported. And he she was deported. Yes. From yeah, we Whoa. can't do it all. Now. Okay, we can't do it. <laughs> Look, I'm trying though. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a period of her, you know, not being in, in, in England, and he looked after me. And he was the Aww. person that really opened my eyes to Afro American wow. music. Okay. And was he? He was. He was white. Um, yes. Okay. And mm-hmm. the social services did not like that. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah. there's a movie about this that's about to happen. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> the storyline sounds very movieable. Um, so. Education, you learned a lot from these people who kind of adopted you and from these musicians that your mom put you in, these mm-hmm. nightclubs that you were allowed to be a part of, even though leaving school. Uh, what would you say was your greatest source source of education from that moment? And like, if you could be specific, um, and then what message do you have to parents of young artists mm-hmm. who are trying to help them mm-hmm. navigate where they need to be mm-hmm. in their journey? You will. You, well, first of all, you, the, the greatest education is being around older people. Mm-hmm. That is the greatest education. And you respected that right away, or was that something you had to learn was, to grow was, to respect? I wanted it. You did. I wanted to be around people that were, were born before I was born, and I wanted to know what they knew, and I wanted to know how did they know it, and how come they were this cool, and how come they, w- they, they were like this, and why come those people when they were born in the 1930s were more soulful than people like now, and mm-hmm. what's going on, and why are the people like mm-hmm. this? Or why is a jazz musician like sh- like this? Or why they got this unique vibe? And why is people from the South like this? Why is James Brown got this kind of vibe like this? Mm-hmm. For people in the North, you know, who were born in the same period, yeah. who like jazz, maybe didn't like. I was so you were learning history, I was, geography. Yes. Uh, I was I was scoping it all out yeah. at that age. I wanted to know why do people like this, and why 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 is a, a musician like BB King? How come he got into the blues, but he was born the same time as like Miles Davis? I don't understand. 
and I, then I wanted to know why. Okay. You know. Well, this question why is kind of where we're going to have to leave it because yes. we are under some time constraints. But he did give me an invitation to sit in all the rest of your <laughs> shows for free. Yeah. And the rest of y'all, you can go online and figure out where you get your tickets. Um, <laughs> the question is why and how, and we want to thank those who've existed in your realm and in ours that help us fill in these gaps and these answers to these questions, um, particularly James Brown, which we do want to talk more about. Uh, one word, really quickly, or one sentence. If James Brown, who had you on stage 14, 15, 16 years old, way back in the day, was to look at you now and all the things mm -hmm. that you've accomplished since, what would, you, what would he say? <laughs> if you could translate it in a way that we would understand. Because no, it'd probably be like, Sada, da, you know, it would probably be something like that. But what <laughs> You're doing all right, son. You're doing all right. <laughs> he didn't say something like that. He's he doing won't all give right, you son. the whole props. He wouldn't give you the no, whole props. No, he said, you're doing all right, but son. You, you got some do. other stuff you got to sort out, though. Yeah. <laughs> Good. All right, well, we're going to go into this um, tap dance feature, uh -uh. and that'll buy you some time to sort it out. We got, uh, <laughs> we, we got Michaela hoofing. <laughs> Michaela, you know, do what you do. Give him a tie. It seems like he might need a couple extra minutes to sort uh -huh. it out. Um, <laughs> And then we're going to talk about with you how this became such an integral part of this oh, collaboration okay. process. So then All right. you do Give it up for okay. Winsaw and the Shakes featuring Michaela on the Huffins. Did you stay here? What did you get? If these feet could talk, what were they saying, real quick? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that's what I thought. Um, we want to give a quick RIP to Kira Pesci, Gosi Sile, and Huma Sekela. Um, I think it's very fitting for this very, show to acknowledge them. Um, 
you you said really quickly, and we're gonna leave on this note. You've been you're not only you're many titles, and you do many times of music, but you've also been a programmer and a curator, inviting other artists to the table to be a part of the scene to celebrate their work, to ask them questions. And you said that a lot of people take from jazz, but mm. you wanted to create a movement that was giving back to jazz. In one word, what is it that you think that Winslow and the Shakes is offering back to the jazz legacy? I think we're trying to uh, present an offering, uh, a mm -hmm. spiritual offering of all of everything that they contribute yeah. to the world mm -hmm. and, and almost in a sense like a a tip your hat mm -hmm. for all of the blessings they gave us through all of the creations that they, they mm -hmm. have. And I think it's, we've just found another way of offering to them praise mm -hmm. and thanks. Mm -hmm. Really, that's really what we're trying to do with the music, is just thank them. Amen. You know. So for all of the traditions that come out of the jazz tradition, they do show up in your work, which is why it's hard to peg you down as one particular thing. But by exploring those works, you're offering that back to the jazz legacy. I think that's beautiful. Um, and finally, if I follow you on Instagram, you're going to follow back. Cool. <laughs> that said, <laughs> we'll see. I don't think he knows how to work any computers. I really don't. I really think that, that you are a I'm record black bad. and white I'm analog good. dude. Okay, we'll see. I know how to do Go it. Go online, do your homework, Can follow you? Winslow <laughs> and the Shakes, look out for their albums, catch them live Woo. somewhere. Y'all are phenomenal. Give them up. We'll a round of applause one more time. <laughs> Michaela, Savannah, Buyo, Matisse, Ruben, Julian, and Michael, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I got my tickets on lock. Uh -huh. Divinely devoted to the edification of joy, jam sessions, and of course, jazz. Listen, I want to say thank you so much to the multifaceted Winso and the Shakes for bringing the spirit of youth and the thoughtfulness of old souls to a forum that has influenced so many lives all over the globe. Thank you all. We look forward to staying within earshot of the enchantment that you are sure to continue to conjure through the craft, and we wish you all the very, very, very best. If you're feeling blessed and you want more, B-side that is, you can check out past episodes on YouTube.com slash BrickTV and our podcast at SoundCloud.com slash B-side podcast, or just come on by the studio to feel the magic up close. I am your host, Queen God is, hey. wishing you a prosperous 2018. Eight. May the music uplift and your light stay lit. We love you. We love you, Brooklyn. Until next time. <laughs> Thank you. This is about having no regrets.
In the olden days, Brooklyn was booming with industry and the future was full of promise and hustle and bustle. Here we go. In 1903, the famous coal man, Jay Murphy said, I've had enough with trains. Trains suck. And war, war sucks even more. I wanna do something exciting. I wanna invest in a bar that makes breakfast 24 seven. This man would become the owner of Downstream Bar in Brooklyn, which would be the equivalent of any large chain without the big blue cocktails or other locations. People had breakfast for dinner, breakfast for lunch, and of course, breakfast for breakfast. Mm. And it was passed down generation to generation from father to daughter and daughter to son and son to daughter until me. Wow, I was cute. My mom and dad got divorced in 1993, so I spent the summers working in dad's restaurant. I wasn't good at it, but honestly, no one cares when your dad owns the bar. After college, I got my best friend Miri a job at Downstream. She lived in the neighborhood her entire life, so when she started managing, she just had to walk from next door. And she got to meet my friends, Jorge, Omar, OG, and Chris. We're a family to each other and a family to the community. Downstream has been a fixture in the neighborhood forever. Which is why you should come to Downstream and buy a ton of food. We're located on the corner of Caton and Ocean, which is where you will also... Whoops. That was as far as I got. It's pretty good, right? <laughs> well, Mr. Galloway, thank you for stopping by so unexpectedly. You asked me to come here. 
well, whatever. <laughs> We're so, so happy to have you. This menu is too big for a bar. It's bigger than the textbooks I had in law school. Well, we're always hoping to give you more options because in so many cases, you have so few. Hmm. God, we all look exactly alike. Like, will I still have a personality if I date you or? It's occupied for Christ's sake. Jesus. <laughs> oh, Mr. Galloway, we so appreciate the support that you've given us all over the years. <laughs> Your father was like family to me. Oh, he was like family to me too, until he ghosted me two months ago and is never coming back to life. It's like, Dad, I miss you so much. And I also need some money. <laughs> Mr. Galloway, um, I could beat around the bush all day, but uh, I need $20,000 by the end of the week which sounds like a lot, because it is. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon and welcome to Downstream. <gasps> Mr. Galloway, our favorite silent partner. Oh, wow, what's that? Is it a very special cocktail for our guest? <laughs> for you, Jean, for you. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, oh, no, Chris, I'll, I'll have an iced tea. No drink? That's a first. <laughs> <laughs> He's joking, I'm not a drinker. Um, Chris is one of those funny gays. <laughs> I'm not gay. Hmm? Just kidding, huge homo. Hey, amigo. Si, sí, que paso? Eh, estoy buscando trabajo de lavar platos, tal vez, aquí? Escucha, amigo. Usted no quiere trabajar aquí, ¿entiende? Ahora, vamos, váyase, váyase. Vaya, vaya, ándele. Loco, qué bárbaro. Here are the lunch menus. Thanks. I've been waiting for these. Everyone has. Sorry I took so long. I was having trouble rearranging the food we usually sell in the specials. Well, I mean, you didn't go to college for that, right? Minor. It was my minor. Is the restaurant gonna close? I don't know. B but like today? Do I need to flirt with someone right now? Me. <laughs> oh, I do not need this right now. Three dates already canceled on this week. It's like, okay, universe, mom's not gonna get her hair back anytime soon. I just need a boyfriend before you go. Dude, I'm so sorry. I mean, my mom is still so healthy and strong. She seemed younger than me sometimes, honestly. Thanks for that, Omar. Great. Shut up. Let me check it out. What do you think of this guy? Oh, he looks exactly like you. God damn it! Hi, Jean. Here. <laughs> you look so well. Oh, you look amazing. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> uh, congrats on your new life. Divorce is so hard. You can't always choose the people you love. I'll bet if you'd known better, you would have chosen a non-smoker for your freshman year roommate. <laughs> of course not. I'm so happy with the way my life turned out. <laughs> She'd still choose me. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm, I gotta go. Yeah, I'll go too. Hmm? Uh, 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 I know you don't want to hear this. Don't say it. Just get him to give you $1,000 to close easily. Shut out the electricity, get everything in order so you can do your W-2s. Fuck off, I'm not closing. Okay, I guess I'll do the W-2s. Why do you say stuff like that to me? I feel like you don't even like me. I can't not give you good advice. I'm just trying to help you. Don't follow me. Everybody freeze. Put your hands in the air. This is a stick up. OG, come on. You have customers out there. I'm sorry, but I have to book this thing. I haven't worked in a year. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. What? You're probably gonna need a new job soon. Listen, I don't have good advice in general, but when all is lost, I just get mad. When everything seems to be over, just start screaming. That's how I booked that tampon commercial.
This ends in chaos. Chaos! Oh, thank God. Thank you. Thank you. You're not gonna regret this. M Mr. Galloway, I don't want to be rude, but this is very insulting. It's not even manicure, pedicure, and tip. Ella está haciendo estilos que no debería. Me lo dices a mí. Ah. Hi, how's it going? Everyone happy? All about ready to order? I respectfully decline your pity gesture. I'm not going to take that back. I don't need a manicure or pedicure either. I don't want to beg, but I need this money, okay? I took over this restaurant two months ago, and yeah, I could use some help, but, but, but I'll do better. I won't drink any of the inventory. If I could, I would. Uh, Monica, I think Omar really needs to talk to you right now. Just, just tell him, uh, just tell him to hang on for a second. Uh, I think you should take a moment away from this situation. Monica, I have an urgent question about uh, drink specials. I'll have the fat farmer breakfast. No, Chris, <laughs> he does not get to order. But I'm very hungry. I lost my wife. Oh my God, I'm single too. Oh my God, Chris, he got divorced. She's not even dead. Still single. Monica, the customer is always right. Si, sí, Monica. El cliente siempre tiene la razón. Yeah, the customer is always right. My father would be so disappointed in you. Yeah, that makes two of us. Don't be a jerk! Just think about what my family means to you and, and cut me a break. Show me half the money in a week and I'll give you the rest. Come on. There's no way I can do that. I didn't think it was possible for you either. Jorgito? Sí. ¿Será que los compañeros de trabajo se mantienen en contacto después de que un trabajo termina? No. Si son muy amigos, se dan cumplidos en LinkedIn. Pero eso es todo. This place used to be really something. Mm. I got hit on by celebrities. Famous people. I was muy caliente. <laughs> oh, my friend. You're almost fluent. Oh, mucho gusto. <laughs> Por nada. Yeah, I was. <sighs> this place was so great. Yeah. I made out with Marsha Parks outside for the first time. She knocked out my earring and she said I was bi because I was wearing an earring in the first place. Girls are dumb. Earrings are cool. Earrings are cool. Masha Parks was a fool. I want a skinny dip in her pool and take a dump in it. Bad night, right? Okay, night. You always do such a good job. Oh, Monica. You keep it. Good night. Who keeps putting these things up? I don't know. Maybe it's team. Oh, no one is getting elected by knowing the shit out of civilians. <sighs> Remember when I dated Todd Leftweather? Mm -hmm. Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. Fuck him. Bad dick and worst conversation. But I wanted to stay with him so much and blah, blah, blah. I kept pulling away. That guy was such a fucking bonehead. Uh, total, total bozo. Ugh, the worst. 
And remember when I was so heartbroken when he finally broke up with me and you were like, why, 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 he sucks, fuck him. But it wasn't sad because it sucked. It was sad because I knew it was gonna happen. Sometimes things end, Monica. They just end. the ghosts of your long deceased ancestors. But you look so much like my current employees. That's because in dream states you can't make anything up. You just recycle what you already have. It's Wizard of Oz style. I'm Jay Murphy. My great 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 grandfather and the originator of Downstream. Yes, it is us. <laughs> Sorry, I'm allergic to fog. Oh, ancestors from long before this. A, uh, I'm so sorry that I didn't Google your pictures before now. And B, I have a huge problem. You need to save our restaurants, our heritage, our family. I don't know what to do. I can't let you down. Monica, you must depend on the power of community. In 1946, there was a sewage issue and many of our neighbors line up one by one with buckets to take the sewage out. Ew. But GGG grandfather, it's not like that anymore. Like, nobody cares about community. Everybody just cares about followers. Enough excuses. I told you what you need to do. That wasn't a real answer! <laughs> great, 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 great granddad. Pobre muchacho. Huh? Debes estar muy estresada. Oh, Dios mío. Ay. Hola, gatos y gatitos. Hoy será el día más caluroso del año en Brooklyn con temperaturas de más de 100 grados. Shazam! Gatos, sigue así. A convenience store is having a field day as the community rallies around it after a tragic robbery. I thought we were for sure going to close, and the community really came to use. We made 15000 overnight. I'm going to cry. I, I mean, I... 15000 Yo, put your hands in the air. This is a stick-up.
Monica? Monica, come on. Monica, honey, we have to leave. Where you go, I go. See you next summer. See you, Monica. Get one. Buy one, get one. Buy one, get one. Buy one, get one. Hey. So I notice you're in food delivery? Yeah, uh, I bike up and down BK like 20 times a day. You know, not to brag or anything. <laughs> That's so cool. Do people ever like try to special request you because you're so good looking and then you scoot up in your bike and hand them the food and your eyes meet and you fall in love over Pad Thai? No. I just do what the app tells me. Oh. Oh. Ugh. Yeah. You all right there, bro? Yeah, just like my mom's veins are getting so thin that they're getting harder and harder to find, so it's hard to give her shots. <laughs> so the nurses keep having to squeeze her tiny little wrist to make one pop up. Oh my god. Uh, nice spike, though. Really, really hot. Mom, just tell Donovan to go fuck right off. We can't all be geniuses, and you already had me, so. Buy one, get one. Okay, so I have an idea, but you have to promise not to laugh. I don't foresee myself ever laughing again in this lifetime. Buy one, get one! Hey, you hear that? Buy one, get one! So, um, as you know, the restaurant has fallen on hard times. Oh yeah, really? Yeah. But I, like all great leaders, have thought outside the box and consulted with various folks on how best to handle it. Hey, that, that's a sexy fanny pack. Fuck off. Mom, just tell Donovan I love you, but I will rip the skin out of your body if you ever do that again. Just because you live 30 minutes away from us doesn't mean that you still have to do his laundry. Monica, you can't let us down. We need to fake a hold up. What? I'm serious. Buy one, get one? Wait, are you crazy? We could all get arrested, that's illegal. Okay, I know it sounds a little wild, but like, just hear me out. Well, if one of us play a robber on a Monday afternoon, like how many guests have we had on Monday afternoons in the past couple years? Since 2017, we've had seven guests on Monday afternoons. Great memory. I used to do AP physics. I've ruined my life. Designated robber will walk in. I'll be behind the cash register. You can't use that thing. Okay, you'll be behind the cash register. And designated robber says, blah, 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 I'm feeling low and I need some cash. No solicitation. Lompot, choritrohin, fokir kichujayana. Okay, so, so with this flyer, you buy a cocktail and you get one for free. Say it again in Spanish. I don't think you'll understand it. Sometimes things are better when you don't fully grasp the situation. You are out of your mind. Get out of the sun. Oh, hold on, Mom. What's going on? Monica has a plan to fake a holdup. Well, now I have a plan to be on network TV. Hey, just hear me out. Let me call you back, Mom. Tell Donovan to go fuck off. To go fucking fuck off! Many blessings, Mom. I love you so much. OK, what's the plan? So the robber's in downstream. Customers are saying, oh my god, terror, bullshit, my kids, whatever. Mirror's behind the counter, and you hand over the cash to the robber. It's gonna be like 20 bucks. Shut up. I'll put a full 200 in there. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, bitches. Can I see that fire? Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> you really lost it. Okay, I think we can pull it off. Like, OG's an actor. I mean, I'm sure Chris has, you know, done some plays. Oh my god, Monica's calling me gay? Okay. He's definitely done a play. Uh, duh, I've been the Beast in Beauty and the Beast three times. After I came out, I might add. Oh. Hey, oh, hey, buy one, get one. Oh, yeah, buy one, get one. Buy one, get one. Buy one, get one. 
which is why we have to do this crazy sounding scheme where we act like, ha, 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 I'm being robbed, and then collect donations from the community. I'm a recovering alcoholic, and I don't think this is good for me. Wow, the human mind is so fragile. This is nuts, This right? is not gonna happen. We're gonna get caught. I read the newspaper. People try to fake shit, and then they get caught. Most actors try to fake shit, and they can't, and they get paid to do it sometimes. Oh, geez, stick with me. Oh, you're my favorite server. Uh, we can hear you. I mean, ugh. I understand the impulse. People are going online, and they're buying followers. I know this because I have done it. I went on the internet and I clicked buy. You think I know 22,000 people? I don't know 15 people. Now, don't get me wrong, I think you're wrong, but I understand where you're coming from. Never listen to actors. They're only speaking from their need for attention. <laughs> yes, yes, I do need attention, but I'm also right. <gasps> oh. Buy one, get one! Buy one, get one! It's all for the good of the company, Mary. Okay, I'm going inside. I can't listen to this. Wait, Mary, God, just hear me out! No, you're gonna get us all into trouble. Accept it, Monica. It's over. Jorge, it's all going to be boarded up in a week. Hello, downstream restaurant. Oh, hi, Nick. Yes, you could start showing the space. See you soon. Por qué se está desnudando? ¿Qué es esto? ¿Qué pasó? Let me just finish explaining. Oh my God! What the fuck? Bang bang? No, 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 Jorito, tiene que hablar con ella, pues está vuelto loca, se está volviendo loca. Look up and listen to me. Okay, okay. The robber, having done the deed, says something like, "Stay down! This shit's still a robbery!" And leaves. Ooh. Ooh. Ah. And our customers will back us up. Easy peasy. Okay, okay. But what? What if a celebrity happens to yeah, be yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or what about a casting director? Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or like someone really cute who maybe wants to date you? Ah! Ah! What about the police? The cops can't get anything done in this district. That's true, I'm still waiting on like three wallets. But I mean, this is totally morally wrong. I can't believe I'm the one that's saying this, but it is. Okay, like, in the olden days, when there was a fire, people would line up with buckets of water and put the fire out. And you know what? When there was a sewage issue, people would line up with buckets and take the sewage out. But, but it is not like that anymore. No, no one has loyalty. And I can't give up on this. Please. Please. I can't let my family down. I can't let us down. I'm in. Where'd you go? I go. Well, show me a script. Okay, why not, huh? At least I get to wear a costume. <laughs> Are you an actor? Uh, have you done any plays? Oh, well, actually, I've done a few plays. Okay, we done uh, with this? <laughs> Woo -hoo -hoo! <laughs> Woo -hoo! Do I feel complete? Wow. Yeah, I feel fulfilled. Um, I think that if you're an artist, um, if you're not doing art, you kind of feel a, a space 
It's, um, I can tell from when I wasn't doing art uh, and having that kind of conflict of, well, what do I want to do? I'm working at this place and that, and not, that felt confusing. So now that I have, um, I feel like I have a purpose, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> talking about the neighborhood still. Um, it's very friendly, there's a lot of families and a lot of kids. I think it has a reputation of being dangerous, but um, I've, I've always felt pretty safe and people are very friendly. Um, so I like to do a lot of people watching and what I think is really great about fashion is that it can allow you to express yourself authentically every day. As an artist, you're just creating what's given to you, you know, and you're just waiting for the muse to come. The more important a call or action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel toward pursuing it. When I start feeling resistance, which I did a lot this week, I'm like, oh yeah, that's resistance trying to fight me, trying to stop me. And I think what the quote is saying is, if you feel a strong calling towards something, you're going to also feel a strong amount of resistance fighting back. People ask me a question I get a lot is, oh, how's Pistolet going? And that's such a big question. I'm like, oof, do you really want to know? <laughs> Not usually, so I just say, good, you know, it's good. Um, but really, it's, it's hard. In my last apartment, I had a separate workspace, a separate room. I just didn't have to go in the room if I didn't want to. Um, but now I wake up and I see my work right there and sometimes I'll even just put a poster right here at the end telling me what I have to do for the day. So I just, you know, wake up and look over and I got to roll out of bed and do it. I really have to motivate myself out of bed because no one will care if you don't do it, you know, except you. You're the only one who'll notice. It's like you could just stop. My mom. She's really cool. She's an artist. Um, she's not a professional artist, but she's an artist at heart. She can do everything from drawing to interior design, floral arranging. She's just a natural. At one point, she went back to school for graphic design, and it kind of reinstilled for me that if you're an artist, you kind of have to do art, you know, to, to feel complete. <laughs> It's always, it's always challenging, but it's always um, fulfilling too. Um, like we were talking about earlier, it's like just when it starts getting really hard and really, really trying, you have a breakthrough and it just feels worth it. Zipper is stuck, and she feels trapped. I'm so hot. Sheila, you got stuck in your jacket. Oh, oh God, yeah. Sorry, still. You know, last night I was watching Reservoir Dogs, 
And the men just, they just like talk and talk and talk. And I was just thinking like, why isn't there a film where women talk a lot, you know? Like all the women are on cocaine. N no, but, well yeah, sure. I mean, that would be fine too, I guess. Oh, I love Reservoir Dogs. Oh, you could spit, so on the, good. spit on the zipper. Let's stop. Let me just My have a elbows turn. need to breathe because I'm at work, you see. Babies, cut it. Just cut the damn zipper. It's a cheap ass jacket. Mm, no, it's not cheap. I paid like 40 bucks for it. Jesus! Good luck, my child. Okay, so I was thinking for the show, like maybe you can make fun of yourself more, you know? Like you have a really funny sneeze. Why don't you just talk about sneezing? Help me. I know. When you sneeze, you sound like you're speaking Japanese. Seriously? It sounds like this. You're like, Sumimisu. Sumimisu. It's really cute. I think that might be cultural appropriation. No, 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 it isn't. Really? And if it is, still do it. It's very funny. Is Karen here? No. Got any weed? Nope. Does White Rachel have any weed? No. You want some? Yeah. Oh. All right. That sounds like fun. Well, la di da. Good to see you. Nice to see you. You want to arm wrestle? Okay, but I'm not gonna win. How do you know? Because <laughs> I've never won before. <laughs> oh my god! Don't give it to me. Oh my god! You're Don't. Totally, <laughs> totally me. Oh, oh, yeah. oh man, <laughs> that was the closest I've ever gotten, though. Can I have some coffee? Uh, yeah. Milk. Cream. Well, listen, I think that you should definitely incorporate it. It's really funny. I mean, it's very, very relatable. Who doesn't sneeze? Indeed, who among us hath not sneezed, right? Okay, I'll think about it, definitely. Definitely, she said definitely. That means you're not gonna do it. I know you. These are pearls before swine. Who's Lucille talking to? She's cracking a story about a kid that was raised by a cat. Uh, he's now an adult man. He's like a cat man. Personally speaking, I believe it. Supposedly, the kid and the cat, they were chained together to a crib for like three years. That sounds like heaven to me. Just like me, my cat, nobody bothering us for years at a time. I guess. Personally, I don't believe the story at all. I think it's fake. I mean, a kid and a cat being chained to a crib together, the logic, it doesn't add up. Cuckoo bananas. Oh, well, stranger things have happened. Oh, yeah? Like what? One time, I threw a dog treat to a dog and it landed on its nose and then he licked it off. And then I did it five more times, mm -hmm. and that kept happening each time. It's like a trained dog. Okay, uh, that sounds kind of like dumb luck. I mean, it doesn't sound like when a cat mm -hmm. and a kid are chained to a crib oh, together. I got it. Oh, Yay. oh okay. my God. Thank God. God. Tigers. That was the worst feeling. I thought I was going to die in that coat. <laughs> you're all right. You're all right. For the record, I really think that story is fake. For the record, Lady Tina. Because, I mean, the last story that she broke was about a bunch of people masturbating when Mount Vesuvius blew. Blue? I meant erupt. You know what I meant. Oh, you know what? I read about that. That was amazing. She was the only journalist that got that scoop. It, she didn't break the scoop. It wasn't a real story. It got debunked. I'm sure someone died masturbating. I mean, the French call it... Le petit mot. Yeah. So that means the little day. Oh, oui. Few people know that I am fluent in this French accent, you know? I French? used to do this bit about like, oh, I want to have lunch outside, or as the French would say, al dente. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's cute. <laughs> See, that's you. funny. Yeah. You should be more like that when you were like less serious. Right, I just have to be like a fool on stage again. Like a moron. Right, who doesn't know what's happening. Yeah. More on that later. You do that well. Now, what are, what are those two doing out there? Oh, Simone's making a documentary. Why? Why well, ask why? Coffee. Why do they do anything? What's it about? Lesbians. Really? No, I don't know what it's about. I'm just assuming. Well, if it is about lesbians, I want to be in it. I have a lot to say. Oh, well, I'm sure you do. I was head les two years in a row. That was such a fun pageant. Oh, I could go on such a tirade about straight girls. Uh -huh. What have you got to say about straight women? Well, you know, they just like to dip their toe in the mick pool. <laughs> And then as soon as they get to the deep end, they swim right back to Straitsville. Straitsville, that's where I live. Horrible up there. Yeah. Can you rent or do you own? <laughs> I rent. This one girl was texting me about, uh, about tribbing. I was thinking about making a, uh, a movie called Girls Trib. <laughs> Maybe a, a lezzy porno. Holy shit, it's cold out here. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thank you. BRB. I hope so. You know what? You should do impressions. Really? Mm hmm. The only one I can do, like, are you talking about like SNL style? Yeah. Oh my God, that's me. I can do my uncle. He works in a donkey sanctuary back in Ireland. Oh, that's perfect. You can, <laughs> you can be all like, 
Eeyore. No, oh, he's like a bookkeeper. He's, it's an NGO that rescues donkeys. Oh. And that's what he, yeah. Like he's not. He's not a donkey. Oh, he right. could be like T4. Right. I yeah, know. I got a good impression. Oh. Oh, oh yeah? Let's hear it, Jackie. <clears throat> You know, Mick, I'm actually, I'm going by Jack these days, so. Noted. Thank you. Let's hear it. Oh, it sounds really <laughs> nice. Oh. <laughs> careful oh. and careful. Oh my God. <clears throat> I think I'm gonna chop it all off. Stop lying. You have something on your ass. What? Oh. What is it? It's just a threat. Falling apart. Yeah, you were looking really poor for a second. <laughs> hey, how's it going? It's good. You still have some, right? No, I'm uh, fresh out and I got two runs tonight. All right, I'll get you some. All right. You're getting close, you know. At this rate, you'll be paid off by spring. Right. I'm serious though. I'm gonna get rid of all this hair. I'm gonna just like start dressing like a little boy. Brian's gonna love that. Oh, who cares? I mean like, I could like give back to the community and like donate it to like those people that make the wigs for the cancer kids. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna donate my ass to science. What are they gonna do with that? <laughs> <laughs> they give to like, like really skinny people who like they want some fat on their face. You know, they like they like I want some cheeky cheese. I didn't you know? realize they could do that. Yeah, like, like I use my back to give back. Oh my god, well, you yeah. can't keep that all to yourself anymore. I gotta give back with my back. Give back with your back. Time to give back with that. Back of yours. <laughs> we should do a run through for the show. Mm. Maybe Wednesday? I don't know about run throughs. Like, they kind of just take away any spark that I can manage to muster up for the real show. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like, but you feel ready, though. I don't know, honestly. But you're gonna feel ready before Thursday? Honestly, I'm just not really feeling it at all. Come on, Nora, babe, babe, babe. Mm. This is gonna be good, okay? Mm. You need this. Yeah. Plus, it's gonna kill like a million birds with one stone. Right. And, you know, I worked really hard to make this happen. No, I know you did, and thank you for that. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Mm. You just have to find a way to just like get it up right. if you're not feeling it. Like, think about your visa. This will be really good, I'm, like renewing your visa. No, I get all that. It's just, I'm sorry to go on about this, but like, just when everything in the world is so fucked up, it just seems so absurd to be doing jokes about like, this is a funny way that I yawn, you know? Okay. All right, honey. Honey, as your manager, let me tell you, it's not your yawns. Your yawns are very mediocre. Oh. It's your sneezes. Okay, right. your sneezes are golden, yeah. girl. That okay? Amazing. Amazing. This guy was raised by a cat for three years. It's gonna be such a good story. Hi, dude. Hi, Sheila. So good to see you. Oh, what's wrong with you? Oh, she's not feeling funny. Did I say that? I mean, pretty much. But you're so funny. Thank you, I know. <laughs> I'm so glad you came. Me too. What good is being funny with everything that's happening in the world, you know? Yeah, it's true, things are really fucked up. You know, the cab driver that dropped me here was saying that he's worried about being mistaken for a terrorist just because he's brown. Oh. It's awful, yeah. But you know what's even worse? What? No one will send me a dick pic. I see it. <laughs> it is a problem. Huh? I'll send you a dick pic. Yeah, yeah. Jack. Great. It's all really coming together. Uh, Mick is loaning me her suit, and uh, Kiana, have you met Kiana? She's flying in today from LA. And uh, Nora is, is house-sitting at this place that has this like really long hallway, and it ends in this alcove with all these plants, and it's really beautiful and magical. Nora, you know what you need is an opener. Mm. 
I do. Try me on for size, huh? See what I got. Okay. Yeah. Give me a shot, coach. I, that's what you do. You just do. You shimmy. Just shimmy. That's your act. Oh, Put okay. me on stage. No one's shimmy. I can say. Jack. It's your Rachel huh? because. Ah. Uh, I'm just really happy that I'm going through with it. You know. And if I'm honest, I'm a little bit nervous, <laughs> too. Why? Uh. Well, marriage is a big deal. You're marrying yourself. Yeah. No, I, I know that. Jack. Jackie. Jackie! Yep. Simone is calling you. Mick, I told you for the last time, I'm going by Jack now, not Jackie. Anyway, you're gonna be there, right? <laughs> I was really hoping you'd give me away. Sheila. Missy. Can I level with you? Uh, sure. This is such a... inane? Is that the right word? Yeah, this seems very inane. Come, sit down. Okay. I'm gonna interview you. Okay, tell me your name. Hey. Okay, we'll start with something easier. Okay. Have you ever been to a concentration camp? Yes! Great! Is that Kiana with a cane? Why did I not know that? Oh no, she has a walking stick. It's so LA. Mm. Really? People in LA are using canes now? Rappers, the elderly. <laughs> like, I get all that wishy-washy ritual stuff, like burning incense, doing meditation, hugging a tree or whatever, but marrying yourself? Really? <laughs> I mean, I... I mean, I don't want to hurt your feelings or anything. I no, no, think no, no, it's, it's fine. I understand. Yeah, it's, it's fine. It's just that, um, you know, it's my 33rd birthday, and I wanted to do something to really mark the moment, you know? I mean, I could have just thrown a party where everyone got drunk, but I decided to have a, a rite of a, a ceremony to mark the rite of passage, you know? Um, I mean, 33 is a really big number in, in many different religions and cultures. It's, um, it's, it's my Christ year. It's a, a, a master number in numerology. And I, and I think it's also the end of my first Saturn return, which I think technically ends at 31, but then uh, you still feel like a shadow of it until you're 33. Anyway, I'm not really clear on the details, but the point is, is that I really wanted to do something that would make me feel excited and hopeful about my future. You could foster a puppy. I could do that in addition to this. Plus, I think they'd be more likely to foster out a dog to someone who's married, right? That's not what I meant. Bam, 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 bam! Kiana! You look beautiful. Thank you. Oh, hi. yeah, hi, girl. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow, look at this jacket. Mm -hmm. Ooh. How much does it set you back? 60 bucks? Ooh, <laughs> half a paycheck. Mm -hmm. I don't know nothing about it. Is this what they call Hollywood? You're so LA now. You're so clever now. Did you go to Joshua Tree? Did you do ayahuasca? Look, I'm gonna go ahead and go through with it because everything's already planned. I'm gonna even have the menu plan out. I have lots of gluten-free options for you. Lasagna. Lasagna isn't gluten-free. Right, but it is with gluten-free noodles. Stop. Oh, hey, Dee, have you met my sister? Nope. She's, re she's really fun. She's actually really great. I'm sure. Hey, Lucille, I got your dick pic right here. Get it? <laughs> dick pickle. <laughs> I went overboard on the yogurt. What does that even mean? I don't know. I got lots of different kinds. How many different kinds of yogurt are there? Well, I got five. Five? Yeah. Why did you buy five kinds of yogurt? You don't eat yogurt when you get stoned? No, do you? Yeah. You're so weird. Have you ever had cashew yogurt? <laughs> so, uh, what's up? What's up with you? I'm trying to clear out some of this stuff so that we can get onto the roof to smoke. Oh, I can see that. I mean, how are you? How are you doing? Oh, I'm trying to write this piece about this guy. I told you about it before, right? Who? Oh, cat guy. The cat guy, yeah. Cat man. Yeah. And other than that, I'm just reading about people who are getting killed by their families. It's an epidemic. Yeah. It is. You know, I had this idea for a movie where all the wives and the, the wives start killing their husbands and their children. Yeah. And then you find out it's because they've been drinking tainted kombucha. Tainted kombucha? You're insane. Should I take the yogurt bag? Yeah, take the yogurt. Gotta save that cashew stuff. Okay. 
Oi, my back. Okay. Oi. Cute. Thanks, you too. Hi, here you go. How's Brian? Uh, he's fine, I guess, uh, playing video games. He's obsessed with this game right now. It's about digging holes. Like, that's all you do is you dig holes or something. I don't know. Hmm. He's really good at it. But oh. his parents are coming in town this weekend. His mom is on me about this wedding. And I'm like, oh, I'm so over it. Why? It's just so boring to me, you know? But I've been saving up, and I'm gonna do this cowgirl dress. Like, going for a cowgirl theme. That's, that's unique. You think so? Yeah, I've never seen a, a cowgirl bride. Well, get ready. Yeehaw. <laughs> sweet, sweet world. Peace and harmony all around. Oh, look, sing, singing lady. I, I want to be here when I grow up. You want to dance? Smiling at Do, wait, can you waltz? Do you know how to waltz? I don't know. Oh, God. Or we could just slow dance. Yeah. I know. They think they're like flirting with us or something. Come on. Oh, wait, just play. Get out of here, guys. Wait, just slow dance with Stop. Them. Go on. It's, just, it's okay. Just they'll go away if you ignore them. I'm if you to give dance. them energy. I'm going to kill you. That's it. That's it. Oh, Idiot. Get out! Really nice singing. Yeah, but babe, it's gonna be fab. I booked this amazing spot, and industry people are coming, and I'm yeah. also gonna do my sexy grandma routine. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna do sexy grandma. I as thought an you opener. booked an opening act. I did, I did, but uh, I booked a stand up, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I thought maybe I could do a little character work. Oh my god, is this whole thing so you can do your character? No, Nora. You know, I did this for you. I just thought maybe I can like warm up the crowd a little bit before the big guns come out. Huh. What is sexy grandma? Kiana, you never seen sexy grandma? No. Okay, girl. So sexy grandma is essentially just like a straight up grandma, right? But she more disturbing. Out. Hey, she comes out, she looks like a grandma. You're like, hey, this is gonna be some regular old grandma shit. <laughs> But then you're like, wait a second, why she got her bra on the outside of her dress? And then I start talking about sex and shit. Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! <laughs> <laughs> okay? Woo! You did good girl. Here's your jacket. <sighs> yeah. <sighs> Those guys really bother you, huh? Yeah. They beat me in a in a game of strip. I had lawyers of Catan once, and it's really embarrassing. Sounds very awkward. How, how far do you think I ran? Uh, I guess around the corner. Oh, oh I'm yeah. so out of shape. Oh, it's okay. I was on the swim team. We were champions for two years. Yeah, but you can get it back anytime. You just have to, like, uh, I hear you, you have to incorporate movement into your day. Oh, you know? shut up. It just makes me worry that, like, you want to be a performer and not a no. manager. And being a performer, that's a type of sickness. No, Kiana I don't. Can absolutely... I want to be a manager. Ah! I... Oh, my God. Kiki Williams! Hi. Ah! I am such a big fan. Thank you so much. Kiki is my favorite character. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wait, so... Are Kiki and Kyle gonna hook up in season three? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but you must know. But no spoilers, right? <laughs> Can you do the Kiki dance? Please. It's just, we, we should go. We're a bit late for something. I know, but I, I, I love the Kiki dance, okay? When I passed the LSATs, I did the Kiki dance. I got a pap smear last week, and it was good results. I did the Kiki dance. Oh, congrats on the smear. It's just, you know what, it's like, it's not that kind of a night. Yeah, you know? we're just gonna... We're kicking it with, you know, I'm here yeah. in town, we got some snacks. It's a chill kind of night, it's not a kiki dance kind of Good night. night. But thank you so much. Thank you for your love. Thank you. I mean, they, they weren't really that good of results on the pap smear, so... Yeah. Give me a beat. Okay. Yeah? 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 yeah. 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 yeah.
Cakes, you okay? Are you doing a bit? No, I feel like I pulled my groins. Okay, what does it feel like? Like a rubber band popped in my vagina. Yeah, she pulled her groin. <sighs> okay, come on, let's get you. You can go. That's okay. Oh, this is a baby. Come on. There's a this bench right behind right. you. Right. Sit down. Good, good, good. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it was kind of funny though. Sorry. Here, here, here. <laughs> Well, Try this uh, now. <laughs> yeah, put it on. No, put it on your groin, girl. <laughs> yes, oh, yes. Goodness. How does it feel? Oh, like heaven. That's right, because I know a thing or two about how to ice the old tuna, baby. A little bit, a little bit of chocolate ice cream on that, a little chocolate vagine. Because <laughs> she's black, get it? Right. Yeah. Caramel macchiato vagine. My bad. My Mine bad. would be like minty green vagine. Oh, that doesn't sound appetizing. No, but <laughs> it's <laughs> Irish. Yeah. It's refreshing. It's very refreshing. refreshing. So sorry. Like. No, like um. No, like parkour. <laughs> like. Parkour. What is that? I don't know, it's like the best I can do. No, this parkour. Is, this is parkour. That's me doing a flip. This is parkour. That's, that's why I do that. It's like, use, use your dominant foot and you get up I feel, high. I feel like really nervous mm -hmm. for you right now. Parkour. We should just walk. That also burns calories. Watch, look. I'll get up halfway, double gainer. Oh, this yeah. is how you parkour. Oh, yeah. Okay. When you I don't think up, I can catch you. Gotta you. Get, you gotta use things in the city and then I feel like I feel really worried. For I'm not you right doing now. that. That's, yeah, I'm impressed. impressed. Let's coming. just go. We can do it later. Let's do it. You, later. Ever, you ever get a ringing in your ear? Oh, yeah. So you know, some people are born with really small ear canals. That's me. That's what I have. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Oh wait, I want you to take a picture. Smile. <laughs> oh, I love it. Let me see. Hold on. I don't want you sending it anywhere. <laughs> I look old. Oh, you look good. I mean, I didn't say I don't look good. I just, you know, I look old. Well, you look hot. Thanks. All, All right. right. Saddle yeah. up. Get what on. What do you mean? You're going to sit here. And oh, I'm that's what the ride. pot holders are for? Yeah. Oh, no. I, I think? No, no, no. That's not going to work. I'll sit back here on this seat. All nice right. Nice try, though. OK, you're going to have to hold on to me. All right. <laughs> for my life. How long have you been working for Karen? What are you, the FBI? Oh, I'd be great in the FBI. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. We got two, here we go. We're two steps in bed style. <laughs> See that? I was pretending to be on an elevator. Yeah, I've seen it before. What are you doing here? Morning! Hello. What time did you call this? Huh? Three o'clock <laughs> in the afternoon. I'm sorry. How are you? Ah, uh, my groin is on the mend. Really? Yeah. I was thinking about your poor vagina all night. It is remarkable. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to record you. I'm going to record you. Obviously, this will all be on the record, right? You are a journalist. You are a journalist. It's going to be a big scoop. I'm recording you. I'm recording you. I'll record you. I'm going to record you now. You're on the record. You're on the record. No. You're on the record. 
Hey, what is this? Oh, I whittled it, or rather sculpted it. But what is it? It's a, it's an elephant goat man. <laughs> smells like fish in here. That's the point. I'm making salmon. Oh. It hides the smell of the weed. Cool. We used to make bacon for the smell, but then we watched this uh, documentary on pigs. Oh, was it about how smart they are? <laughs> no, it was about how horribly they're treated. You know, they're held in these tiny little pens, thousands of them all together, eyeball to ass, no space to be themselves, and then eventually someone comes and kills them. It just grossed me out. I want my food to be free, you know? We watch a lot of documentaries. Okay, I'm ready for you. Oh, oh, uh, okay. What, what do you want me to do? Just talk. <clears throat> talk. All right, talk, 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 talk. Oh! Um, I was also going to ask you about doing the show. Would you think about doing like 10 minutes at the show? Yeah, I would think great about it. Really? Yeah. You would think great about it? Yeah. I'd love for you to do that. Yeah. You know how Rachel's doing her sexy grandma? Mm hmm <laughs> And then I'm doing my like normal self, just like inescapably sexy. Super sexy. <laughs> naturally, naturally. So like you could be a little break in between for people to just stop being so turned on, you know? You know? Yeah, like a palate cleanser. Yes. <laughs> I'm good with that. Well, I was gonna tell you about my movie idea. Great. Okay, Jaws the movie, but the gender roles are swapped. Hmm. So I don't know how much you remember about Jaws. The opening shot is a woman skinny dipping and she's doing the backstroke or something, right? And you know, then all of a sudden, bam, no legs. And of course, you know, it's probably a lady shark, right? I, sorry, a female-bodied shark. Like, F Hollywood, right? Like, they think it's some emotional lady shark. She's probably on her period or something. <laughs> and then, you know, the rest of the movie is just white, male-driven conflict. There's the overworked police chief who just wants to keep everyone safe. There's the mayor who just wants the town to make money. There's the scientist, um, Dreyfus. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. All right. So, in the last episode, I confessed to having a crush on Eleanor. And I also explained that I hadn't, I've been keeping it a secret from both her and Mandy. And I've been meaning to tell Mandy, but I've been waiting for the right moment. Um, but now that I was telling the whole world, I, I, I needed to tell Mandy before it aired. Um, so the question was like, when and how? I knew she'd take it a lot better if she was high. Uh, so I got her very high. <laughs> I'm just so stoned. I barely know what we're talking about. And uh, she took her really well. This is going to be great for the next episode. And she even gave me a really good idea for the show. You should film Alana when you tell her. And we had a really good talk. And uh, I was like, I can't believe this is going so well. Uh, but I was worried that the next day it was all going to come crashing down, which it did. She was very, very depressed the next day. She like, had a hard time getting out of bed. And she was really uh, just sad all day, you know, and she felt rejected and unloved, I guess. And, you know, she was so, like, deeply sad that she wasn't able to be as attentive to the children, and I felt guilty about that in addition to everything else. Um, but so there were 24 hours of, of, of gloom. But then the next day she seemed much better and, uh, and you know, the, the truth is it brought us closer together. I mean, uh, you know, secrets pull you apart and 
confessions bring you together, usually, uh, unless they don't. But um, so now we needed to tell Eleanor, but I wanted to film it. So she came over to look at the footage I shot, which included my confession about having a crush on her. Do you mind if we film you watching it? Um, sure. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. We're ready. Okay. You want to sit next to me? Uh, uh sure. Uh, so he can help yeah. you? <laughs> Fine. stuff is, you know, it's, it's very love, flattering and warm feeling. And of course, I, you know, it's, I love you, Kavi, but I don't love you, Kavi. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I, fi I figured. I know. I, was just, I wasn't sure for a minute. But anyway, after some persuasion, she agreed to reenact the scenes of us meeting at the movie theater. And then in the cab on the way to the shoot, uh, she asked me. So have you talked to Mandy about all of this yet? Yeah, I told her. That's good. And what'd she say? She said. You know, we should invite Eleanor over and just like hang out and like normalize things. I think that's a really good idea. Yeah. I'd love to meet the kids and I don't want Mandy feeling weird or anything. So I think that would be a really good idea. Yeah. And then when we were reenacting our late night talk after the screening, she told me why she had sent me that text message. Because I got so excited that I was a film, that I was an artist in some way, that I had the capacity to be an artist, that I was a filmmaker. And you gave me that encouragement that I had the right, that I had this vision, this idea to make something interesting, meaningful, and substantial. You don't even think about it. No. But then in the cab, on the way to my place, she said, Of course the thought like crossed my mind. Like what would it be like to be with Kave, you know? Of course it did. So it was kind of like a bit of a mixed message, you know, like denial and, and confession. But um, basically, by bringing it out in the open, it was, it was, I killed it. I killed the energy of it, I think. Uh, well, I did. Uh, for myself, certainly, but uh, probably for her too, or there wasn't as much for her, clearly. But anyway, when we get back, Sam is there. Can I ask you something? Hey. Hi, how are you? Can you? Sorry, I need to ask him something. Can you pay me back for that Coke I bought? You bought Coke? Yeah, for the shot. So, during the making of the paraplegic threesome in episode two, Sam took me aside and told me that he had ADHD and he was on Adderall, but he was out of Adderall, and he had been up all night, and needed to do coke to stay awake because he was out of Adderall. And he said that if I wanted to film him doing coke, I could. So I said, okay. Um, but then the footage that we shot was accidentally deleted. And since the coke scene happened during the making of episode two, 
I decided to reenact it for episode three. So I called Sam and I asked him, would you be willing to reshoot the coke scene? Now, I should explain that the last time I saw him, he had told me, I've been sober for eight days. Really? Yeah. So I told him, we don't have to really do coke though, you could, we could fake it. Tell him we can crush up some Adderall and he can use that instead. We can, we can crush up some Adderall and use that instead. No, it's not gonna, it, it, Adderall is all purple and shit. It has to be cocaine or it won't look right. Okay, whatever you want. So anyway, when he arrived in my place, he'd already done the coke that he was supposed to reenact doing on camera. So I was wondering, could you pay me back for the cocaine that I bought for the scene? It's like 20 bucks, it's not like. So I paid for the coke and we started shooting the scene. But instead of reenacting the scene, he throws the coke in the toilet. It's a dead mythology, man. Did you do drugs? It? No, I'm not going to subscribe to drug use on camera. Drugs are for uh, stockbrokers, not artists. You don't want to do it? No. And I was like, oh, what a fucking asshole. Like, and I feel guilty because Eleanor is mad at him because he did coke right before he came and he, w he had stopped. And I feel guilty because I'm the one who Gave him the idea to do coke, I guess, by saying, would you do coke in this movie? And so then he got coke. Uh, but they're fighting. Are you actually on cocaine right now? What? You were going to quit. It's not fucking sin. I'm just doing a little cocaine. It's fucking stupid. You're supposed to be acting it. You, should, you can act it. No, I don't want to fucking act. What? I don't want to fucking act. I'm just... I'm not doing cocaine, I'm doing advertising. No, you did do cocaine. I did advertising. You did a lot of cocaine. Shot and you're of addicted to cocaine. I'm addicted to advertising. No, you're addicted to cocaine. Okay. You're an addict, Sam. And then he's mad at me and he's like, What did you say in return against me? I didn't say anything. I think she's mad at you because you did coke. And he was blaming me for that and he was kind of like threatening me in these weird ways. Like, <laughs> and he's saying really harsh things and he's sort of. Uh, accusing me of things I haven't done. I didn't say she, you wrapped around her. She's wrapped around your finger. Your film did. And he says, Your mythology's dead. No, he says, Your mythology is a violent mythology. Well, more like this. Your mythology is a violent mythology. Well, he said all kinds of shit. But, um, and Eleanor is like, Sam, the only person being violent right now is you. Which is true. Um, and she kind of was able to sort of calm him down and sort of escort him out. Oh, I forgot one thing. Aziz had said to me that he needed, um, well, okay, so Dustin, who was playing Aziz, uh, fell in love with a German woman, and he's moving to Germany. So he can't be in any episodes until they break up <laughs> or move back or whatever. Um, so um, I need someone else to play Aziz. I don't want anybody else to play me. I want Dustin. I want him too, but he's in Germany. Well, why can't you just play me on Skype? I don't know. I think that's too weird. Well, it's no weirder than anything else on the show. But anyway, Aziz, um, what was I saying? Um, Aziz, Mandy, Eleanor. Oh, yeah. Aziz told me. You need to get everybody to sign a release form. Because I haven't been doing that. Um, and so I was like, OK. I don't want to sign it. Well, you got to sign it or I can't use any of this footage. And he kind of signed just like a, a scribble, a legible scribble, kind of like a fuck you signing. There you go. And then he took it back and he was like, I don't want to fucking sign this, man. Why should I sign this? I don't, I don't know, Sam. Do whatever you want. Sign it. There you go. And my, I'm just thinking, Never again. I don't ever want to deal with you again. I'm never going <laughs> to put you in another episode again. Um, but then here I am telling this story. Um, so Sam and Elena left, and they ended up running into Mandy and the kids. Hey! Uh -huh. hey, hey, you guys. Hey. Hi. Let me give you a hug. Uh, thank you. Hi. So I just want you to know I'm yes. not mad at you at all. Are you sure? I would be mad at me. <laughs> no, I am mad at Kave. Me too. Yeah. Yes, I know. <laughs> that jerk. Yeah. We should hang out sometime. I would love to hang out. Hey. Um, this is Sam, by the Hi. way. I don't know if you've Yeah, no, we met. met. Yeah. Hi, Mandy. Yeah, how yeah. are you? I'm okay. Hey, how are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm sure you're okay. Yeah. I mean, you're married to a fucking dick. 
Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't mean to curse, but um, the dialectic that your fucking husband sets up in his fucking movie is that that this all powerful Leonor character, right? So amazing, he has to shoot the reaction shot. It's wrapped around yeah. my fucking finger, my 2015, my fucking finger. Yeah. Okay. Bullshit. Okay. Right. Bullshit. Right. 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 I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. He is a yeah. big fan. You so watch all of Kave's work. The David entire Mark Chapman, but I'm a big fan. Who's yeah. David Mark Chapman? He's the guy that shot John Lennon. Oh. Huh. That's yeah. That's, that's weird. Okay. All right. Wait, I'll see you guys later. All right. Okay. All right. All right. If you need a babysitter. Maybe. All right. See you. Bye. See you later. Why would you say that? Why would I say what? Why would you say, mention David Mark Chapman? Hey, Elena. What's going on? Hey, Kave. Uh, how are you? I'm good. Uh, what, what's happening? I just got out of a, a meeting with uh, human relations at New School, and uh, they had sent me an email because apparently someone had complained about uh, our sequence in the show about the show where we're smoking pot together. Um, oh. And yeah, oh. yeah. Uh, so they showed a clip at the meeting, and oh my God. they basically okay. asked me <laughs> if you know it was real pot, and uh, you know if uh, you brought the pot in, and if if you sort of like made us smoke pot on camera, and yeah, they they were just kind of trying to see if you were sort of like manipulating us into, you know, uh, into smoking pot. Yeah, okay. smoking pot and, uh -huh. uh, you know, and was that real weed when you did reenact the smoking? And I was like, uh, yeah, that's a joint. But they asked about the Coke uh, uh -huh. and and I, I, I wasn't expecting that. Uh -huh. so, so I lied. Uh, What'd you tell them? I, I, I told them that basically we kind of fictionalized the whole thing and kind of used Sam's sort of drug addiction to sort of like, you know, play up his character. Uh -huh. uh, that there wasn't was any okay. coke at our apartment. <coughs> um, and why did you do that? Uh, I, I just thought, you know, coke is more serious than weed, so maybe you might get right, in right, trouble right. more. So uh -huh. yeah, I was just trying to okay. cover up. But then, you know, they also told me not to tell you. So, after episode three came out, um, I got a call from Yelen, my student whom I had gotten stoned with on camera in episode three. I shouldn't do this. So, I just got out of a, a meeting with uh, human relations at New School. Was it Professor Zahidi's idea to smoke the marijuana? Uh, no, it was m my idea. We had just finished shooting the episode, and I rolled a joint for Jasmine and I, and offered him a hit. And Professor Zahidi smoked the marijuana? Yeah. And then you reenacted the scene by smoking real marijuana again for the following episode? That's correct. And they also interrogated Jasmine. So did you watch all three episodes? Because the second episode was quite explicit. And then I found out that another one of my students, Stefan, who was helping with the editing, was also contacted. I wasn't even there when you guys were smoking pot. And then I got an email. Dear Professor Zahidi, and I have received a complaint about your involvement in an episodic show that includes your students. We would like to discuss this with you at your earliest convenience. So I'm just like, man, I could get fired for this. I just like, my, my mind is racing, and then I'm like, Mandy is gonna freak out when I tell her. Are you kidding me? You are always threatening our family's livelihood. If I don't push the envelope at least a little bit, no one's gonna watch the show. That's not a little bit. You don't know what a little bit is. Well, it needs to be a little bit more than a little bit. This is serious, you need a lawyer. So I called my lawyer friend, Asher, who's married to, to Brooke, uh, this actress that I'd cast to play my ex-wife in a scene we shot for episode four. Action? But it didn't come out very well. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to get a wig to look younger, uh, and I had a wig from uh, a previous film, 
I'd made. Um, but I couldn't find the wig. It was, it was in the basement in our cage. And Mandy is a big hoarder. She doesn't throw anything away. And we were running late for the shoot, and I couldn't find the wig. Uh, and I looked everywhere, and I took the whole thing apart. And so then we decided, okay, I'll just buy a wig. So uh, we sent Peter to go get a wig, and it was like an African-American wig store, so he got me this really huge Afro wig. And I thought, oh, this is too big. Maybe I should trim it. But I didn't listen to my instinct, because everyone was saying, It's funny. It's funny. It's funny. Anyway, uh, I, I hate it when I don't listen to myself, um, but I didn't. Uh, so we do the scene, and it was too big. It looked stupid. And um, a lot of people said, you know, You look ridiculous. You look like a woman. You look like an idiot. So we cut it out uh, of, the, of episode four. Um, but anyway, I call Asher to ask him for legal advice. Meanwhile, I needed to convince Sam to act in episode four, but I was worried that he wasn't going to want to reenact what had happened during the making of the previous episode. My fucking finger, my 2015, my fucking finger. So Sam had been trying to get me to help him with his film that he wants to make. And he came over and he, really late at night and he was on drugs and uh, he was drunk and... Hey, 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 do you have a laptop? Yeah. Could we watch it on the stoop? Smoke a cigarette? Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. So then I watched his film and there were really good things about it, but whenever I'd make a suggestion, he would like, he didn't want to hear it. I see what you're saying, but you don't see what I'm saying because I'm your successor and by definition you can't understand what I'm doing. Okay, well if you don't want to hear it, then why are you asking me to watch it? And you know, the reason is because he didn't really care about my feedback, I don't think. I think he really just wanted me to love it and, and help him get it made. Um, which, you know, I understand, but I didn't love it. I mean, I, I, I liked a lot of it, but it was too long and it was, seemed too in love with its own every, every thought and there were mosquitoes kept getting bit. Um, and after a couple of hours, like reading the script and dealing with him and I just was like, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to help him anymore. I wanted to help him and I didn't want to help him anymore because it was just like, it wasn't worth it. And he felt like he wasn't being sensitive to my needs. I had to go to bed. I kind of got to get up early to teach. Do you have any food? And that's, the, that's my issue. Like when people don't see me, whether it's Mandy or Sam or anybody, like I, I feel really upset because that's, I guess I felt as a kid with my parents. Um, so um, I basically didn't want to help him after that. And he sort of kept trying to talk me into it and he kept coming over. Hi. Hey. Bad time? And he wanted to borrow my phone to ask this producer I know for money. There's an ROI in place. I have to get a restaurant job because I live with my fucking dad. So get a restaurant job. And he's the other investor with my mom. My mommy and daddy are the investors. You're going to get your fucking money back. And then he wrote me an email and said... And I was just like, you know, if you need me to write you a letter of recommendation to your mother, uh, I don't think... I think that's not going to help, really. Um, she doesn't even know who I am. It's, like, ridiculous. But I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything for a while, and then I just wrote... And then he wrote back an angry-ish-sounding email, like... So I was just like, okay, fine, I'm not dealing with this guy. But then I need him to act in the show, in episode three, so I was like... Hey, Sam, it's Kaveh calling. Uh, just calling to see uh, if you'd be open to acting in episode three. Uh, give me a call. Hope all's well. Bye. So he called me back, and he was mad. You wouldn't even write a letter to my mom. So anyway, we got into an argument. Why don't you give me money then? Sam, I don't have any money. Sure you do. Sam, I can't pay my credit card bills. My credit card keeps getting cut off because I can't pay my bills. I have all the student loan debt still. And even if I had some money, why would I give it to you? I can't even, I, you know, I need it for my own films. But, you know, he's got this entitled thing where like, every, he's, a, he's a genius and we should give him money. And I used to be that way too, so I understand it. And I'm actually sympathetic, but, but I'm not there anymore and I can't give him my family's money for a film I don't even like. Look, if you don't want to do it, don't do it, okay? I can give you $100 to act in it. If that's not enough, fine. Don't do it. So he basically threatened to, to, to quit. Okay, fine, quit. I'll get someone else to play you. So he hangs up on me, and then he calls me back after a few minutes, and he says, Okay, I'll do it. 
So, Sam comes over to shoot episode three. Can you pay me back for that Coke I bought? You bought Coke? Yeah, for the shot. And what happened later that night was what I needed him to reenact for episode four. No, you're addicted to cocaine. You're an addict, Sam. The problem was that Sam wasn't crazy about how he was being portrayed in the show. Me being a dick. And he insisted that I show him a cut of the new episode before agreeing to act in it. And before he snorts the cook, he throws it in the toilet and flushes it. <laughs> it's a dead mythology, man. <laughs> drugs, no. I'm not going to subscribe to drug use on camera. Drugs are for uh, stockbrokers, not artists. Do you want to do it? No. And I was like, oh, what a fucking asshole. Like, That's the only way I could have looked more like an asshole. <laughs> Like, the only way I could have looked more like an asshole than doing coke in general <laughs> is that. Uh -huh. All right, go ahead. <laughs> I was a little scared of, of what he could do in that altered state. Anyway, what? Sam and Elena were using... <laughs> the scene of me shouting at him is him trying to get a, a frightening reaction shot mm -hmm. and me shouting at Corey. That might have been the third take of me shouting at I you. Know. I know you know. <laughs> Which is begging a larger conversation that I don't even know if I have to have with you. Um, Andy was a little spooked by his energy and she was a little scared of him because Andy he was, was you know, coked out and, and, and angry at me. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is episode four. And what character am I playing now? You have to do away with me in this episode one way or another or I'm playing a Night Stalker for that an, an unknown energy the rest of this f three episodes about Brooklyn filmmaking What I was thinking is if anyone kills you for any other reasons, I'm on the hook for it <laughs> I'd actually that thought occurred to me you your body with novelty and then without novelty <laughs> I need a cigarette Sure. Want to go out on the stoop or is that too? So let's talk about the show. Yeah So you okay with it? Am I okay with what? What's what we're doing? I don't, I, I... So anyway, I agreed to double his salary. All right, David Mark Chapman. Yeah, yeah, whatever you need. Okay. But anyway, I started getting all these comments from fans on YouTube. So I asked the fans if they would record the comments uh, that they wrote and send them to me for this episode. Three, two, I'm into it. This is fantastic, truly fantastic. Amazing. Fresh. This kind of blew me away. This is so good, OMG. I love it. Amazing. Congrats on having big balls, Kabe. Really funny. I love that it's so meta. The show is genius. Give Kabe all your money and let him make great shows. And then I got an email from another fan who told me, I was watching your TV show and it made me realize that I was being dishonest with someone that I care very much about. Um, and this huge lump, it developed on my thigh, um, and I believe that it, it had to do with some kind of blocked energy, um, and the person I was being dishonest with also loves you and that he loves your work, um, and we watched your show again together and we were able, um, to look at each other and to tell each other that maybe we shouldn't be together anymore. Um, and the lump went away. Um, but it was because of your honesty that you showed that I allowed me to be honest. Um, and I just wanted you to know that um, I love you and that I exist and I thank you tremendously for what you're doing and your work. There were also negative comments. The way you humiliate and degrade your wife in this show is just pathetic. It's disgusting. You bring up her mother's suicide clearly against her wishes, and then you talk about her resulting feelings of abandonment. Then you go about talking about how you might leave her just because you're not getting any sex right now. It's, it's sad, it's pathetic, it's wrong. It's not any way to treat a human being. And you do it all for your own aggrandizement, your own TV show. As if you have no talent and nothing to bring to your art other than the manipulation of your own wife who's clearly in a vulnerable place. So this isn't a dialogue, okay? This isn't a back and forth. I don't want to hear from you. I just want you to know that I fucking hate you. And then IndieWire film critic Eric Cohn picked the show about the show 
as one of the top 10 shows of 2015? Hilarious, strange, and often boundary pushing in its exploration of creative ambition. It's also wonderfully inventive and one of the most intriguing surprises of the fall. So your relationship to your wife is laid out in really revealing terms on the show. Is there anything that she just won't do? Well, this new episode, there was a scene where I wanted uh, her to reenact a blowjob. And so she's giving me a blowjob. Um, I will not be giving you a blowjob on camera. Not a real blowjob, like a fake one. I'm not going to give you a fake one either. I'll, I'll eat a banana if you want. So it's like a metaphor? Exactly. Could you do it a little more like a real blowjob? I'm just going to eat it. So anyway, she was reenacting a scene in which she offered me a blowjob, which was something that hadn't happened in a long time. But then she interrupted it. Do you mind if I stop doing this for a second? OK. You sure? Yeah, I mean, we can resume later. You don't have to do it all right now. Well, I'm so annoyed at my boss right now. She's like, tells me not to talk to anybody in New York, and she's like, you work for me. So we talked about this other thing for a while, and I was, you know, trying to listen and be sensitive, and, but then she just went on and on for like an hour. So I was like, can we finish the blowjob now? Can we do this tomorrow? Mandy, come on. Like, you, you said we would resume later. I'm just so tired right now. Let's do it after sleeping. Hey, this always happens. You always do this. Fine. You want one now? I'll finish. Go. Let's do this. No, I don't want it anymore. I wanted it before, but like now, I don't want it. To be continued tomorrow. Going to bed? You really going to bed? So she's okay with you revealing the intimate details of your sex life? I mean... You know, she has like a love-hate relationship with the show. I'm not sure I want to be filmed right now. I actually, uh, let me rephrase. I don't want to be filmed right now. I want the camera off. But then sometimes she really gets into it. Can you make that more blowjobby? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's the way. Mm -hmm. That's what I was imagining. Mm -hmm. uh, uh huh. Okay, good. Mm. Mm. Uh. She also likes the popularity that comes from being on the show. For example, our neighbors love the show. It's got big screen potential. We're obsessed with the show. Can I be on the show, please? It's really inappropriate. I like it. So it's made them a lot nicer to her than they used to be. You gotta puff hard on this one. Really puff hard because it uh, smoke's going away. Okay, go ahead. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys, by the way. We love you too. Mm. So anyway, after the IndieWire interview came out, I got a call from this producer in LA, and he'd like made a lot of shows and, and movies. He, he produced uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I love the show. It's fabulous. Would, would you be open to me shopping it around to a bigger network? Then I get an email from someone in Amsterdam who says they're a big fan of the show and they want to fly me out to Amsterdam to do an episode there. Um, interesting. Uh, I'm not sure how that would work, though. Like, every episode is about the making of the previous episode, so, like, how would that make any sense? Hmm. But so, anyway, the more people uh, said nice things about the show, the more self-conscious I got, and the more afraid I became to, like, lose whatever small amount of recognition I'd, I'd, I'd achieved. So I started getting really obsessive, and, like, I really wanted episode four to not be a disappointment after episode three, so I just started like shooting and reshooting, and I just was like, uh, I, was, uh, I was going crazy, really. What's taking so long? I know it's confusing because Dustin was in Germany, but he's back just for a little trip, so I filmed him. Uh, but then Aziz told me that... That doesn't make any sense. He's supposed to be in Germany. So I just wanted to say that. He's going back to Germany to be with his girlfriend. It's just temporary. What's taking so long? Do you want it fast, or do you want it good? Fast. Even the fans were starting to complain. When is episode four airing? Where the heck is the new stuff? It's February 8th. When does it hit? So I, I finally put together uh, a cut, and I showed it to a few people. Who do you think you are, man? Larry fucking David? Cut the episode down. It's too long. The show isn't even about the show anymore. It's like a reality TV show about some dysfunctional couple. I think you should cut out the masturbation stuff. There, there were all these scenes that, that I was in love with, that I worked really hard on, and, 
and I, I ended up cutting them all out. But there was one scene that I, I just didn't want to cut out. You can't say, so I paid for Coke. You've got to cut that out. Why? Because you say you bought Coke on camera. I didn't say I bought Coke. I said I paid for the Coke that he bought. That's the same thing. No, it's not. He bought the Coke. I don't even do Coke. I was just reimbursing him for the Coke that he bought. Yeah, you paid for the Coke. You bought Coke. You could go to jail for that. So, I was like, ah, oh, should I take it out? I don't want to take it out. I like that line a lot. So I paid for the Coke. Anyway, she storms off. And then she tells me the next day that she was crying all night and couldn't sleep because she was so worried about this line in the show. And she was like, please take it out. I can't take it out. Now that you got so upset about it, I got to reenact this moment for the next episode. You said you were going to call a lawyer, did you? I did, but he didn't call me back. So call him again. So I called this other lawyer that I worked with before. So I made another film in which I got in trouble with the government of the United Arab Emirates. And, you know, there was this threat of a fatwa. They tried to ban my movie, and he had defended it. And I asked him for help, and he was like, uh, How do they know it was real pot? Well, my student admitted it was... How does your student know it was real pot? Um, because we got high? How does he know it contained THC? Maybe it was something else in there that got you high. I'm not sure they'll go for that argument. My point is they can't prove it and the burden of proof is on them. Oh. In any case, we need to nip this in the bud. We should threaten to countersue. On what grounds? Discrimination. So I'm like, yeah, it is discrimination. It's discrimination against people who smoke pot. I mean, Drugs are a human right, they're a birthright. I mean, it's a civil right, it is. It's like, you know, segregation was wrong. It was a bad law. Rosa Parks, you know, had to break the law to, to change the law. And like, I have to break the marijuana laws to show that the laws are ridiculous, which they are. I don't think I would use that argument at all. I think you just make the argument that it's fiction. If, if I were you, I would just maybe start thinking about other jobs. So the day finally arrives, and I walk into the meeting. Thank you for coming in. Oh, my pleasure. Hi. Hi. Nice Get, to meet you. You want any water? No, I'm good. Thank okay. you. So I thought I'd start off with some small talk. I like your earrings. Oh, thank you. I made them, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It's very hard to get these stones now, but beautiful. I think they mined whatever was left. And then they got down to business. We received a sexual harassment complaint, so we had no choice but to investigate. I'm sorry, do you say a sexual harassment complaint? Yes, the email claimed you were forcing students to have sex on camera against their will. Excuse me? We realized after watching your show that the sexual harassment complaint was unfounded, but we are concerned about your decision to smoke marijuana with your students on camera. Got it. We are here to say that there's a public document out there showing you an illegal behavior with students, and we find that kind of troubling. Okay. We're all for faculty doing interesting things in the world, but we also have to protect our students and... Um, I'm sorry, protect our students from... From illegal behavior being publicly out there. Oh. It came from someone who identified themselves as Chad Newsom. And I was like, Chad Newsom, Chad Newsom. Oh yeah, I've been getting hate mail from this guy. Would you say you're being stalked? Uh, no, I mean, it's not that often. It's like every few months or something. Does that count as stalking? It can. But is it illegal to send hate mail? Only if it involves money, i.e. fraud or blackmail. I don't think it ever involved money. Well, but you should contact campus security and tell them that this person is harassing you. They might be able to track them down. Okay. As for smoking marijuana with your students, just don't do it. Okay, I'll try not to. Don't try, just don't do it. Okay, I mean, I can live with that. I mean, like, I don't need to smoke pot with my students. You know, I, can, I can buy my own pot. That's good. And also, just so you know, I'm gonna be reenacting this conversation in the next episode. I hope you guys are okay with that. Oh, God. I don't think that's a great idea. Well, it's a really good idea artistically. That may be true, but you're dancing really close to a policy violation and we take confidentiality very seriously here. I understand, but you saying that is also gonna be in the show. 
I think this this meeting's over. This is over. But also, like, uh, do you want? Would you guys be willing to play yourselves, or do you want me to get actors to play you? Also. Don't <laughs> push it. <laughs> so after the meeting, I checked my emails to see what this guy had sent me, and I realized that this guy had actually sent me these emails before, asking me to give him money for footage that doesn't exist of the artist Joseph Cornell and his waitress Joyce Hunter, who I'm making a film about. And when I asked him to show me some proof of the existence of the footage, he just wrote back and said, so this guy has been sort of following my filmmaking and obviously he watches the show. And I guess because the show's doing kind of well, he's trying to like bring me down, I guess, and like get me fired. Uh, cause I guess, cause he hates my films. I, I don't know why exactly. But I think it's fraud to try to sell someone something that doesn't exist. And so maybe I have like a legal case against this guy if I can find him. Um, so I guess I'm gonna try. So, during the making of the last episode, um, I was hired to go to Amsterdam to shoot an episode of the show there. Uh, and I did, I shot a whole episode. And uh, I asked them, you know, is it okay if I make fun of you guys? And they said, sure, no problem, we don't care. Uh, and so then I, I did. And, and then when I sent it to them, they said, hey, you're making fun of us. And I said, I know, I told you that I was gonna do that. And they said. So, um, I had to cut the whole thing out, sorry. So um, the main thing that happened to the making of episode five uh, was Mandy got stoned with the neighbors. And you know, the neighbors get stoned in front of their kids. They don't hide it. And I think that's great. I, I love that about them, actually. And um, I hate hiding stuff. And you know, it's like, it's hypocritical. You know, and it's like, what are you teaching your kids? That this is, you're doing something wrong? I, I don't know. I don't like doing it, but Mandy always insists. You can't do it in front of the kids because then they'll go to school and talk about it and then Child Protective Services will come take our children away. They can't just take away your children. Yes, they can. So anyway, she worries about it and I don't want her to be anxious, so I usually don't get stoned in front of them, but I'm such a better parent when I'm stoned. Like I can really tune into their wavelength. Ah, throw it to me! And when I'm not stoned, I really can't. So Mandy had gotten stoned with the neighbors and I went over there and I was like, wow, she's smoking right in front of the kids. Uh, and I thought, oh, this is great because now I, it means it's okay and I can do it too. Um, but uh, I realized later she was just so high that she didn't realize that the kids were there. Uh, and so I wanted to reenact this moment for episode five. No, no. no. Just he's gonna take a hit, he's gonna give it to you and you're gonna take it. Take it? Yeah. And Mandy is refusing to smoke pot on camera. I'm not I mean, I've had a long day too. Again, on the camera. I'm not. And really, she was worried about Child Protective Services. So you don't want to get in trouble? Right. Don't want to get in trouble with the law. And, you know, she's a mom. Like, she loves her children more than anything in the world. So, like, the thought of having Child Protective Services come and take our children away? <laughs> that's like her biggest nightmare in the world. I think that what other film footage is of you up there would definitely counteract any thoughts of taking your kids away in the child, if, if child services was watching this in the first place. It's just a horrible, you don't want to deal with them ever. How could it stick? There's no claim to authenticity in the show. There is. No, it's the real people. But there's no way you can prove that. 
It could be a show about a show pretending to be a show. It's totally fiction. A lot of people think it is. And finally, I just said to her, the more you fight it, Mandy, the more you, you make it seem like you actually are doing it and that it's not fiction. And so I talked her into it with that argument. Hmm. I guess. You're a very persuasive man. But you know, the show is not fiction. I mean, everything is fiction on some level. So you can make that claim, but the whole point of the show is that this is true, and it is. I'm gonna drink wine. There's nothing that's gonna happen because you do this, except that I won't be furious with you for the next 10 years. But anyway, I asked Asher, my lawyer friend, is Mandy right? Could they really take our children away? Yes. Really? The people who run Child Protective Services in New York City are these Haitian women. They're horrible. They're these mean, born-again Christian women who are always taking children away from their parents, especially if you're Dominican. They really don't like the Dominicans. Well, we're not Dominican. Are we safe? You look Dominican. So when we filmed Ashley, the fan with the lump, one of the things she said was, I love you. And I liked hearing this, and so I wanted her to, to say it again. And I love you, and I love you, and then I love you. And I noticed that I started having like a, a, an erection while she was saying, I love you. And I thought that was strange because I usually don't get erections from people saying, I love you. I usually get erections from, you know, something involving lust or sex. And I thought, oh, that's strange. Maybe I'm maturing or Maybe I'm just like so love starved that now that's what turns me on. I love you. And also when I first met her, she gave me flowers. Oh, Kaveh, I got you these flowers. Oh, thank you. You don't have to get me flowers. Uh, that's okay, I give them to Mandy. And I don't know flowers that well. So I was like, what kind of flowers are these? Hydrangeas. These are hydrangeas? Mm-hmm. Do you know that Wall Stevens poem? He called hydrangeas purple and they were? Uh, no, try to look it up. So actually, I looked it up. And I sent her the poem. He called hydrangeas purple, and they were. Not fixed and deadly, like a curving line that merely makes a ring. It was a purple changeable to see. And so hydrangeas came to be. And, you know, someone wants to find adultery not as having sex with somebody, but simply as doing something with somebody that you wouldn't want your significant other to know. And this kind of qualified as that, because I really didn't want Mandy to know that I was sending a poem to this girl that I got an erection during her telling me. I love you. Now, Ashley, uh, one of her, her jobs, she has a few jobs, is she does craft services at a post-production house. And when we were leaving her place, she said, So if there's anything um, you need help with for the show, just let me know. Like what kind of thing? I don't know, like craft services? And I never feed anybody. So I thought, hey, the crew would love this. Um, but I thought I should tell Mandy about this, because um, I didn't want to keep any secrets from her. Do you want to get stoned? And she took it pretty well. But then she started referring to Ashley as... The lump. So Ashley ended up doing craft services for the shoot. Okay. She got us hummus and granola bars. Also brought bananas. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And I wasn't feeling uh, aroused or, or, or intriguing or, or flirty. I was in a good place and there was no more, um, you know, flirty intrigue energy. But I did fantasize about having sex with her a few times when I was having sex with Mandy. So when I showed a cut of episode five to Aziz, the first thing he said was, What's with the swastika? So there's a scene in episode five where Sam is typing with his shirt off. You can tell it's a swastika? It looks like a swastika, yeah. Yeah, it's a swastika. So basically, a few people at Brick had complained. What's with the swastika? You can't have an actor with a swastika tattoo and not address it. Um, he's Jewish, so it's, it's like a statement. Okay, then you need to address it in the next episode. Okay. It's a 22. It, look, it looks like a swastika. It's a 22. If, if, if it was a 22, the two would, they wouldn't be right next to each other like that. It's a digital 22, but let's it looks make like, your conversation on. That was a swastika. Yeah. It's not the Nazi swastika. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. No, but the Nazi swastika is inverted. Unless you were looking in the mirror. 
Uh, that looks like a 55 to me. It does look like a 55. Right, because the other way it's a 22. So how does the Nazi one go? It goes like this, right? I don't know. Yeah, that's I, I was that's, told that... That's the swastika. There it is. It's the swastika. <laughs> okay. So, Brick has horrible promotion department. They are just terrible. They're terrible at promotion. Uh, it's true. And they, they were making the materials, and they picked this photograph of the back of my head for the poster. And I was like, what the fuck are you guys doing? We like this picture. And I was like, can I please do the poster? Do you think you can do better? Yeah, I can do better. Go ahead. But I didn't have any great ideas for, for a poster. How about if I'm just smoking a bong on a TV? Get it? Like, I'm on TV? Or what if I'm a puppet holding a puppet of me holding a puppet? So the puppet was a no, but they did like one of the bong shots and agreed to make that the poster. And they said, We're gonna put it on bus stops. But then they censored the bong. We had to cut out the bong because the bus stops don't allow bongs on the bus stop. I still don't believe that's true. Is there like a law that says no bongs on bus stop posters? Um, a bong isn't actually illegal. How much are these? So anyway, I decided to shoot a scene in front of one of the bus stop posters. So there used to be a bong here, and they, they cut it out. And also, I hated their tagline. It was like uh, the most subversive comedy on television or something. And I just hate taglines that sort of like feel boastful like that. And I had, I had much better ones, like uh, soon to be canceled. Maybe not great, but better than the most subversive comedy on television. Uh, it's not even a quote by somebody. It's just like us saying it. Um, so anyway, um, we were gonna go to the bus stop and it was, it was really cold and it was raining. And there were two bus stops and they were not too far from each other but I wasn't sure how far apart they were. And Peter said, No, it's really close, I know where it is. Yeah, but this one works. Should we really check out the other one too? Um, you know, I'm always a totalizer. Like I always want to make sure everything is as good as it can be because of some like deep, Insecurity, I think, that like I'm compensating for all the time. And it's like, it's a, it's a notion of perfection, but it's false. I mean, there is no, there is no perfection. There's no best. But so anyway, we go to this other bus stop and it's really far and it's really cold and we're carrying all this really heavy equipment and it's raining and we're late for our next shoot. And you know, you can be perfectionistic, but there's something that you're gonna be ignoring in your quest for perfection. And this is sort of the story of the show because I'm always doing this. That's why it's taking so long between episodes and why we keep having fewer and fewer viewers. So, Mandy and I got stoned recently. And while we were stoned, Mandy said to me, There's something I want to tell you, but I really do not want it to go in the show. So, can you promise me that you won't put it in the show if I tell you? Well, I won't put it in the show unless you tell me it's okay. I'm worried that you're gonna talk me into, you know, using this as material for the show later. I don't want you to listen to that Mandy. I want you to listen to this Mandy. But why would I listen to this Mandy instead of the future Mandy? Like, why trust this Mandy more than the future Mandy? I want you to promise that no matter what, you will not put this in the show. Do you promise? Okay, I promise. And she told me this, this thing that I'm not supposed to tell you. Um, and I said, you know, why don't you want me to put it in the show? And she said, Because it's my story, and I might want to tell it someday. So I was like, Okay, why don't you tell the story in the show? And that'll be the season finale. Also, you need to do a clap. Okay. So, let, step out. Okay, so, um, <sighs> okay, so I made Kave promise to, n I, I want it, okay. I hate the show. Yeah, and I kind of, I, uh, <sighs> Hands up! Hands up! Hands up!
for a, a blink moment in time. People are aware of what they're feeling every day. If you're going to restore and sustain a democracy, there must be an informed and engaged citizen. I spent two years in immigration detention. You know how much they spent to feed me for one whole day? How much? 75 cents. Immigrants as a whole, migration as a whole, is associated with lower rates of crime. Immigrants make our communities safer. What causes climate change, the selling and burning of fossil fuels, benefits most the power elite. And so they have a disincentive to address it and they have an incentive to deny it. They're not going to funnel more money into our schools. They're not going to do it unless they have to, right? And the way they have to is by our participation, our organization, us taking accountability for our actions. I've always been interested in jewelry. I wear lots of jewelry throughout like junior high school. My dad actually hated it. I would wear it, have like, you know, be 11, 12 years old, rings on every finger. I was always into metal. I didn't really understand it at that point. It wasn't until I got older when it was like, aha, that makes sense. There was like a personal epiphany that happened that I retreated into this darkness. But what I would call it was me retreating into this void. You know, there's just, there's a level of darkness that has to happen to me for creation yeah. to happen. So in that personal going into and retreating, it also reflected in my creativity because at that point of darkness, then this creation was happening. I spent a lot of time studying, researching in, in many different forms, not just like reading, but also experiencing nature and listening to a lot of music that resonates with me. I'm an artist and my medium and form of expression is um, textiles, clothing design, and building collections off of a concept. I'm also an alchemist. We're born in Brooklyn, we're first generation. Our parents aren't. So our Brooklyn is seen through a, a different scope than I think people who go back generations and generations of being in Brooklyn. And it's because the way that our mother moved us around through Brooklyn, growing up in different schools and different districts, it all sprouted for my mother like, oh, you're not gonna go to your zone school, you're not gonna go to Erasmus. You're gonna go to some school in Midwood. You know what I mean? You're gonna take a test to go into a school. It was just, I don't know, being in Brooklyn, where we were, how we were raised, our parents, and what they thought about our education, it just taught, I don't know, it just took us to a, another level. I was just reading this quote that Michael Jackson said, to be immortal is something major. He wants to live forever, so he puts a piece of his soul in all of his music and he feels it fully. And that's, I think, where immortality lies, like, too. To have that vibration and generations upon generations is not just about being rich and, and even about being so-called wealthy, but having that, that piece of your soul because your soul is immortal. So Michael Jackson, the physical sense is gone, but that's, that immortal soul is always gonna be there. So if you put your soul into it and your soul is immortal, then it makes what, you're, what you created immortal. I think every day from like the time that I wake up to the time I'm asleep, I'm either researching or thinking about the next way or phase to transform what I did yesterday into something a little more like, mm, has a little more magic in it. These things that you, you know, you walk outside and it's like a, a rush of the world happening to you. And it's, it, it, that's the same thing I think in the creative process. It's mm -hmm. like a rush of ideas that come but you still have to stay like, okay, I'm gonna breathe in, take this one. Like it's, it's almost, it's a mechanical thing, but it's like automated. Our brand is to plant the idea and bring back artisan. 
craftsmanship and also empowerment um, through our, you know, our art form. We want to empower people through connection, you know what I mean? And empower people through our work and empower them when they put a piece on, they actually feel like they have a glow, you know, or that they're receiving our energy through our pieces. It's showing that, you know, energy never dies, it's just transferred. We want to kind of bring ourselves to higher levels of understanding because the world is changing, the world is transforming. We kind of got to get with it or get lost. You right. know what I mean? Get lost in the soul. And I think what we're doing is kind of putting our input into the whole story of the earth and kind of we just want to help, you know, infinite spiritual helpers and guides and stuff like that in a nutshell. That's about it. L.E. baby. For life. Hello, we are live. It is seven o'clock right now in Brooklyn, USA. And in a few seconds, you may hear the sounds of my neighbors cheering and banging pots to thank the first responders who have been doing so much and deserve all the adulation that we can throw at them. That is the new normal as we sit here right now. Things are different, but as much as they are, some things are still the same. Thousands of you have crossed the doors at Brick House, and tonight you're in your house, and so am I, and so are the people I'm going to introduce you to in just a moment. This is the Brick Be Heard Town Hall, The Foreseeable Future. We're going to be talking to some people who make it their business to project ourselves and our culture into the future in some instances by 50 or 100 years. But right now we're challenging them to live in the most provocative space of the future, the foreseeable future, the next 12 to 24 months as they will go down here in Brooklyn and around the world. So some of you may be wondering just what is it that a futurist does? Well, one quick explanation that helped me to get to an understanding that I might be disabused of when we talk to some actual futurists tonight is this, a three-headed answer. So historians are concerned with the study of the past. 
journalists are making the reporting and showing us what's happening in the present. And futurists are people who are gathering information, analytics, and stories to tell us about where we may be going. To that service, we're going to get in some stories tonight, and we're also going to listen to some presentations by some folks that are frankly pretty smart on health, the uh, economy as it pertains to jobs, education, infrastructure, and culture. It's a lot to talk about, and we're going to rock with you for an hour now, and I'd like to introduce you to the people who are going to be helping us. This is the foreseeable future. We're going to be talking with Greg Tate first, and Mr. Tate is joining us from Harlem. We're going to be talking with him about culture. Peter Bishop is joining us from California, where he'll be talking about education. Heather McGowan is coming to us from Massachusetts and will be informing us about the future of work. Dr. Jonathan Metzel is coming all the way from his kitchen in Brooklyn. All right, BK. And finally, Cindy Frewen is coming to us from Kansas City and she's going to be speaking about infrastructure. So this is one part of the town in the town hall. The other part is of course you. So this is the moment when I'm going to encourage you to be in dialogue with us as if we were back in Brick House and I was running around with the microphone, except this time you'll be able to type your questions and direct them at our presenters who will be coming to us in five minute presentations that they pre-recorded earlier. And once those presentations are done, I'll have a little time with them before bringing everyone into the room for a large discussion with all of your questions throughout. So we're going to begin at the beginning with culture and a presentation by Greg Tate. I guess the question before us is uh, the future of culture, the Afro future of culture. I have a baseline definition of culture, which is simply what people do uh, from an anthropological perspective. That's what you're looking at is that what have people been doing to define themselves in the world as a group, as a tribe, as a village, as a nation, um, as a block, as a neighborhood, um, as a corner. And um, I think that if we're looking at this, uh, uh, this whole question of post pandemic, what is it going to become? I mean, that, that's an assumption that there is a post pandemic that doesn't take into account, um, even if we're talking about a, um, a reduction in the, um, the number of infections and number of fatalities, um, we're going to be talking about um, the culture of grieving, the culture of mourning, um, of remembrance. Um, because here in New York, um, it's very interesting. You're, you're, you're very sensitive to the fact that you're living in a parallel uh, universe or in a place that has parallel universes. There's, um, there's such wide discrepancy between how uh, this pandemic is being experienced uh, by those in shelter, those in quarantine, and then those who are on the medical front lines. And then there are the... Uh, essential workers who have to put themselves forth into the world every day. Um, in um, this situation where they're exposed to a very nasty, vicious, um, thirsty, hungry virus, um, they have to do the opposite in some cases of what everybody else has been told to do. Um, in terms of exposure to sociality. So you're also looking at the, there's, a, there's, the, there's a culture of PTSD, um, a trauma that's going to be a part of what we do um, as a nation, as a village, as a tribe, as a corner in this that has to be factored in. In terms of the expressive arts, um, we're slowly starting to see how people are um, using the mediums we have at hand. Um, their Zooms and Instagrams and Snapchats and uh, Twitches and so forth 
um, you know, uh, D Nice has brought to us this whole notion of club quarantine, um, which is turned into like quite a global club. You know, it's quite a rave online, you know, and so people have shown that um, the technology and the um, the degree to which it allows a certain amount of call and response and interactivity is uh, bringing a whole new notion of club in, to the crib, you know, into the quarantine um, sheltered uh, domicile, you know, um, and this capacity people have to kind of share themselves experiencing um, this kind of global group rave moment, you know, says something about our uh, adapt adaptability uh, to these new circumstances, you know. Um, so, and, you know, I mean, it's like when we talk post-pandemic, I mean, there's just so many levels to that because um, it makes assumptions about uh, testing and tracing and the uh, organized, sane or rational government response in different places in the world, right? And um, in America, it's it's uh, just so disturbing um, that there's so much denial going on at the same time that like bodies are like, you know, rack, you know, piling up um, in the, um, the hospitals, you know, in the mortuaries and the mass graves out there on Hunts Island, you know, um, and uh, the numbers that people know from other parts of the world you know, but there's a, there's a thing we call American exceptionalism. I call it American self-deceptionalism, um, where there's such a bubble of privilege and entitlement and, and kind of feigned innocence around what's going on anywhere outside of people's immediate circumference. Um, and so you have this uh, pandemic, which is moving in the areas, um, you know, it's kind of... Uh, slouching towards, uh, you know, the mid Midwest and, you know, um, uh, the, the cornfield states, you know, of, of America. And, um, and that's changing, you know, this culture of denial, this culture of uh, deceptionalism as well. So, I mean, all these things are on deck um, as we move, we move forward. But I feel at the same time that um, what artists are going to do with their uh, empath em empathic uh, capacities and their um, prophetic, generative, uh, expressive capacities is um, give us a sense of uh, how magnificent uh, human beings can be um, when they share their gifts for um, saying what can't be said through ideology, what can't be said through journalism, you know, when they use this, their psychic telepathic abilities to kind of reach us on these deeper inner spiritual levels, you know, so that we're really in touch with, um, you know, our, our, uh, our most um, kind of enlightened and, and uh, con cosmically and uh, socially connected selves. That was Greg Tate, the All right, we're back. That was Greg Tate, the renowned cultural critic, producer, musician, and authorian on the Afrofuture and Afrofuturism. So knowing all of that and what you're bringing in the perspective, Greg, I'm wondering how the future of right now and the foreseeable future, <laughs> especially for folks of color, may intersect with the notions that we've all developed about Afrofuturism? Well, I think that um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, Black people's powers of, of invention and reinvention and uh, this whole, uh, the whole place of conjuration in the culture, you know, of bringing together um, one's uh, expressive capacities, one's pursuit of uh, magic in execution, in expression, um, to really elevate uh, your, your community, your audience, 
um, your spectators, um, you know, um, and I think, you know, everyone is caught up, caught up in a, in a kind of limbo or kind of a lurch trying to figure out, well, how do I take this gift that I have that is so much defined by how I interact with folks in social space, you know, or how they interact with the work, um, what in the foreseeable future um, can be an altered, you know, uh, adapted platform that has the same kind of uh, efficacy, you know, uh, the same ability to create call and response, the same ability to do what, you know, we see D Nice doing. Um, yeah. uh, you know, how do you translate that to, uh, to, to other mediums, you know, while we're all in, uh, in this purgatory? And, um, and, you know, I, I, I'm pretty confident, you know, given the, uh, the astronomical degree of creativity there is in this city in particular, um, yeah. that we're going to see some very novel responses to, you know, the, the, the time of pandemic um, that kind of perform in runs around um, kind of the sterility of, um, of, our, of our teleconferencing. Well, you know, to that end, uh, I just yeah, today yeah. on the uh, the news, I just saw some artists who are going around and writing graffiti that is uh, artwork, aerosol art, not like the bad old days right. that some might think of on these right, uh, writing, as, writing, as we call and, it, you know, the, the color and the yeah. art lives in New York, even yeah. if we're confronted with plywood. Thank you for bringing yeah, yeah. that perspective. I can't wait to see you in concert with the folks who we're gonna meet just now, but we definitely appreciate you, Mr. Tate, and stick around for our All right. uh, question and answer. And I wanna encourage everyone who's watching right now that you can get in on the discussion, a la our old town halls, by going to the YouTube uh, channel and submitting a question. And I'm gonna be looking at those and asking them all night as we move on. So I'm going to pivot right now. Greg was talking about the interconnectedness and the layers of culture in the city and the ways that we're going to interact. And that blends beautifully into the next person I'm going to introduce you to. Dr. Cindy, Dr. Cindy Frewen is a futurist as well as an architect. And she teaches the Designs Future Workshop and Social Change at the University of Houston. She's also a primary in her own architectural firm and provides some strategic foresight. So Dr. Frewin, thank you for joining us tonight. And now we're going to hear her presentation on infrastructure. So when it comes to long-term thinking about cities, we actually have to divide it up in a couple of different eras. And what we call those is um, horizon, three horizons. And these are three different kinds of scenarios, three different ways of thinking about the future. The first one that I think about is the longest term, and that's sort of the blue skies, and it's called the third horizon. Then there's today's thinking, and that is the first horizon. That's what we're doing to make you know, ends meet, what we're doing to survive today. And with COVID, that's been totally disrupted. In between is the second horizon, which are the strategists, the ideas that link and bridge the first and the third horizon. During the concept of a pandemic, we actually are transforming the future and we just don't know it. Healthcare, we've been talking about economics today. We're talking, I'm thinking about cities and they are accumulation of all of those different things. That creates a system. A uh, system means that there's interlocking dynamic parts and when there's interlocking dynamic parts, change is not on a linear, change is in emergent and it comes about in ways that are unexpected and unpredictable and most importantly, uncertain. Innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. Maybe we're sheltering at home, but we're more connected than ever in many ways. So you have to look at both the good side and the bad side. And one of the good things has been this slowing down, getting in touch with our families, getting in touch with our neighbors, people that are near us. And some places have allowed that, have enabled it better than others. Cities change really slowly, I have to say. Even if you're thinking about immediate plans, that can take 25 years to actually come to, to fruition. It takes a long time for a building cycle. And so I like to think in terms of 2,500 and, 21, and 2,100. 
a 50 and 100 year plan. The long view gives you a chance to incorporate a lot of different possibilities. The digital, the AI futures have sped up. Technology has sped up tremendously. So how can you change your lifestyle to use the screens? In fact, I'd say my safest mask and yours too is this screen. I don't have to wear a mask at this time. This is the safest place for me to be. How can the city be automated? Think about how it's getting automated. I've seen pictures or, and of people that, of, of uh, senior living facilities in Belgium where they're, they have little robots with the iPads on the face of them and it's the family on the iPad being uh, sent around the, the visiting with the person that lives there. Um, how do you get in touch? How do you use the screens to get in touch with people? We'll use that innovation to create a new future. It's very possible that there's a number of, of facilities that are gonna be empty after this. How do those get reused? Are they just gonna be these 70 story vacant buildings? Or are you going to be looking at, or and as the warehouses have been and now become housing, what are you going to do with the buildings that end up no longer being useful the way they were? I really believe that we have had industrialized cities forced upon us that we do not need anymore. And this is an opportunity that we rethink how they work in order to make it more functional and less of a stress on our lives. Industrial era is that we use things for, for, for consumption. This has been an era of consumption. And in fact, you can change that around for production. How do you make your life into a place that's producing? Was it whether it's food or things? You've seen it with the masks. How can you make a place that's more environmentally conscious, whether that's energy or saving water, or using rainwater, and becoming more of a producer than a, than a consumer? How do you make community spaces more safe and more useful and more beautiful than parks, the sidewalks, the streets? These workplaces, think about whether or not you really need to be in the workplace or how can you share without contaminating? We've had online doctor's appointments. We're having curbside doctor's appointments. What if waiting rooms end up being in your, in your vehicle or at the bus stop? What if in fact you're no longer going inside the waiting rooms because they're no longer safe? What are we wearing? That's the next level that you're reaching out. What are, we, what are our houses like? What are our neighborhoods like? What are our cities like? And finally, what is your position in the online global world? Because in fact, as everybody's been going online, you have an opportunity. There's many opportunities for new voices and new people to emerge. And that's what's happened. Leadership and vision create change in cities. If we, in fact, are full of urgency, but it's urgency for today, but instead we parlay it into urgency for long term, so in fact it's purposeful action, the things that we're doing are purposeful, then you have a message, then you have a place at the table, and that's how you create new voices. So I'm back and we're welcoming Dr. Cindy Frowen into the room all the way from Kansas City. So we have a, an interesting question about infrastructure and looking at the ways that we may ourselves come back. If New York City is really defined in a lot of ways by the concentration of its people and its street life, is there a way that the city is going to come back in a way that is open and uh, not going to be resistant to a change in culture, doctor? Looking at the way that New York is so concentrated and people are thick, what's the quickest way to build ourselves back into society? I think what you're asking is, will our cities fit this new way of a safer, but still connected world? And how do we feel comfortable and safe enough to go out into the world uh, without rebuilding everything? And you know, at the first line of defense has got to be science. We have, I mean, I have great faith that they will cure this with a vaccine, but we do have a two to three or even five year period that the city itself or our, our, our lifestyles, our choices, our behavior make a difference. So 
New York is so dense. And some people like to say, well, that's just not going to work anymore. It's not safe. I would disagree because I think we have to learn and children are better at learning this than uh, adults, certainly older adults are better. They're better at immediately saying, hey, don't go close to each other. They're better at saying, we have to stay apart like this and they'll correct us. And that means that we have to learn new behaviors and because people do desire social lives and they have, we desire being near each other and we do better when we're near each other. We are more creative when there's a density. We are more innovative. We do more things. We have more, uh, uh, to use the term magic, we have a better uh, society because we're closer together. In most cases, of course, there's a downside of that as well. But I think that we're going to have to readjust because of it. And there's a, so much unused space in the city. I believe that we can still do it. We over, you know, we, 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 for every place that we are sitting, there's probably seven or 10 other places that we could be that are empty while we're sitting here. And Got so it. if we can just resort how we're using everything, then things will start to make sense again and still be safe. Safe and uh, working. Thank you for that. We'll be speaking with you very soon. Thanks, doctor. So I'm going to now turn to another doctor who uh, is in Brooklyn, but he makes his way down to uh, Tennessee a lot. Uh, doctor, where are you? Dr. Jonathan Metzel, come on into the room and let the folks see you. He's a professor of sociology and medicine, health and society and the director for the Center for Medicine, Health and Society at Vanderbilt University and he made this presentation for us on the future of healthcare. Hello, Brooklyn, I'm Jonathan Metzel. I'm the director of the Center for Medicine, Health and Society at Vanderbilt University, and also believe it or not, a Brooklyn resident. Uh, I've been through the pandemic here in, in Clinton Hill, and, um, and like everyone, the, the idea of imagining a future that is beyond the pandemic sound, sounds great because then we can imagine what's coming next. I'm a doctor and a sociologist and my work looks at race and infrastructure and healthcare. And I've really been thinking a lot over the course of this pandemic about the problems that got us into this horrible situation and about how things can change when we come out of it. I think one of the main issues of course is that all of the countries in the world right now are facing the same problem, this, this same coronavirus. And it's been interesting for me to look around the world at the ways that different societies deal with, deal with this and, and the ways that um, some societies do better and others do worse. I will say that one of the most important factors um, is a functioning healthcare system, right? People have access to healthcare, people have access to treatment. Um, and that it's an equitable healthcare system. So it's not just that wealthy people can get to the doctor, but other people can't. Uh, so number one is I'm hoping that we can learn that lesson. Um, I know that that's been in the air, questions of Medicare for all and other factors like that, whatever you wanna call it. But I would say that this pandemic has highlighted the profound inequality of access to healthcare that really is a risk factor just like the virus itself. Um, so. Number one is that I hope we come out of this with a much more equitable healthcare system. I think we see the downside of not doing that, which is um, not only, of course, the very disparate rates of illness and death that we have right now in this country, minoritized populations, uh, low-income populations are dramatically, dramatically more at risk. Um, and so I just think that that is an unsustainable system, an unsustainable uh, uh, framework for our country. And so, first of all, I hope we come out of this with a much more equitable healthcare system. The second part that I think we've recognized, again, given the profoundly incommensurate rates of death in, in particularly um, African American and Latinx populations, um, is, is that um, this illness is not just a medical illness. It's also a social illness. It's also a political illness because the people who are at risk now, it's not like they're biologically at risk. It's not like there's some kind of genetic reason they're at risk. They're at risk because they, they live in an in insecure housing situation or a, a, um, you know, a very dense housing situation. They, live, they have jobs um, where they have to go out and put themselves at risk being in, in, in particular kinds of jobs. They live in, network, uh, in neighborhoods that, that have... Uh, 
infrastructure that has not been adequately taken care of. And so I think the other issue is we've got to fix these kind of social inequities in this country. Um, and, and of course, that is horrific and, and deadly for people who live in, in, in low income areas. As we're seeing here, the virus really preys on on on, on social infrastructure that has not been taken care of. And I think we need a, a dramatic national effort um, to, to address that infrastructure, but also look, look at this virus, look at this pandemic. Um, the, virus, um, the virus keeps spreading until we put it out in everybody, right? And so it's also important for the country that we address these social inequities. So number two is to address the underlying social issues. And of course, we've seen that particularly in places like Brooklyn, where the people who were already at risk before the virus become more at risk um, afterwards. And number three, uh, I think one great thing about New York is, is solidarity. And I, and I think part of achieving the first two points is linked to point number three, which is I think the solidarity that the city has shown in, in, in many ways compared to other parts of the country has been, has been remarkable in some ways. And I think that in a way, what can we do to encourage solidarity among people between networks? And, and I'm hoping that that will be um, one of the one of the one of the resonant points from this pandemic. Because I think what we've realized is, believe it or not, and this is a wake up call for a lot of people to show just how interconnected how interconnected that we all are. We're all in the same networks, even though there, of course, are a lot of um, economic disparities um, that need to be addressed. But you know, public transportation and food, delivery, networks, things people never thought about before. So I think what can we do to bolster solidarity would be, would be I think, another important factor. I think information going forward is going to need to be reconfigured. I just personally think I'm somebody who studies race and, and I feel like dismayed that the voices of medical authority, of public health authority, um, which have their own problematic histories of race and racism in this country. But at a time like this, there's such a hunger for just what's the right information? What's the right, what's the right treatment? What's the right practice? Should I stand six feet away from somebody? Should I wear a mask? And I feel like those messages have been so easily co-opted by divisive messages. Um, and so I think that in, in a way, um, fixing the it kind of infor, information infrastructure, it, it creating ways that, uh, that information is democratic, particularly health information, fixing the ways that, um, that can, the voices of communities uh, can be, the voices of communities can be heard, um, and that there can be kind of a, a more democratic way to get out trusted information, um, not just about health and illness, but also about the structural factors that I, I was talking about earlier. Um, I guess, you know, I, I guess just as a doctor, the last point I, I would say is that I think that there really needs to be a reckoning about race and, and racism in medicine. I think this two-tiered healthcare system that we have is a result of misplaced values in the healthcare system itself. And so really bringing to bear all the great anti-racist work that's been done by Abraham Kendi and other people or people who critique what sociologists call kind of racial capitalism really thinking very hard about what would it mean to have a truly racially equitable healthcare system, public health system. I think that that would be an, an, important, an important move for an important stance for medicine, just given, again, the disparate rates of death that, that have happened here and really what those reflect about the society that we've created. Um, and you know, I, I think you know, maybe that sounds pie in the sky, but I would say that I've been you know, believe it or not, I mean, we've, we've been doing these webinars here from Brooklyn about what's called structural competency, this new way that we can bring medicine together with public health, with critical race studies. Um, and, and, and we've had thousands of people show up, doctors, um, nurses, uh, healthcare workers from across the world, really, because I think, you know, medical workers are tired of this system as well. And so I do see that from this moment of pain, from this moment of despair, there really is a possibility for, for, for recreating for recreating change. Um, I guess finally I'll say that there are a lot of just practical matters um, you know, that would be involved in creating structural change um, that's more equitable. Um, think about, for example, telemedicine right now, this idea that we're going to be seeing our doctors over the internet. Well, everybody needs everybody needs the internet <laughs> in that case. Um, 
food distribution. Some, some communities are really struggling to get food um, more than others. How can we fix the, the food networks, um, access to pharmaceuticals, things like that. So I would hope that what we come out of this um, it with it is a, a much more resilient system and one that doesn't leave us quite as vulnerable. And finally, just a note of thanks to everyone um, in, in my community here in Brooklyn and in Brooklyn more broadly, it really the power of feeling um, everyone kind of going through this together in different ways has been, I think, one of the more empowering uh, aspects of this, of this horrible pandemic. A lot, a lot to digest there, Dr. Metzl, and we're going to mix it up. Some great questions came in during your presentation. But uh, just in the spirit of moving things along, I'm going to ask you a yes or no question as we're halfway through our time right now on the foreseeable future. So I want to ask, in that spirit of solidarity that you spoke about, do you think that this pandemic is the moment where this is going to be the before and after where folks do come together? Short answer. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. We'll digest a little more later. But right now, we're going to do something that is very foremost, very foremost in a lot of people's minds right now. As we're a few weeks away from the first of the month, the future of work. Heather McGowan is one of the foremost experts on the future of work and where it is that we're going. And she prepared this presentation. My name is Heather McGowan. I'm going to give you a quick overview of how I see the future of work. So how I see the future of work, I've really codified in this book that recently came out with my co-author Chris Shipley called The Adaptation Advantage, which Thomas Friedman from the New York Times generously wrote the foreword. So we're There's at home. One. So we are having the greatest leaps in human longevity at the same time that we're having the greatest velocity of change, primarily driven by technology. So for example, if you were born back when the steam engine came out, life expectancy was 37. So you had two and a half generations to absorb the impact of that paradigm shifting change. Fast forward to today, life expectancy closer to 90, two, three, four, five different paradigm shifts within a single generation, depending on your age, we're not prepared for that. This velocity of technology-driven change is accelerating, whereas it's meeting this tension with human adaptation, which has long been linear and at a slower pace. Although a couple of months ago, something came into play, uh, the coronavirus, which I think is actually an accelerant to our digital transformation, which is really human transformation. And if you zoom in on that, um, it's really only been 57 days since the World Health Organization declared it a global pandemic. And in that 57 days, and in fact, really in the first two weeks, we've made dramatic changes about how we work, where we work, who works, and what we do. Um, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic on March 11th. So on March 10th, we've moved from as many people working from home as possible, which is, could be anywhere from 29% to 30% of our uh, workforce. Uh, work becomes dangerous for people for whom it wasn't dangerous before. Uh, restaurant workers, uh, healthcare workers, uh, grocery store workers, and delivery drivers now put their life in their hands, bus drivers. Um, companies have rapidly pivoted what they do, product lines from uh, alcohol and perfumes to hand sanitizer, from fashion to per personal protective equipment, from cars to ventilators. We have reworked processes, remapped supply chains, any parent out there, my God, you're now a full-time teacher. That is a tremendous amount of work. And leaders out there managing teams now have established trust and psychological safety for their teams to be successful working remotely. And visionary CEOs who are heads of companies that for one reason or another can't operate their business right now have said, wait a second, what are we good at and where's the need and how quickly can we pivot? That is a tremendous amount of adaptation in a very, very short period of time. And what we're coming out of is what I call the old promise, where education, career, and retire existed in discrete bands. Whether you went to university or not, it was the first third of your life, sufficient only to get you on the career ladder, collect a pension, and by design, die a year later. Success measures here to be codify and transfer the right predetermined skills and existing knowledge you need to get you on that escalator. Now it looks more like this, 
Life expectancy may not be 90 yet, but it will be soon. Education becomes learning to imply there's no end state to that. Uh, work becomes leverage of that learning to indicate that work and learning are a combined act. And longevity becomes a reality because we didn't plan for or save for, nor can we afford cognitively or financially a 30 year retirement. And it looks more like this. There's an engage, there's an, a relationship between our engagements, which could be all within a job, but they're tours of duty where we work on projects over periods of time that integrate learning and leveraging together, we remain engaged. And our success measures there are, can we learn, adapt, and create new value continuously? Because I say in the past, we learned once in order to work. Now we work in order to continuously learn. In the past, our identity was bestowed upon us, externally validated, whether it was your trade union, your degree, your title, your company. Some of those things can be taken away from you where there's more resilience and agility in a self-actualized, internally validated identity connected to your purpose. Because where we are today is we're standing on the edge of a raging river. We've been wandering down a path. It's been great for some, not great for others, but on the edge of the river, this beat lays bare our, our um, inequities of society. And we need to cross this river, but all we can see are the swirling eddies that we think might kill us. And what we fail to see is on the other side of the river, the, the grass may be greener, the paths may be better. Not only that, we've already started this process of crossing, crossing the liver, river. We flatten the curves. We have adapted rapidly, as I mentioned in the beginning, to different types of where we work and how we work and who works. And we're going to get to the other side where I think things might just be better. So that's how I see the future work in, a, in about five minutes. And I, wanna, I look forward to having a discussion with you so we can expand on, on this topics and well as others. Again, my name is Heather McGowan, and that's my quick synopsis on the future work. Thanks. And Heather McGowan is with us right now. I'm going to also be very unfair to you and ask you a short question. Some economists have estimated that New York City is set to lose about 1.2 million jobs by the end of this month. Most of them, what they classify as low-wage jobs in restaurants, retail, or transportation. How many of those jobs of the 1.2 million do you think are going to be lost to the old world versus post-COVID-19? I have no way of knowing. I don't have a crystal ball, but I am encouraged by the fact that we're no longer calling those low wage, low skill jobs and we're calling them frontline workers and essential workers. I think the virus may very well change our settlement patterns. It's certainly going to change what work looks like and we need a massive reskilling and upskilling so more people can find meaningful work that aligns with their purpose. Asked and answered. Thank you so much for that. And we'll be talking to you shortly. Sure. Appreciate the emphasis on work in that shifting landscape. And now for our final presentation, here is Dr. Peter Bishop on the future of education. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you here in the, in the Brick TV town hall uh, in our virtual environment. Uh, not exactly town halls the way we used to have them, but uh, we're learning as we go. Uh, my name is Peter Bishop and I'm a futurist. Uh, the title of this is The Foreseeable Future, and uh, as a futurist, I have to tell you that uh, we don't really do uh, predictions about what's foreseeable. We do scenarios because we believe that the future, particularly the long-term future, and indeed the future we're dealing with right now, is highly uncertain, and therefore to say what will happen would be, we believe, incorrect. And therefore, I'm going to talk a little bit about what could happen or what might happen. We've got two, we call these the dimensions of uncertainty, and I'll just focus on two because we have a short period of time. First of all, how big will this uh, change be? Will we snap back to education as it was before, or will we actually transform education to a new normal, something that we have never seen before? That's one big question, and we don't know the answer to that. Is it, is it possible to believe in a snapback in, given the size of this disruption? Well, it's happened before. The most recent one was the 2009 recession. Uh, we thought it was the biggest, and it was the biggest uh, downturn in the economy since the Great Depression almost 100 years ago. 
and yet things returned after a while, and it took some time, but things pretty much returned to normal. And in the last few years before the virus, we had a bigger economy almost than ever before. And so snapback is a definite scenario. It could go back to the way things used to be before. The opposite side, of course, is that this is a transformative event, that this event will change education and enter into a new era, an era that we've not seen before. We hope that may happen because there's a lot of things about the old education system that we didn't particularly like. There was a lot we did like, certainly familiar. We knew how to do it, but we're learning new things. And has that happened before? Well, of course. The biggest example, of course, is the internet, which comes along in the 1990s, uh, does arrive slowly. It wasn't this sudden, but of course, it's a disruption in communication and almost everything we do in education, in life, in business, uh, that has transformed everything. So could we have a transformation after this uh, disruption? Absolutely. So the way we think of this as a futurist, as a continuum, snap back to exactly what it was before? Probably not. Transform to the utopian future of what we all wish it were? Well, probably not that either. Somewhere in between is where the foreseeable future for education is, but we don't know where exactly that in between happens is, how much snapback, how much transformation. The other big question is whether we like what will occur and be permanently established if there is this new era. Obviously, it could be uh, worse. In other words, we could have a, an education system that has downsides in which students who have been out of school for so long, particularly students who need pretty much uh, teacher contact, a lot of teacher contact, they may get behind in their studies and therefore not do as well. School districts which are dependent on state sales tax or, or property values may see a diminution in their funds and their resources, and they will have to cut back a great deal as well. And finally, uh, we have uh, the fact that educators themselves might be basically so disrupted by this is that they snap back to they basically recreate the old system. And, uh, and that is not exactly what we're talking about. Could there be something better? Well, the better may actually be solving some of those conditions and those issues that we really didn't like much before. How disengaged particularly high school and college undergraduates were in their studies. How much college students were paying for their college education. And the fact that teachers were still relying largely on textbooks, trying to get across content, information, which now is almost immediately accessible on their smartphones. So what's, how do we summarize these? Well, talking about snapback and the downsides, we know that already. We don't really have to talk about it much. But I think there are two things that are going on today, more or less by requirement, that could change education. The first, of course, is a much greater use of technology. Fundamentally, the only way that teachers and students can interact these days is through technology, whether through Zoom or Google Docs or uh, Google Spreadsheets or however they choose to do it. They are, now we have required for at least the, the rest of this school year and maybe next, a mediated form of communication. That I think will force some teachers to assess, reassess how they've used technology in the past. There may be some advantages to mediated communication that they didn't see before. I had a colleague who did her re dissertation research on something called, she called the CAP gap, CAP, K-A-P, Knowledge, Attitude, Performance. She did a survey of community college instructors and asked them how much they knew about information technology in the classroom. Oh, a lot. What did they think of it? Great deal, it's great. How much did they do? Not much at all. A lot of knowledge, a lot of attitude, not much performance. And now we have some more performance, so we could see more and better use of technology in education in the future. The other thing that's required students to do and teachers to allow to happen is more independent learning. Students can't be in touch with a teacher 50 minutes a day. Some are doing very well with that being more creative, learning on their own, and some obviously not so good. The future, foreseeable future, is that maybe we realize that education 
is not so much like building a building where you have to do everything. You have to mail all the, nail all the boards together, mix the concrete and lay it down, put up the walls and the roof and everything has to be done. It's maybe more like growing a garden or even raising a child where there is, a, there is among young people and the rest of us an intrinsic capacity and a desire to learn. The teacher's job, therefore, is not to pour the material into the student's head, but to set up the conditions, like the garden. Once the conditions are set, then learning takes place and the flowers bloom. That would be both of those, I think, very interesting and basically beneficial uses in the future of education. These things are not going to happen by themselves, however. If, they are, if we are to move in those directions, people who realize the benefits of a good and effective use of technology and giving students more freedom and more ability to create and, and, to, and to create their own learning are two outcomes of this future, preferred future, the uto uh, semi-utopian future. Is it foreseeable? Well, of course it is, but so are some of the other scenarios. So keep talking about the scenarios, keep talking about stories, keep telling stories, both downsides and upside stories about what might occur. And I look forward to the discussion in the, in the town hall following this presentation. Thank you very much for listening. So you won't have to wait very long. I'm gonna invite each of our panelists to uh, turn on their cameras right now and let's engage as a community. There were some questions that were pouring in as each of you were, uh, your presentations were being shown. And there was one that is so applicable because there's so many intersections between each of your respective fields and presentations that I wanted to pose to all of you. How can we reach across the quote, bubbles of privilege to combat structural disparities? And we've seen those disparities come to play with the way we work and the shifting of the language to recognize those folks on the front lines of work. We've seen it come to play in education. We've certainly seen it come to play in terms of health disparities and the built environment. So do I have any takers for how we might be able to reach across that bubble of privilege to really make those changes for the world we want to see post COVID? Well, you know, one area we didn't talk about was the future of governance, you know, particularly when we're looking at the most massive collapse, you know, of competent leadership, you know, um, in addressing, in managing a crisis that I've probably seen in my, in my lifetime, you know, because of how the way in which um, our politics now has just degenerated the capacity for coordination, for coherence. And in its place, we get this chaos and helter skelter and um, kind of people left randomly um, to the devices of, of the competence or incompetence of their local or state governance, right? And um, so, and I think on it's, that a, it's, speed, it's a very to... difficult. Yeah, yeah. You go ahead. No, I, I was just thinking regardless of what your political affiliation or what you think of the respected leadership, wherever you may be, from each of your perspectives, looking at the very near future and further out into that 100, 200 year era span, how much does leadership matter? Well, governance matters, right? Because you're, you're looking at a situation, you're looking at situations where with a stroke of a pen, um, the dispensation of, of human rights and of resources and of wealth redistribution can break down along these kind of toxic partisan lines. Like the people who are the least equipped, the least educated, the least capable of guiding a nation through this crisis yeah. are really the ones who have their hands on the wheel, you know? So and I don't think we figured out a way to address that yet. I'm thinking Heather and Cindy looking at the way that we look at the environment right now, and you're talking about infrastructure projects that may take a generation to come to fruition, or these changes that have been accelerated by this virus, does the person who's leading right now for this blip of time matter, looking at those long range things? I think some of it is when that blip ends, which I hope is soon, like November, <laughs> to be honest. Um, 
But I think one of the things when it comes to when it comes to work in more inclusion and more human potential is we've got to move education from being a weight to propel it. Um, we have made education a for-profit business in this country, much like healthcare, to our detriment. And Cindy, I know you uh, are very concerned with the infrastructure and the built environment, and you said the culture changes before the the buildings adapt to us. So there's really a couple of levels. One is the system level. How do you make change initially? And that ha has to do with then leadership and getting people together to find the systems level changes that can be made at the same time during the conversation of figuring out what to do that the conversation involves beliefs and values and where there's common ground, where things can be changed in multiple domains simultaneously. That's how you make a system change is that instead of one big home run, it's a lot of different things on a lot of different levels. And the only way to do that, as you said, is through the leadership and what are the stories that are being told? What are the beliefs that are being impacted? What are the, what are the ways that people will change their minds through uh, into a whole new paradigm, into a new shift. I think that you start with the leadership and the leadership now has been, uh, let's say, confusing at, at best. And that means that there has been this war almost among the various states and at various leaders across domains. Um, how does that instead be put in a cooperative spirit, a spirit of belief that we can find something better out of this because there was in every other case I can almost think of when we said we had an opportunity for transformational change in recent years we haven't been taking it and that requires this vision this urgency which is already built in and the leadership um, coming together. So Dr. Bishop and Heather this is sort of a double-headed question that came in from someone saying if presumably this distance education and online and homeschooling is going to be our new normal for the foreseeable future, what kind of ways will work and society have to adapt for folks who have to make money and educating their children and homeschooling? Um, I think we might have to look at jobs having, you know, flexibility in terms of hours. Like you may be working in the morning for your company, in the afternoon you should be teaching your kids. You might be working um, early evening for your company, but your company has to understand that your family comes first. And I think that we can get, if we don't have commuting hours, and if we focus on the things that really need to get done, we might be able to get them all in there. But I think back on your, just on your point before that about leadership, one of our biggest problems in this country has been a me we problem. In uh, September, October, you might not have cared if your Uber driver had health insurance or paid sick leave. But in May, you sure do, because their health is your health. And the more we can see the interconnectedness of each other, we might make better me we decisions. We've got a leader right now who sees the world as a, a zero sum game, and he's only winning if somebody else is losing. And that is faulty logic. And we need to get more people to understand that. Like talking about the infrastructure pro projects being a bunch of small little wins, they all begin with leadership and painting a picture of a world that doesn't exist yet, that has a place for all of us where we is stronger than any of the individual me perspectives. Yeah, Brian, uh, the, 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 the phrase that comes to mind is from John Gardner from the mid 20th century, who said, uh, we are the people we've been waiting for. Uh, we really can't wait for some savior, some uh, person to come in or leader to come in. Leaders are absolutely important, but so is everybody else. And what I think of right now is more about community. I don't think, I, I, Heather's right. I mean, our leadership, particularly in Washington, is all about ourselves, but that's also cultural. They were not elected by, by, by a bolt of lightning. It's that our society has become atomized into a sense of individuals. And that I, I hear people inching towards a little bit better sense of community. And I think mask wearing is an interesting signal of that culturally, Gregory, that I'm not wearing the mask for me, I'm wearing it for you. I'm signaling that I care about myself, 
but I also care mm -hmm. about you. And if we could approach our schools, our cities, our infrastructure, our health care, more as a sense of we are, we are in this together. We are not completely atomized, single, competitive individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we have to simply uh, not be charged, which none of us are, but start acting that way and start electing people and start participating where we can. And I think local politics and state politics is probably the place to start there. And with the stories we have. No. Dr. Metzl. Say again. Well, I, I would just say that, you know, I agree with everybody that the system we have now is unsustainable. I mean, yesterday, um, you know, in Chicago, they tried to open a, a Ford uh, automotive plant um, and it was a big, big reopening and, and it stayed open for one day and then and then turned out they didn't protect the workers and the, and the plant had to close again. So the, the model of kind of thinking about this two tiered health network and not protecting everyone adequately, it's just it's, it's just not sustainable. It, it's not going to work in this model. And so this idea of choosing between health and and the economy um, is, is, you know, you, you need. You need efficient public health for everyone in order to sustain the economy, and I think that the societies that figure that out um, are going to are going to come out of this the best in, in the long run. I think the idea of just throwing people back out there as fodder um, is not going to work. And so I, I ultimately think, you know, Trump, among all the all the failings, is promoting this idea that it's either the economy or health, and and I think it's really that binary that is is so false and one that we have to reject because if we don't start protecting everybody's public health, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna have an economy really. Yes, thank you so much, Brian, and thank you for doing this. And all of your guests, some amazing panelists who are here as they talk about what the 2020 presidential election means to the borough of Brooklyn. And Brooklyn is the microcosm of the entire country. And let's be clear, no matter what happens in uh, November on election day, it is not the ending, it's just the beginning. Uh, the conditions we have been living under came long before the current president uh, it has been here for a long time. The inefficiencies have basically led to inequalities across our entire country and our bor borough. But I'm proud of the over 100,000 Brooklynites leading the entire city who turned out for early voting. Uh, we are fighting to really save our country. When you look at the infrastructure, $16 billion in MTA capital needs, 9,000 families, individual, 9,000 individuals who are impacted by lead and NYCHA, 
over proliferation of gun violence. Every night we're hearing of those Southern state guns playing out on our street corners in our community, the issues around law enforcement abuse, uh, women rights issues uh, that we're going to face with the rights of women to decide what they're going to do with their bodies and the rights of LGBTQ to decide who they're going to marry and love. These are important issues and I'm hoping tonight that your listeners will understand that we must be fully engaged as your panelists talk about their points of views and their decision. It is all right. We don't have to speak in one tone and one voice, but we have to agree that this country must be open to everyone to participate and have a true understanding of what it is to be part of a dream that has lived out as a nightmare for far too many Americans and Brooklynites on the whole. Thank you again, Brian, for hosting this. Brick has been a leading voice around these important topics, and I'm really pleased that I'm able to give you opening comments. <laughs> As, as evidenced by historic levels of early voter turnout, civic engagement is at an all-time high. For many communities here in Brooklyn, the need to be heard during the 2020 presidential election cycle may feel like a matter of life and death. We watch the news and the debates, yet still find ourselves asking, what does the national election have to do with us? The 91-year-old grandmother of the producer of this very show tonight is in Clinton Hill, sharing that she's never lived through anything as intense as the current climate right here in the US. Amid a global pandemic, she is more than committed than ever to casting her ballot in this presidential election, albeit an absentee ballot via postal mail sent two weeks ago. We are in what many hope is a once in a lifetime moment. This evening, we're sharing that moment with you. In our own version of the smoke-filled back room, convening a Brooklyn caucus to examine the issues most pressing in our borough and establish Brooklyn's political platform. Now for the next 90 minutes, let's craft the agenda that best represents Brooklyn. I'll be relying on your input and working through the issues with our invited panel, which I'm so happy to introduce to you right now. Here with us this evening in the room via Zoom or whatever platform you're watching is Mahogany L. Brown, author, organizer, and educator, one of our favorite multi-hyphenates who hosts the most popular night in Brooklyn at the Brooklyn Poetry Slam right at Brick House. Thank you for being with us tonight, Mahogany. We're also happy to welcome into our discussion, Michelle De La Uz, the Executive Director of the Fifth Avenue Committee, a tremendous organization serving more than 5,500 low and moderate income folks all throughout our area. I'm also happy to have Ray Gomes here tonight. Ray is a food justice activist organizer and writer and the community health network manager at the Red Hook Initiative. Great to see you tonight, Ray. And an old friend of the network, Randy Pierce, so happy to have you back on our airwaves again. Randy is here tonight in his capacity as the president and CEO of the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. And with that brings decades of workforce and economic development experience and expertise to our borough and the world. Thanks for joining us, Randy. And Nadia Lopez, the Lopez Effect founder is here. She's an educator and educational activist and a former principal at the much lauded Mott Hall Bridges Academy in Brooklyn. So glad to see you on the airwaves in Brooklyn again, Ms. Principal Lopez, thanks for joining us. So this is our panel tonight. This is our community and we're going to be working through some issues. Now we are working with one conceit. We know that we've seen you standing in line waiting to vote as the borough president said, at least 100,000 of us voted early already. Knowing that all of these issues are of supreme importance to Brooklyn. We've been out on the street as well as polling the folks who I just introduced you to. 
to ask them what they see as the issues that are driving Brooklyn forward and really making us come to the polls, come to community board meetings, school board meetings, block club meetings, any kind of meeting that you can have when activists are called, Brooklynites are showing up, knowing that there is a hierarchy of need and knowing that there's also only so many hours in the day. So tonight we've come to a bargain. We're bringing six issues to the front and asking each of our panelists to sort of give us a full view to decide which of the three issues will make it to the main planks of the Brooklyn platform as we look at what it could mean to be the Brooklyn for president. So as I said, we were out on the streets and we got some idea about what folks were interested in. And we're gonna be sharing some of those things with you throughout the night. But to begin, we're going to be looking at the issue of education and infrastructure and the economy. So on that speed, let's make sure that you are heard. Make sure that you're commenting on whatever platform you're watching us in. And we'll be incorporating those comments and questions for our panelists and everyone at home. But we did do some homework out on the street, finding out what people were interested in talking about and what they would do if they were elected president. Have a look. My name is Emily. I'm from Park Slope, Brooklyn. Um, if I were president, I would make public education much stronger than it is now so that every kid had an equal opportunity to have the best education possible. So that was just a little bit about education, a cursory glance at one of the most pressing issues, especially as we're going into new realm of things and facing educational challenges that we couldn't have anticipated just a few months ago. And there happens to be someone here, of course, who has a vested interest in education and even founded a new outlook, Nadia Lopez. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself right now and tell us why education deserves to be the central plank on this Brooklyn platform. Hi, Brian, it's so good to see you and I'm excited to be on this panel with so many dynamic um, speakers. But listen, you know, for me, Brooke, um, education is everything. Education is the hub of the community. And even right now, as we sit in the midst of a pandemic, when the schools close, the entire world had to stop, right? And that spoke volumes about how important our education system is, but also how broken it is because our children weren't prepared to be online. Our educators weren't prepared to teach online. Um, we know that there are going to be people who are gonna talk about various parts that seem important and they are in terms of this national election. But for those children who lacked housing securities, who were living in homeless shelters, who were living in temporary housing, it was nearly impossible to get them the Wi-Fi, the technology that they needed, the access on time so that they could be on board. Um, when we think about the fact that healthcare is a number one issue, myself included, um, the reason why I even had to take a step back and resign from my position is because of the fact that all the stress related things that I went through at work, I was not allowed um, the opportunity of getting the best health care because I was forced to stay in Brooklyn. And I, I got to see a bird's eye view of what the disparities are in our health care system. And the first thing that I thought of was all of my children who go through these um, different clinics who have to see these different doctors who take who don't take them into consideration. I've been to too many funerals with too many parents or too many parents who have died because of lack of education. We need to prioritize teaching in our schools about health and nutrition, not through health classes, but actually teaching our children, just not, not making hydroponic um, uh, a club. It needs to be part of the mandatory curriculum. We need to teach our children the importance of eating greens and teaching them how to cook them. Because it's one thing to have the conversation, but many of them don't cook them. We had to open up and create our own garden at our school. By doing that, we were able to teach our children about the various types of ways that they can plant things and the things that they could cook. Something as simple as squash. There were... Um, seniors at a senior center. I remember uh, this senior, she was 93 years old. And when she saw the squash, she started to cry. 
And I, I, I couldn't understand what, why was she was so emotional. And she said to me, baby, I haven't seen this since I was in North Carolina 50 years ago. Wow. And for many of our families that we sent home squash so that the kids could cook at home, they, the parents sent it back. And they said to me, Ms. Opus, we don't know how to cook this. Like you sending us stuff that we don't eat in our household. So we had to start creating a curriculum where we have to teach our children about health and nutrition in a different way. Because Brownsville is one of the poorest neighborhoods in New York City, we made it mandatory that our children learn about entrepreneurship and financial literacy, right? It's mandatory, it's not an option because we understand that in, with situations in terms of poverty, when our children lack the knowledge of creating right? As opposed to being the consumers, they need to be producers. We change the trajectory of what can happen to them in their future. And as to, in terms of our, um, we're in a moment of a racial uprising, right? There's a lot of tension, but it's also because our education system lacks the audacity to teach history as it's supposed to be taught. Um, not just making the black experience about slavery and the civil rights movement, but really teaching about our teaching our children about they come from revolutionaries. They come from individuals who have made significant changes and have developed resilience, right? And if we teach them those things, then we have a different outlook for our children and their future. So for me, education is where we need to make the most impact because not only when we teach a child are we changing their future, but we're also changing the landscape of an entire family and generations to come. So I know we just have, uh, in the interest of equal time before we go to the next subject, I wanted to ask you about one thing from education that should fall away that we don't want to bring with us onto the platform because everyone might not have the same idea of what constitutes an education right now as evidenced by a guy in Washington who's trying to shape some curricula right now. But what thing would you want to see us leave behind from the way that education has been focused on in our city? Um, we need to go beyond just assessments. I think that that's really, really important. Um, there's such a heavy emphasis on assessments. And the reality is that um, they're created by companies and individuals who are not in our classrooms and we need to meet our children where they're at. And once we do that, we don't have to rush along and try to force every child to fit into a box. What we do is we see them for who they are. We build throughout their time being, you know, passionate young individuals and focusing on focusing on them in a holistic manner. So just to be clear, we started with you in education, and this is the beauty of our panel and the minds that we've invited. You might think we were going to be in a narrow lane about reading, writing, and arithmetic, but we got a view of how education is such a cornerstone and it touches health access and education about even food and looking at financial literacy and teaching a history that is reflective and inclusive and uh, will go a long way towards this moment of racial reckoning that we're in right now, arming children with their real histories. And just taking all of that into account, I wanted to remind everyone who's watching that we understand that these are all important issues and they all have intersections where they come together. And this is the most unfair question that we're asking tonight of which of these things should be first. But taking in that holistic view, I'm looking at you, Randy, right now, after hearing that impassioned and really well-developed 360 degree view of what and education can mean for people in Brooklyn right now to come and weigh in with what infrastructure and the economy need and can do to forward that very issue that Nadia and so many of the other subheadings brought to the floor. So Randy, it's yours. Tell us why the economy and infrastructure should be uh, Brian, the central plank. Well, the economy and infrastructure. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, I, I listen. I agree with a lot of what Nadia said, and there's a there's a direct correlation between uh, education attainment and the economy, uh, and that's uh, unquestionable. But let's talk a little bit about the landscape of Brooklyn's economy. Uh, we are the largest borough by people for sure, um, but we are a small business economy. Uh, Eighty four percent of our sixty three thousand businesses 
have less than 10 employees. Uh, and if you think about small businesses being the economic engine for the United States uh, and the number one job creator, uh, I mean, I think it becomes a central point uh, for Brooklyn. And one of the ways that we uh, continue to grow our local economy is through infrastructure invest investments. So there's a there's a clear sort of uh, intertwined track between in infrastructure investments and our small business economy. So if you think about whether it's transportation infrastructure like our roads and our bridges, whether it's something as mundane as replacement of sewers and resiliency uh, projects that will assist long-term in protecting us from climate change. I mean, all of this is really part uh, of infrastructure investment. We like to also think of infrastructure investment in terms of just brick and mortar, but it's also access to broadband uh, and how, you know, especially access to broadband now that we're all on Zoom and we're all working from home and we need that access. We need that access throughout all corners of Brooklyn. And there are too many corners of Brooklyn that have been underserved by technology, that have been underserved by broadband. Uh, so these are the parts of infrastructure that not only help grow your economy and add to employment, but they actually support all, all parts of your life, uh, whether it's resiliency, roads and bridges, uh, broadband infrastructure. But getting back to our small business economy, uh, the connection as well to education is just what Nadia said. It's about entrepreneurship, it's about financial literacy, and it's about showing uh, the people of Brooklyn, especially our young people. And you know, Brian, for 10 years, I, I, I ran the largest youth workforce development organization in New York City, working with our disconnected youth population. But entrepreneurship uh, is a path uh, for our youth uh, to really move ahead, uh, and, it ex and it really shows their creativity. Uh, so there's so many tie-ins here, and it's almost like unfair to have us pick between education and the economy slash infrastructure because it really is uh, very much uh, interconnected. Brooklyn is the hub now uh, for the creative economy. Brooklyn is second only to San Francisco in terms of new tech startups. Uh, Brooklyn has a diversity of, of uh, industries from healthcare, which is one of our largest sectors, uh, our retail corridors, which I've just spent, quite honestly, the last four months touring uh, our retail corridors all across the borough. Uh, you know, I've done 25 of these tours. Last one was Monday in Cypress Hills. So, you know, the economy is about jobs and opportunity. It's about entrepreneurship. It's also about help, helping our minority uh, and women-owned business enterprises and our immigrant-owned business enterprises to move ahead uh, and to achieve uh, both the American dream, but also uh, to be part of the equation of helping to pull up communities, right? Because, you know, if you're a successful entrepreneur from any particular community, and if you can hire locally, and if you could support that local community, then the return on that investment is extraordinary. So from my perspective, yes, I'm a Chamber of Commerce guy. I don't think we should have to pick between education and the economy because they're so intertwined. But uh, I do say uh, the economy, especially our infrastructure investments, are going to be such an important part of all of our lives in a very holistic way here in Brooklyn. So that's why I'm supporting uh, the economy and infrastructure. So thank you for that perspective. We have someone who actually uh, we met on the streets of Brooklyn who may be aligned with your views. Let's check that video. My name is Derek and I'm from this neighborhood, Clinton Hill. If I were president, I think the first thing I would start with is I'd have a plan for COVID, which would naturally lead me into an economic recovery plan. And then I'd figure out the best way to move this country forward so that everybody has an opportunity to be successful. Certainly would not be pardoning you know who is in office now. Take care, take care. Well, all the you know who's aside, we've heard from two Brooklynites who are just sharing their day. And it was uh, interrupted by me putting a microphone in their face and two of our panelists on the issue. So now I would love to hear from the rest of you about those intersections that you see between education and the economy or where you might be leaning before we put it to a vote for the panel and for the people of Brooklyn. So all of your mics are open. Let us know if you, uh, have a thought. Mahogany, I saw yours disappear first. You got something to say. 
Um, I was just going to say, I am definitely Team Lopez effect. Uh, education <laughs> is the bedrock and there is no other way. If we don't have the tools to not only understand where we're coming from, we won't know where we're going to. And the fact that uh, she's not only engaged with um, a gardening and urban planning and uh, understanding how foods are very much a part of not just how your home is but how your mind works mm -hmm. i think uh you know that's the ecosystem right there in itself but let me queer the narrative a little it's important to have your education going but what about the crumbling schools and the subway and the sewers that are creating a hazard to the young people who may not benefit from the fullness of great people like Nadia because the city is crumbling around them. How are they getting to school on those broken roads and messed up commuter system? Michelle. I, I just want to say that you know education to me is part of the infrastructure. There's, there's physical infrastructure and then there's human infrastructure and they're both critically important and they both need investment. And if you don't have one investment without the other, it, it, you know, the city will not prosper. So I, I don't know. I'm definitely not an either or person. I'm a both and kind of person, <laughs> personally. Yeah, all of the both and people, I see you in the comments, but we got to pick one tonight for the purposes of this exercise. Remember, this is the smoke-filled room. We're in back now. There's a whole stadium full of people out there ready to say, we're going to win this thing. And they're waiting for our three policy planks. So this is the unfair bargain that we're called upon to make tonight. So it's well, if, I, be... if, I, if you had to narrow it that way, I would just say that from a presidential perspective, I mean, you know, how many times have you heard in the presidential election people saying that there, we were ready, there was a bipartisan support for an infrastructure bill? Yeah. Um, so I don't know, maybe that's the thing that can help bring the country together right now. Well, so and we the definitely BQE need... is still falling into the ocean. So... It's time for our first vote. In just a few seconds, our panelists will be seeing the options before them. It's either going to be the choice between education or the economy slash infrastructure. So I'm going to ask you to lock in right now. And while our panelists are taking part and making their vote, I'm going to encourage you to let us know what you think. What would you come down on? So I hear in my ear now that we have a winner and it seems it wasn't a hard choice by the speed of the way the vote came in, but education it is. <laughs> the Lopez effect is in full effect, our first victory of the night, but the victory really is for Brooklyn. We know that you've been watching and involved in this political stuff going back and forth. There won't be any raised voices or cut off microphones here tonight because we're engaging with civil people who instead of putting themselves first, always in their words and deeds have put our community first. And that's why they're here. And we hope that's why you're here in the service of moving us all forward together in the best way. So education is the first plank of the Brooklyn platform. So we are just, going a little bit forward now into the next round. Food insecurity is something that many Brooklynites were struggling with before this pandemic and certainly as we're in the midst of it. What a lot of us knew is becoming apparent and very apparent to some others who are just finding out. As a matter of fact, a national survey recently said two in 10 people have sought emergency food supplements where they'd never been in that position before. That's two in 10 Americans on a national scale have shown up looking for emergency food. We know that it is a very serious problem and we are aiming to look beyond emergency food into real structural change and food justice. And Ray Gomes, I think you may have something to say on the subject. Just a couple of things, just, just. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here, be a part of this esteemed panel, um, specifically to represent food, because I think it's such a crucial aspect of our lives and it it's not getting talked about in a way that I think is moving us towards really solving a lot of the issues that are com our communities face. Um, you know, I think food should be on this platform because we all eat, we all need to eat. And one of the things that, you know, this pandemic definitely brought to the forefront was that food is the first thing that people, hunger is the first thing really that people experience when there's a crisis, right? You go to the food pantry, you go and you look for emergency food sources, right? And even though hunger is the experience, the cause is poverty, the cause is the loss of income, right? And so a lot of what I am proposing is really looking at the root causes of what of, of hunger, the root causes of um, lack of food access in the community um, and then really thinking through and I apologize I'm going to do this a lot making Hamilton references because I love Hamilton <laughs> who is in the room where it happens right that is the main concern that I have here because we're talking about policy we're talking about the presidential elections and for the most part, people who look like me, people who look like a lot of our panelists aren't in the room where it happens. We aren't, we aren't the ones that are making these decisions that are, would reflect best and long-term solutions for our communities, right? Um, so the, the, the proposals that I have are really about looking at kind of taking a bigger picture view of how a lot of the response around COVID-19 has happened and how a lot of these things basically further a lot of the inequities and how we can sort of redirect to a better co course. And, you know, I'm very heartened by the fact that, you know, Ms. Lopez mentioned, um, you know, nutrition, food and nutrition education as part of, you know, her education platform. And that's why I support it education platform um also you know but i would go further and say you know i just want to put this as an aside but i would go further and say that food justice should be a part of that that nutrition education that is not just necessarily about you know you know the 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 you know my plate and all of these other things and 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 having vegetables and fruits and all of that but it's also understanding you know why we have um, a lack of good food access in our communities you know i i think that young people in particular will be very um interested to know the roots of those issues because a lot of them will motivate them to activism so I just wanted to add that. Um, so I think for the most part, a lot of what happened around COVID food response was an, a heavy investment in emergency food. And as Brian mentioned, um, that statistic about a lot of people accessing emergency food resources who had never um, accessed it before, we see that, you know, that had sort of been the ready sort of um, application or the ready, the, the ready re way that people responded to that need and the ready way that our government, our city government, our state government and our federal government um, provided relief for our communities. And, you know, as was mentioned before, our communities have been facing these issues long before COVID, right? And so if emergency food resources is the only way that we sort of look at any so type of food access resource, then we're constantly in the cycle of only funding those efforts, right? Mm -hmm. And so COVID really, 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 really made it so that that argument is at the forefront of most, if not everything um, that we're doing in terms of food security. And so one of my platform um, ideas is to divest from the emergency food industrial complex because believe it is an emergency food industrial complex. It's these huge corporations that get millions and billions of dollars of our tax money in order to respond to this crisis that gets supposedly trickle down to our communities, but can be invested in a better way. So divest out of that complex and complex and invest in community food sovereignty projects. And there is a way that you could respond to the emergency food needs and uh, leverage that response to these long-standing sustainable efforts, right? There are a lot of different models for that in the community that if the, the city agencies were sort of bringing those people <laughs> into the room where it happens, where those decisions were being made, our food response would look a lot different. Um, so one of the things that we need to do is invest and create a food and equity council made of these community food sovereignty and, and community um, partners who have been doing this work for a very long time. Um, 
there's also the, a huge divestment that has been happening for about a century um, in terms of food in this country. And that divestment is in black land ownership. Our black farmers have been dispossessed of their land um, for over a hundred years through a consistent government policy and government subsidized, well, or, or basically government turning a blind eye to a lot of violence, um, state, and it was basically state sanctioned violence against black farmers. And so as a way to sort of look at this sort of long lens view, this sort of big picture view, um, you know, how do we respond to the loss of black land and the lack of access in our black communities, we create a network where black farmers are feeding black communities. And so you work in a way and you know, this is not sort of like a sort of easy sort of solve to all our issues. It's an idea, it's an investment in both way in both um, lack um, sort of dispossession, um, dispossession in urban landscapes of good food access, dispossession in rural landscapes of land right and so we're working to solve that with 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 applying those two frameworks one of the ways that i would respond to one of my panelists in terms of thinking um of infrastructural um, um infrastructural investment is that you know there are ways that infrastructural investment could really, really go awry. Um, you know, during the 1968 riots, right? When people, black communities were basically responding to uh, police violence in their communities, you know, government, small business association, all these agencies sort of gathered people together and asked them, all right, what do you want? What do you want? And they said everything. They said they want health equity. They want better education for their families. They want better access to food in the community. They want more businesses, more entrepreneurs opportunities so they said okay businesses and so they ran with that and you know what businesses they supported fast food restaurants right and so now we see the result of that in at, post 1970s you know when we think about coming to America that movie and all of that and, the, and this sort of central black family that built that wealth from fast food restaurants that was a direct result of policy that was a direct result of people saying we're supporting black people to have black ownership in businesses julian bond muhammad ali those are some and a, a host of other athletes were entrepreneurs black entrepreneurs for fast food restaurants and so when we think about what we have in terms of food swamps that was a direct investment of infrastructural and inc economic investment that has led to um black businesses thriving but also being very detrimental to community health and food access in the community so, so we're going from the lopez effect in education to the mcdowell's effect in the way <laughs> that community has been impacted when you ask for something and then something was delivered and it wasn't quite what we need exactly especially as we build sustainable healthy communities for exactly generations. exactly so, Taking all of that into account, I do have to um, let everyone in the broader audience know that we invited Jose Albino uh, from the Grio Circle, one of our great friends uh, and neighbors uh, just near us at Brick, that deals with intersectionality and specifically in providing community and support for our older LGBTQIA plus uh, family members and citizens to come together and uh, have an opportunity to fellowship and get healthy food and community. So Jose was scheduled to be here this evening, but at the last minute could not make it. And he was in the uh, bad position of having to uh, sort of make some counterpoints against Ray for how community investment should be plowed into a space of healthcare. And as we can see, these issues are tied together. As a matter of fact, on YouTube, uh, Neil Feldman, who's watching, thank you, uh, left a comment and said, these issues are interrelated. We must bring together decision makers, close the door and not let them come out without a progressive solution to these never ending problems, which is what we've done. So call your congressperson, Neil, 
and let them know that Brick is on the case. And we've invited the smartest people we know into the room. Right. So, just just one 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 quick thing. I mean, I'm please. so happy that you know someone was going to talk about healthcare. As you know, my position is to think about community health. Community right. health is directly related to food access, as evidenced by multiple studies. Um, and then my my last point was really to invest in social determinants of health priority areas and have you know look at the va the basic social determinants of health um redlining areas who have historically been redlined areas mm -hmm. that have high levels of gentrification they all have very horrible health outcomes and so to have those as high priority areas for investment in right. healthcare, food included so Ray, can you just draw the line for me for a second? Because some people are listening to you talk about these determinants and may not quite see how one thing links to the other, but this isn't, this isn't theoretical. This is something that we know to be the case. Yes, um, I would use the example of my, la my old job at the health department. We would have these maps that we would work with um, and it essentially will be overlays of different um, statistics. So it'll be like all the areas who have who um, have been historically redlined, right? And redlining is a government sanctioned program that basically determined which community would have investment through loans and credit um, in, or in order to own the property. And then that also extended into a lot of different things in terms of what how communities would be invested in period right um and so historically red lines communities are ones with the highest uh, um, outcomes uh negative health outcomes in terms of you know i don't necessarily like using obesity as something because that's sort of loaded in a lot of ways but right. you know in terms of you know um obesity or 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 neg um i'm sorry uh uh Pre premature death. Thanks. <laughs> I'm trying to remember all my health department terminology. Um, you know, um, anything that you think in terms of negative health outcomes, all of these um, communities have them. It, it's like really just like A equals B. Like it's the, the same right. communities, the same histories um, and the same outcomes. And so, you know, when we talk about all the issues around healthcare and what makes good health, yes. what makes good health is good housing. What makes good health is affordable housing. What makes good health is healthy access to good food. What makes good health is, is good access to, to quality education. What makes good health is, um, you know, access to healthcare um, resources in the community, both public health and medical care, right? And so for the areas that have been dispossessed of that of those resources through government action, whether direct or indirect. We need to respond in a policy way, in a in, because policy created it. Policy has right. to answer it. We have to respond with policy and investment in these um, high priority areas and create the better health for these communities. Well, I can uh, say anyone. It's clear that. Ray Gomes is arguing both sides of the issue. She came at it from a food justice perspective and she came at it from a purely healthcare perspective. And we're asking our panelists to meet in the middle. Again, we understand that it's an unfair conceit, but if we're looking at the hierarchy of need and also just the amount of resources that we humanly have in ourselves, if you've ever had to make the decision between going to the PTA meeting or going to the block club association or a community board and get dinner on the table or wash clothes, you know there's only so many hours in the day. So we understand that it's unfair. And a second ago, I misattributed uh, that quote that I said was from Neil, but it was also, it was actually from a former BRIC colleague, Ted Canova. Thanks for writing in, Ted. So that being said, and knowing that Jose was not here, we do have a uh, person on the street who's sharing their opinion of how they would make things happen if they were president with regards to healthcare. Have a look. Hi, I'm Dr. Archer, a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I work in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And if I were president, everybody would get free mental health care. Everyone. From the youngest to the oldest. Hi, <laughs> my name is Dr. Aravella Croy Pembroke. I'm the principal of Riverdale Avenue Middle School. And if I were president, my priority for the first 100 days in office would be to offer free mental health services to every single citizen 
an undocumented person in the United States. it to the panel and it's a binary choice but it's a non-binary world we get that let me get the panel up right now with the poll and the question is what is the second plank of the brooklyn platform with the full knowledge that we have there looking at food justice issues or looking at health care so we have a winner and the winner is health care which were two sides of the same coin. No one lost here. And even if they only thought of healthcare as what happens in the hospital, surely they know that the food is your medicine right now. So thank you for the impassioned arguments, Ray. Thank you for the votes from our panelists. Thank you for your comments that I see uh, funneling in from folks all over Brooklyn. Hey, to the uh, folks at Collective Fair in Brownsville, who I got to spend a lot of time with this summer for the six week, six week, six part series, uh, Brownsville Rising, that's currently airing on Brick TV, where we talked with the community about some community comorbidities that were in place and how Brownsville is rising to the challenge and rising above the expectations of those who don't know that Brownsville is going to be better than it was coming into this thing, going out of it. So thanks to the folks at Brownsville uh, Collective Fair and the members of the community who welcomed us so robustly there. We really appreciate it and hope that you all will uh, watch and learn as we delve into some issues in Brownsville. But our issue ahead of us right now, that is something that was paramount for a lot of folks in Brownsville, which some people see as Brooklyn and New York City's last frontier as lots of plans are being made for that community. We're looking at housing, the whole housing landscape in Brooklyn. And we actually have a person who we met on the street where if they were a single issue voter, housing would be theirs. Have a look. I'm State Senator Brian Kavanaugh. And if I were president, I would ensure that every American has a right to decent, affordable housing uh, by strengthening our fair housing laws and by providing adequate funding for public housing and for affordable housing throughout the country. Affordable housing throughout the country was the last word that he left off on. And I know that affordable housing might be a third rail because affordable to who is how it starts. And then the question goes on from there. So Michelle De La Uz, you've already forgotten more about affordable housing development than most of us could hope to learn. So. The floor is yours. Convince us as to why affordable housing and just housing period should be the last and wide policy plank as Brooklyn's caucus moves on. Sure, before I do that, I just want to, um, I think, conjure the spirit of uh, former Congresswoman uh, Shirley Chisholm, the first um, major uh, black 